Well, good morning, everyone, or uh, good afternoon, or good evening, according to where you're situated around the globe. Um, so I'm very happy to welcome you to the second edition of uh, Beyond Facts, the uh, international workshop on uh, knowledge graphs for online discourse analysis. So this is the uh, continuation of uh, our first uh, edition, which took place last year, also jointly with the, with the web conference. And I'd like to start by thanking uh, all the organizers of, uh, of the conference for their effort and uh, support, and also to all the participants uh, authors uh, and people who submitted papers to, to this event. So to start with just a very short introduction uh, to give you a brief summary of uh, what the scope of this workshop is and what we will be talking about. Um, so we've seen that there is abundance of uh, claims um, emerging on various platforms online um, on various controversial topics shared on the web. And they also often come together with associated uh, sources, viewpoints, um, and contexts, such as events and entities. And these constitute a valuable source of uh, insights and data for analysis and studies into topics such as misinformation spread, um, eco chambers, political agenda setting, uh, fake news detection, and whatnot. So um, parallelly, we have seen also that knowledge graphs uh, come with a promise to provide uh, the key to a web of structured knowledge and structured information. However, knowledge graphs mainly focus on facts and less so on claims, right? Um, and we see claims as um, um, more complex uh, um, artifacts as compared to facts, in particular because of the fact that um, well, um, their interpretation depends very strongly on a specific context. Um, and this context is not always explicitly available. Also, we have seen that the terminology and the, the conceptual understandings uh, of what claims are and how they're interpreted uh, diverge very much across different uh, disciplines and different communities. If you look into computational uh, social science, for example, uh, or in AI or in argumentation mining, these notions and concepts are um, modeled and understood differently. So there is both lack and a need for shared understanding and structured knowledge uh, about online schools. Right, so maybe we can sum things up in the following way. Uh, the Beyond Facts community uh, um, gathers around the question uh, of how can we go towards a web of claims and online discourse a web which will come in order to uh, build a, an additional layer to the web of documents, the web of documents and facts. And so a web where, for example, we could um, uh, retrieve information about claims, about their context, um, about their associated viewpoints, stances, uh, the truth values of those claims, uh, the evidence that comes to support to refute them, and so on and so forth. So the... Um, the Beyond Facts community um, provides a forum for shared works on uh, how to model, extract, and analyze discourse and claims on the web. So this is a multidisciplinary community where various fields come together, um, fields such as stance detection, argumentation mining, uh, knowledge extraction, um, computational social science. So we would like to open this community also um, beyond the, uh, um, uh, the narrow AI field, uh, because in order to understand these topics, we need uh, truly multidisciplinary effort. Um, so this year in particular, what we, uh, what we can see is that uh, the second edition of Beyond Facts, uh, again, uh, we're happy to say that we gather a multidisciplinary community as our initial goal was. Uh, we see topics coming from fields such as knowledge graphs, of course, representation learning, NLP, uh, semantic web, argumentation mining, stance detection, but also computational social sciences with various applications such as fact-checking, uh, biomedical applications, in particular COVID-19. Uh, we'll see papers about uh, recommending uh, news uh, to users, as well as papers dedicated to uh, analyzing and understanding science communication in online debates. Um, the Beyond Fact community this year is again uh, also an international community, combining both academia and industrial participants. So I've gathered, we've given, gathered a couple of keywords which describe the, the papers that we will and the, the invited talks that we will hear today. 
Um, so of course, we'll talk about uh, methods uh, uh, using language models such as BERT, also uh, about uh, modeling on online discourse, uh, knowledge graphs, analyzing social networks uh, and, uh, um, and uh, social web in general. Um, also, we'll see, uh, get insights about how to explain uh, specific applications uh, like fact checking or fake news detection. We'll talk about argumentation schemes and so on and so forth. So we're very happy to host three uh, excellent keynote speakers. Uh, so Serena Vilata will open uh, the floor just in a couple of minutes. Um, and then later on in the afternoon, we'll hear from uh, uh, Harith Alani from the uh, um, Open University in UK. And our last keynote will happen in the last session in the afternoon, coming from the industry, from Jose Manuel Gomez Perez. We'll talk about uh, explainable misinformation detection. So, just to give you a brief overview of how uh, today's workshop uh, looks in terms of schedule. So, we start now with uh, Serena's uh, keynote. Then, uh, in the second half of the uh, of the morning, morning in French uh, French time, of course, um, we will listen to three speakers. So, two full papers and one short paper. And in the afternoon session. Starting by Harit's uh, keynote, uh, we will continue with two short papers, so one short paper and one position paper. And in the second half of the afternoon, uh, we'll hear Jose's uh, industry keynote, followed by a conclusion, a general discussion, and the uh, award ceremony, where we will award our uh, traditional best paper award. I say traditional because we had it also last year. Um, OK. so. I will stop here now. I'm very happy to hand the floor to Serena Vilata. So as I mentioned, she, she's a uh, uh, senior researcher at, uh, at CNRS in, in France. Um, and, uh, and she will talk about uh, argument-based explanatory dialogues. So Serena, the floor is yours. I guess you can share your screen. Thanks, yes, let me try. Uh, you need to stop sharing, I think. Okay. Okay. Yes, seems to work. <laughs> okay, let me just. Uh... Okay, I guess you can uh, you can hear me and you can see my slides. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so thanks a lot. Thanks uh, to all the organizers uh, for for the invitation. Uh, I today I will talk about uh, argument-based explanatory dialogues. So as as Constantine was was uh, was mentioning, one of the the research fields where uh, claims, uh, facts, evidence are are really taken into account is uh, argumentation or better argument mining. So how to mine arguments from from text. And then a natural questions a question comes, which is uh, okay, how can we use the arguments that we can mine to then uh, generate uh, explanations or better explanatory arguments. So this this will be the the talk of uh, the, the 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 core of my of my talk. Actually, you will see I have many, I think more questions than answers, but uh, that's that's the the the, the inter interesting part of uh, uh, discussing that with uh, with you. Okay, so. Um, when we talk about uh, explanation, well, uh, explainable AI, uh, XI is really one of the, uh, I would say even of the buzzwords nowadays on, on AI. So everybody's talking about explainable AI, uh, but then at the end, everybody tries to, in a way, uh, bring back explanations to two uh, specific uh, domains. So actually explaining is a very difficult task, this is something we can also learn uh, just to, to, uh, to link again with the introduction from Constantine with, with, from social science. So in social science, there are many works saying how uh, good explanations are, are shaped. Uh, and actually, this is a good uh, starting point even for us in, uh, in AI. So understanding how to build these high quality explanations. Because at the end, these explanations we want to build are uh, built for, for humans. We want to usually explain 
the, the machine decision to humans. So we have a precise target, which means that the, the kind of explanation we, we generate needs to, 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 be, to be effective for these target, target users. So there are many challenges here. I just list uh, some of them. Uh, first of all, we need to, to, to decide what's the, what is the proper level of generality, specificity of the explanation we want to generate. Uh, then we can go into the details uh, if we want to generate uh, natural language explanations, which are those that are better, in a way, understandable by humans, or visual explanations, which are also uh, very well uh, understood, or formal, more formal uh, forms of, uh, of explanation. But then the, the, the problem of uh, choosing the, the right level of generality specificity is very important. But it depends also a lot on the audience. Okay, so we have a target, which is the target of the explanation. We want to, gen to generate an explanation. Well, th the same explanation can work, or cannot work, can be effective or cannot be effective for the, the, the say for two different uh, let's say uh, people in uh, in the audience because uh, someone uh, is someone with no knowledge for instance on a certain topic so we need to 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 keep a high level of generality uh, whilst uh, for instance uh, if you are providing an explanation to uh, i don't know doctors for instance because this is the scenario i will uh, i will focus uh, mainly in this uh, in this in this talk well there you need to provide more details because then the explanation should be uh, in a way uh, strong and, and, and meaningful for, for, uh, for the, the, the doctor, for the expert. And then uh, when a decision is made automatically by, by, by an AI uh, doing a deliberation, well, well we want to, to make a reference to specific elements that have contributed to the deliberation. So the point, is uh, not just to say uh, if we are using uh, neural networks, for instance, not just to say, I don't know, uh, this is uh, the results of the attention mechanism. These are, for instance, if you talk about words, these are the words that, that are main, main, mainly important in the decision. But the point is, it's, it is also really to make reference uh, to all the elements that have contributed to the, to the deliberation. And then, well, when we want to generate these explanations, there are uh, many kinds of explanations which can be generated. We can have, for instance, analytic statements, uh, which can, uh, in a way, uh, explain through, through claims, actually, uh, how the decision, uh, what is the decision that has been taken and how the, the machine reached this, uh, this decision. And one key point, uh, which uh, uh, seem to be less uh, less important uh, some uh, some years ago when there has been uh, the, the, the the huge interest the growing interest in, in in deep learning, but now which is really becoming a main uh, main point uh, and I would say in a certain sense also a main issue is the use of, of additional knowledge. So knowledge is a fundamental brick here, something that we do need to build uh, strong explanatory arguments, and then. When we talk ad about additional knowledge, many kinds of uh, knowledge can be taken into account. We can talk about uh, domain ontologies. If we are, for instance, uh, uh, on a specific uh, use case, I don't know, we talk about medicine, then there are uh, different kind of uh, ontologies, uh, knowledge bases that we can use. Then of course, once we move to uh, more, let's say, the general domain, so we are not in, the, in a specific domain, it's not the, the medical domain, the legal domain, but we are, for instance, on social networks. Well, this is more complex because we need to deal with common sense knowledge. And this means that, uh, in a way, modeling this knowledge and uh, taking into account also about the, 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 the cultural differences, uh, the, the, the background uh, culture that the different uh, target uh, users can have. Well, this is uh, quite, uh, quite complex. And then another issue, which is uh, uh, another point, which is uh, important when you want to build explanations, high quality explanations, is the use of examples. Uh, if you think on how uh, you, as a, as a human, explain your decision, for instance, to your friends, for instance, well, you, you use a lot of examples, okay? You, 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 you provide a statement, a claim, 
And then you use a lot of examples to, to show how you, you reach these, uh, these decision, um, making, let's say in a way, instantiating uh, your case on different precise cases so that you, in a way, motivate that and you help the user to build kind of his own uh, model of the explanation behind your uh, decision, behind your deliberation. Of course, making, in a way, generating automatically these examples uh, from uh, uh, the data uh, the prediction is produced on is far from being uh, straightforward. And then something we also use a lot when we try to explain to someone else uh, our, our, our decisions is uh, the, what are the evidence supporting negative hypotheses, meaning that we take a decision, we go for option A, and we say, okay, we, we, we went for option A because of these reasons, uh, and uh, for instance, we provide an example. But also, often, we say, and we didn't decide to go for option B and for option C because, okay? So you also explain what are the negative hypotheses, uh, often supported also by examples showing why these negative hypotheses cannot be taken. So these are uh, some of the key elements of uh, uh, high quality uh, explanations. And in general, when we want to formulate an explanation, it should be clearly interpretable, meaning that the user should, should understand that the user, the user doesn't need to, 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 to then check uh, further knowledge uh, basis to see whether the explanation is, uh, uh, is, is, is correct or not. And it should be formulated, if possible, in a convincing way. Well, I just want to, 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 to keep uh, just for a moment on this uh, word convincing. So, well, I, I work in, a, in argumentation since uh, the, the very beginning of, uh, of, my, of my career. And uh, every time uh, we talk about argumentation, we talk about, uh, uh, in a way, convincing, using convincing arguments, or we can use persuasive arguments. Then this word is always a kind of a negative connotation in a way you want to, uh, it seems sometimes that you want to mislead the, the, the users uh, and try to convince them uh, to, to do something uh, something that, uh, the, I don't know, the machine has an hidden plan and wants to convince the user to do something. But this is not the case. So actually, when you look at social science literature, you see that uh, the explanations should be convincing, should be uh, in a way mm, easily uh, digestible by, by the user. So if they are very complex, even if they are uh, in a way uh, proper uh, explanations, they will not make the, the job. So when we talk about uh, explanations, at least in, in my team, what we do is that uh, we talk about natural language explanations. So that's our, our focus. And in particular, with, with this topic, we take into account three main uh, points. So the first one is argumentation theory, uh, which means uh, how we formalize the, the reasoning, uh, how a good uh, explanatory argument should look like from uh, the philosophical point of view. So what are the good uh, patterns for uh, explaining something through arguments to, to, to users? And then uh, we have a, uh, argument mining and argument generation. So how we can mine, so extract arguments from text, from natural language text, how we can generate new arguments, sometimes uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a, an, an extractive way, uh, meaning uh, we take what we extract and we combine these extracted arguments uh, to generate new arguments, or we can really generate from scratch uh, with uh, more abstractive uh, approaches. And then, of course, our uh, final target, which is also the final target of um, a, a, an European project uh, we, we work on, which is called Antidote, is then to address uh, dialogues with, uh, with users. Of course, we talk about task-oriented dialogues. We cannot think about uh, it really dialogues in, in the, 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 the broad sense because it's, uh, it's super challenging. But the point is, so the explanation is not just a one-shot, let's say, uh, claim. So I, I 
the, 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 the AI deliberated in a certain way. And then I provide just one sentence and this sentence is the explanation. So this is not the case, okay? This sentence is, a, is the first break of the explanation, but then the explanation is constructed through an interaction with the user because uh, maybe the user uh, has some additional uh, doubts. Maybe the user has some additional elements uh, to he wants to inspect in order to check whether these, uh, this explanation is uh, in a way convincing for, for him, okay? Because at the end, what we want, uh, all these, uh, let's say, issue of uh, take, talking about explanations is, is done because we want to, in a way, understand these, uh, these black boxes. We want to understand when uh, uh, an AI made a certain deliberation. We want to understand why. Okay? We want to understand the reasons behind that. So of course, it is an iterative process. You provide feedback to the machine. The machine, for instance, uh, go for a more general explanation than before because maybe it sees that, you, you, that the user didn't understand or uh, maybe it goes for uh, a, a more, uh, more precise, more detailed explanation on a specific aspect uh, of the decision because this is what the user is interested in. So this is the really the final, uh, the final uh, let's say, target for us to, uh, to have these dialogues uh, happening between um, a kind of, a, let's say, uh, explanatory uh, AI and, uh, and, and the users. So um, in this talk, I will focus uh, mainly on these two uh, points. So what is argumentation, why it is interesting to, to, to discuss about uh, argumentation, uh, which is a, a long-standing topic. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it started uh, in, uh, in philosophy from, from Aristotle. And then uh, now it's, it's still used also in philosophy, not only in computer science. And then I will move to argument mining. Uh, to, to discuss a bit what we can, we can mind. So what are uh, explanatory dialogues in uh, argumentation uh, theory? Well, argumentation in general is uh, a reasoning in interaction process. So again, you see, I'm back again to, to the interaction word, which means that it's not just, um, let's say, a one, uh, shot uh, uh, element, you, you provide an argument, but you reason through interaction. This, uh, uh, this is also from the philosophical point of view. So arguments that are, that are expressed uh, in particular, if they want to be explanatory arguments, they need not only to be rational, because of course we want some kind of uh, rationality there, but also manifestly rational, which means that the, 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 the users or what in, in philosophy we call the arguers can see from themselves the rationale behind the inferential steps that are taken in order to go to get to a certain decision, okay? So, of course, you don't always have all these inferential steps, okay? Because sometimes the decision has been taken by uh, a, um, a system, uh, which is not uh, in a way uh, explainable, meaning that uh, you, you, it's not transparent, you don't know how the, 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 the network has, uh, has taken this decision. So you need in a way to build this uh, uh, automatically. But the point, that these explanations need to be manifestly rational is very important. Well, you could argue why purely rational and why we don't want to use uh, emotions. Because at the end, uh, when we talk about uh, convincing explanations, sometimes convincing explanations, unfortunately, that's what also what we see in, uh, in this information. Uh, well, they, 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 they use uh, what is called the, 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 the argumentation strategies of pathos. So using emotional elements, empathic sentences that can in a way raise, uh, I don't know, uh, fear uh, or other emotions in the user. And then they are more convinced about uh, the, 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 a certain uh, piece of information because they, 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 they can in a way make a match between what's 
written there and I don't know, their fears, their emotions, their past experiences. But however, when here we are talking about the generation of explanations and we don't want to, to, to have, a, let's say, kind of a, 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 a persuasive AI, we want to provide an explanation and we want to discuss with, with the user, to have a dialogue with the user to explain why a certain decision is being taken. In particular, here, uh, our use case is, uh, is medicine. So of course, you definitely want to have something manifestly rational, at least for, for instance, a, a, a diagnosis. So in, uh, in these explanations, uh, when we talk about argumentation, you want that uh, you, you have an agent which accepts the, the conclusion, okay, so the deliberation of the AI, but queries about the premises, meaning that it, it, he, the user says something like, okay, uh, that diagnosis you proposed is D, okay, but why? Okay, that, that, that's how, in a way, this interaction uh, starts. And, well, there is a pragmatic goal behind this interaction, which is understanding, okay? That's what we have also when we explain uh, our decisions, our own decisions to other, other users. The goal is understanding, making them understand, okay? And this is usually reached uh, in, in argumentation through uh, causal uh, reasoning. So this is, these are, in a way, the uh, philosophical uh, basis, okay? So you start uh, from, from that, uh, and then, uh, you, uh, then you, you can, you, can uh, you know what are uh, the, the key elements, the patterns you want to have uh, to build these, uh, these explanations. And then we, it comes that uh, uh, there has been, uh, um, in 2012, so it's a quite recent research field, there has been a growing interest in saying, okay, it's, it's, it's all very nice, but it's also very high level, very, uh, let's say, uh, theoretical. So how can we actually uh, extract, that was our first, uh, the first goal of, the, of the, the community, how can we really extract real arguments, so real claims, real evidence from text, okay? Well, that, that, that has been a, a field that, uh, that as I said, uh, started in, uh, in 2012, uh, actually merging the, the interest of two different communities. On the one side, the, uh, the, 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 the KR community, so the knowledge representation community where argumentation uh, and computational models of argument are, uh, are, uh, are, 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 let's say, placed. And on the other side, a huge interest in NLP towards these, uh, these, uh, this topic and this challenging issue. Well. In general, what's this task? What's the task of argument mining? The task is the, 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 the state stated uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a broad way is that of analyzing discourse on the pragmatic level and applying a certain argumentation theory, meaning a certain uh, argumentation pattern structure of the arguments, which from, you, you can take them from, from philosophy, for instance, to model and automatically analyze the, da the data that, uh, that you have. That's, that's all very nice, but okay, quite complex. Um, the idea uh, is uh, we have a lot of, of, uh, of uh, formalisms to do reasoning over arguments, to compute, for instance, automatically what are the acceptable arguments, uh, given what we call an argumentation graph, so a, a graph structure where the nodes are the, the, the arguments and the different links uh, can be uh, really different kinds of relations between the arguments, attack relations, support relations, and so on. And what we have all these algorithms, which uh, can can be very beneficial. We can, we know when uh, when, uh, for instance, uh, uh, there are uh, two arguments that are in conflict to each other, so they are uh, there is a kind of inconsistency there. You cannot take both of them, okay, in an explanation. So you have a number of uh, theoretical uh, let's say results you can use, but of course, how can we use them on real arguments that we have on text? So that was the purpose providing the structured data, so extracting these arguments from the text and providing what we extract to the computational models of argument. So why 2012, you can ask? Well, actually, the, the, the point is that um, 
well, there have been uh, a huge amount of, uh, on the one side, uh, of uh, resources that uh, uh, became available uh, in natural language. Uh, we have a lot of user-generated content online. For instance, uh, arguments that are proposed on blogs, on forums. Uh, we have product reviews. We have the comments to the newspapers, the arguments contained in newspaper articles. And then uh, smoothly, a lot of, uh, let's say, um, in a way, digitalized information in the different fields uh, become available in medicine, uh, in the legal domain, uh, where I work a lot. So it, it, there are really different uh, texts that became available, which has a huge uh, argumentation uh, content. And then at the same time in 2012, uh, we, we start having really huge advances in computational linguistics and machine learning, so that uh, in a way it became possible to uh, really tackle this challenging task. So argument mining is not opinion mining. That's, that's the first uh, point. In a way, we start with opinion mining. In opinion mining, you have, uh, for instance, let's take the, the use case of product reviews. Uh, you have a product review on a, on a, on a, on a product. Well, opinion mining uh, states uh, whether the user uh, liked or, or didn't like a certain uh, a certain product okay so it uh, shows what's the polarity okay what's the sentiment of uh, that's also sentiment analysis uh, towards a certain product what's the goal of argument mining well in the same use case in product review the goal is to understand why the user liked it or why the user didn't like it so it's to provide the reasons behind a certain statement, the reasons behind a certain claim, to use the same terminology uh, Constantine used this, this morning in the introduction. So let's start again with, with what, what's the pipeline, the argument uh, pipeline. So the, in the argumentation pipeline, uh, what you have is that you start with, with text, okay? Then you have uh, two main, uh, let's say, tasks. The first one is the argument component detection. So we want to detect uh, what are the evidence, uh, what are the claims uh, that, are, uh, that are contained in the text. Uh, and then uh, we want to, to move to the second task, which is the prediction of the relations between these elements, which means that uh, on the one side, we want to predict the relations between uh, the, the, the claim and the supporting, for instance, evidence of this claim, but also what are the, 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 the relations between different arguments, okay? So for us, an argument is composed, uh, let's say, a well-structured argument, then, then this is, of course, not what we always find in, a, in, a, in natural language text. You will see that in, in a minute. Uh, you want to, to find what are given a, a claim, what are the evidence supporting it? If there are evidence attacking it, and this for us, the claim, and this evidence linked to a claim are an argument. And then the argument, of course, can attack each other. For instance, you can have a claim which attack another claim uh, or an evidence supporting another argument which attacks one of the evidence, for instance, of the first argument and so on. So what we want is to extract all that from text and then give that to the computational models of argument, such that reasoning can be addressed over that. So we move now to the part uh, more on uh, argument mining. Uh, and here I will just uh, highlight some of our uh, results, some of our work be be before going back again to the generation of the explanation and seeing what are the main uh, difficulties, because actually we don't have really have answers in this moment uh, on that. So. We worked, for instance, on uh, argument mining on Twitter. Well, Twitter was a quite, uh, of a, let's say, uh, natural uh, choice because uh, well, the data was, uh, was uh, easily accessible uh, online. Uh, and uh, in a way we said, okay, that's, uh, the, we worked before on um, debate platforms online. Then we, then we move to a kind of a social network. That's quite a straightforward. People put forward the arguments. We want to, uh, to address this. Well, it was not that easy that as, as expected. So in a way, what, uh, what's the task here for us? The task was first 
to give a Twitter stream to detect, uh, to distinguish what uh, we call the tweet arguments from non arguments. And then, uh, given the tweet arguments, uh, we wanted uh, to distinguish um, factual uh, arguments uh, from, uh, let's say, uh, opinion based uh, arguments. And finally, for those that are that are factually factual, we want to highlight the, the source. Um, that's that's uh, that's that's uh, in a way that was our goal. Uh, we built a, a resource and annotated the data set uh, uh, called Dart, uh, where we uh, we we add the tr the thread on Brexit uh, and on Brexit. Uh, and these, these uh, we have about uh, 1,000 uh, uh, tweets for each uh, of them. So we, we computed the inter-annotator agreement to ensure that the annotation was, uh, was reliable. Um, and well, what, what we have is that argument tweets uh, are those that uh, convey, in a way, uh, uh, a meaning. Okay, so we discarded as non-arguments uh, everything which was just, I don't know, for instance, just a link in the tweet or just a word and a link, because of course we didn't go into the, we, we didn't follow in a way uh, the, the link and we didn't go to the, to the web page where the, the, there was probably some content and maybe some arguments. Okay, so we stopped here. We just uh, analyzed the, the tweets themselves. And, uh, and then we, we have that, uh, um, we have, for instance, uh, some, some, some kind of advertisements and so on. So this, these were all discarded. And then when, uh, when we identify those that are tweet arguments, uh, for instance, here you have the two examples in the slides, a factual one and an opinionated one. Uh, for the factual, we have, uh, we have uh, tweets like The Guardian, Greek Crisis, European leaders scramble for response to referendum no vote. So here, what we have is that we identified these as a factual argument, and we identified in this text uh, what is the source. Of course, the source is not the Twitter account tweeting it, okay, because that's straightforward, that's not a big, a big deal. The point was to detect in the text if there was a mention to a source of this information, in this case, in this case the Guardian. And then for the opinionated tweets, which are which were which were a lot, uh, it, there there is a, something like Trump is going to sell us back to England, Brexit, uh, uh, RNC in CLA. Okay, so this is this is the kind of uh, of arguments we we identified. This is what we distinguished, and here you have also the the, the results how we how we get it. So this was our uh, first, one of the first uh, uh, approaches we uh, we target on uh, on that, and then uh, we we moved to uh, to another domain uh, which we are still uh, working a lot, which uh, which is uh, uh, the, the the medical domain. So we say, oh, well, there is a, a huge, uh, let's say, research, uh, user, uh, user research field, which is called evidence-based medicine. So here, the decisions are taken based on the evidence, on the past cases, and so on, uh, and uh, further evidence provided by, by, by users, um, sorry, by, 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 by doctors. And then here, the goal is to, to detect argumentative uh, structures uh, from the, the, these clinical cases to then support uh, evidence-based medicine. Because of course, for evidence-based medicine, you need evidence and of course, uh, claims. So that's the, the, the goal that, uh, that, uh, that we, we, we had. So what we did, the task here was to um, identify um, argument uh, components, so evidence and claims, uh, and also predict the relations attack and support between these uh, these uh, components. So what we did is that we used uh, we extracted uh, argument uh, arguments from PubMed. So we have analyzed only the abstract of PubMed articles. Uh, we we did that uh, also in collaboration with. Um, uh, French institutions uh, in, in medicine, in particular the University uh, uh, Hospital in, in, uh, in Nice, where we are based. So the point is, we analyze the the, the abstract of these uh, of these clinical trial uh, papers, 
uh, and we uh, extract what are the evidence, what are the claims, and what are the relations between the different these different components. So here you have an example, for instance, um, in blue, you see what are the evidence. For instance, the diurnal interocular pressure reduction was significant in both groups. Okay, so that, that's an evidence. And then uh, that's, that's just a shortened uh, abstract. Usually they are uh, longer. Uh, you have the conclusion, which is the claim at the end. This study clearly showed that, okay, and in green, you have the claim, the conclusion, the, the additive diurnal interocular pressure lowering effect of lat latanoprost is superior to that of the dorzolamide in patients treated with Timor. Okay. So that, that was uh, the point for, for doing that. We, we annotated uh, a huge data set, which is, uh, which is available online. So uh, uh, you, can, you can use it uh, where we annotated uh, argument components. Uh, so uh, 4,000 argument components, uh, 2,600 argument relations. Uh, and the topics we selected uh, were neoplasm, uh, glaucoma, hepatitis, diabetes, and hypertension. So we did that using uh, using uh, transformers, uh, using uh, that for neural networks, and relying on uh, BERT, in particular uh, scientific BERT, SHIBERT, so for, for, the, for the medical domains. And the, result, the results we obtained are were quite satisfiable for, for us. Um, and then, uh, sorry. Uh, and then, this is what we, we, we realized as, as, a, as a pipeline, just to, to make you understand. We start from the, right, the randomized clinical trials. Uh, we do first the argument component detection task. So we treat it as, as a sequence tagging problem. Uh, we uh, identify what are the different argument components, as you see in the example. Then we have uh, uh, argument component A. Uh, brimonidine and so on, uh, argument component B uh, and argument component C. And then all these is, pro is, the, is uh, provided to the second task, which is a relation classification. We, we treat that as a sequence classification task. So we take the different components and we look whether there is a relation and whether there is a relation, uh, which kind of label we can provide to, the, to, this, uh, to this relation. And then what we do is that we build basically an argument graph, one for each abstract of, uh, for each clinical trial, because that's done uh, on each of them uh, at, uh, at the site. And then what we did, we also analyzed uh, automatically, we also extract what are the uh, outcomes, what are the effects uh, on, on an outcome, meaning that uh, uh, there you have uh, that, for instance, uh, a certain, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, effect uh, then has, uh, has lowered or has increased, for instance, uh, intraocular pressure, as you can see in the example. Then we want to say that, for instance, in uh, uh, argument A, we have uh, uh, intraocular pressure, which is uh, one of the PICO elements, which, is, uh, which are key elements for doctors to take a decision. And we know that it says that there has been a, a, a lowering effect for uh, IUP, okay? And then we know that in argument B, uh, there is the element mean peak IUP, and we know that this also decreased. And in C, there is, uh, again, IOP and says that decrease. This is also to have these, these elements uh, easily uh, accessible uh, to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the user. And then uh, we build, a, a, well, a, an arc, uh, um, a demo, uh, which is available online, uh, hopefully working, uh, which is called ACTA for the automatic, uh, the, the automatic analysis uh, from the argumentation point of view of clinical trials articles on PubMed. So on ACTA, uh, you, can, uh, you can select, uh, you can make a query on the PubMed repository, select what are the, the articles you are interested in, as you can see here in, in the slide, you have uh, here uh, on the left a set of, uh, of articles that have been selected. And then if you click on one of them, this is the one highlighted in blue in the slide, for instance, it uh, analyze, uh, analyzes automatically the text contained in the abstract, as you see, is not that, that short, okay? And from that, it extracts automatically what are the claims, what are the evidence, how they link to each other, what is the, the, the label of this link. 
And in addition, we also identify automatically what are the PICO elements, uh, which is a patient intervention um, uh, and uh, outcome uh, and control. Uh, the, these elements are identified automatically in, in the text uh, as well. And then, well, this was for, for the clinical case. And then we said, okay, but we talk about evidence, we talk about claims. There is a kind of a usual suspect uh, when we talk about argumentation, uh, if we want to identify these in, uh, in text. And well, that, that was true. Uh, and what we say uh, is, let's go for political debates. Well, political debates are, are very, very difficult. So we, uh, we analyzed uh, the political debates of the US presidential election uh, from uh, 1960 uh, uh, to uh, 2016, so 50 years of political debates. Uh, that and our goal was were well, to detect arguments contained in the political uh, in the political uh, speeches, uh, discourse of these uh, these candidates. The transcripts are available on uh, the, uh, the the the. On, on a website, an official website from the US. So these are the official transcripts of, of these, uh, these debates. Uh, and we analyzed them too, uh, to have uh, the, the component detection, uh, so claim premise, and the relation classification, so attack uh, and, and support uh, again. You could say, okay, but you, you always stack with these with these two uh, components, these two relations. Uh, yes, because it's it's already quite complex to to detect them in a, in a in a way in a proper way, as you can see from the results, which are okay, -ish, but uh, still there is room for for improvement. So here our goal, which is also in uh, I think which falls into into the the, the 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 interest of this of this workshop, it was to we want to identify arguments because then we want to identify fallacious arguments that are proposed by politicians. That's our uh, latest, uh, latest results. And uh, um, we just got a paper uh, accepted at, at each case. So th these results are, are, are now really uh, available. So the point is that sometimes there are inconsistencies in uh, the debates because uh, sometimes, uh, for instance, a candidate is proposing something and then uh, he, he, he's saying something like, uh, okay, uh, and then he's saying something which is which actually contradicts, which means attacks. So you identify an attack uh, from something which is said after or in another debate. Uh, you can have, uh, in a way, contradictions inside the same party. So for instance, you have uh, uh, the, uh, some debates where there is also the, the vice president, uh, the, the candidate with, which are involved, and then there, there are kind of inconsistencies in the same uh, party arguments. Uh, and then, of course, there are also really fallacious arguments, meaning that uh, arguments, for instance, uh, attacking uh, directly uh, the candidate uh, and not the arguments proposing by that, having therefore uh, a dominant attacks and so on. So uh, on that, what we did is that we are able to generate these argument graphs, which are huge for these uh, political debates, as you can understand and you can imagine. So you have seen the kind of graphs that ACTA produce for each clinical uh, trial article. They are in a way small because of course it's just each clinical trial article which is analyzed uh, by his own, okay? And then what we're working now is of course to put all of them together and to link them by relations. But for these political debates, the resulting argumentation graphs are just huge, of course, because it's 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 a lot of uh, different topics that are that are that are tackled, uh, and a lot of arguments that are proposed. So here you see just an example. So the claims, and here uh, we just have um, uh, we, we just have, uh, have supports, and then you can have also uh, attack relations, and you can have really huge 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 graphs for for that. And also this data set 
is uh, publicly available uh, for for research uh, purposes. So this 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 debate this uh, data set is uh, has taken a lot of time uh, asked for a lot of time for for the annotation uh, because it also requires uh, some kind uh, of of knowledge about uh, U.S. Uh, polit uh, politics, which which is not uh, uh, straightforward. And uh, also in this case, we have a, a, an online demo that you can uh, you can check, which is called the Dispo tool, uh, where you can actually uh, explore uh, the data set. You can uh, decide which is the, 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 the debate you are more, more interested in. Here, in, for instance, there is a visualized the debate from Nixon Kennedy in uh, 1960. Yeah, we are, you can highlight the claims and the premise from these uh, from these, uh, these these debates, the arguments. Uh, and then you can also filter based on the year, based on the name entities uh, you are interested in. And what is what is nice is that this is actually a, a, a real link with what uh, also Constantine was mentioning before, so the social sciences. So this is really a work in collaboration with digital humanities um, uh, departments in uh, Luxembourg and in Italy. And this, the goal was also to understand, for instance, what are the, 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 the topics that are mostly uh, discussed by some of the candidates and uh, less from, from the other. For instance, if you, if you look at the, 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 the diagram uh, you have on, on the left, then we, we see that, for instance, uh, I don't know, uh, drugs uh, and so on, which was a topic mostly discussed by Nixon, why social security, um, uh, medical care, uh, was mostly discussed by uh, by Kennedy. Only few arguments from the other are are, are proposed on that. And this is an, an interesting uh, analysis also of uh, these uh, these huge data set that you can you can have. And now that we have seen how we can extract concretely on three examples uh, these arguments, let's let's try to be back to the explanatory arguments and how we can build them and their in their further use also in in dialogues. So. When we, we say that we want to generate arguments, we say, okay, we are uh, good in extracting arguments from text. Uh, let's see how we can use them then to, to, to generate arguments, maybe at the beginning in an in a, in a extractive way, meaning what we extract is used to compose the explanatory arguments. So I'm back again to the different kinds of, uh, um, of uh, explanation patterns that uh, also the DARPA uh, XI program uh, presented. So we have first analytic statements in natural language that describe the elements and the context that support a choice. It means that you can build these analytic statements using the arguments that you have. You can use the claim, okay, the evidence supporting the claim, the backing the claim, the warrant, if any, okay. So the warrant is a really, in a way, the inferential step, okay, if it is explicit in the text, how the inferential step has been taken. This is a kind of, a, let's say, the gift if you find it in, in the text, because it really helps. It, it really simplifies your life in making these analytic statements stronger, the explanation stronger. And then we have visualizations of a high to highlight portions of the raw data that support the choice. This is also something which is, uh, which is possible. Um, cases that invoke specific examples, as we said. Well, before I said, okay, this is something that we do need, it's something that we do use as humans and so on, which is true. But it's also very hard because you need to find uh, more than one case to support by example the choice, which means that just the single uh, data that it's analyzed is not enough. So you need in a way to, to have some kind of knowledge base that, which helps you in providing further examples. Same for the rejection of the alternative choices. These, these rejections argue against the less preferred answers, okay, showing, okay, we go, we, we, we go for option A because option B is not, uh, let's say, uh, is not, uh, I don't know, it's not reliable, option C uh, is, not, uh, is not sure, and so on, okay? And this is also hard to find all these arguments because you need the arguments for the rejected opinions. You don't always have uh, have that. 
So let's take uh, a concrete example. So we we work in the in this uh, European project, uh, which is called Antidote, uh, on uh, how to generate explanations from uh, in medicine uh, from uh, uh, clinical cases, uh, such that uh, we can uh, really explain why uh, the machine goes for a certain uh, option and uh, how we can uh, and why the, why the reason and why the other options are discarded. This is uh, very good. Uh, we want to generate them automatically. So how we can, in a way, uh, really tackle that in an in a, in effective way. So let's start with a use case example, okay? Because first of all, we, we, we say, okay, we want to, 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 to have some kind of a, of a ground truth. We want to, to have a ground truth with explanations. This is, first of all, the, the, the a big issue, okay? So explanations in natural language, uh, in medicine, well, it, they are not that easy to, uh, to be found, okay? So cases, uh, uh, clinical cases look like, uh, look like this one. Uh, so you have a 37 years old woman, it's brought to an emergency department because of the intermittent chest pain for three days and so on, okay? There are all the, uh, let's say, evidence to support the, 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 the case, but of course there is not, not the conclusion. This is just the description of the, 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 the state of, of things, okay? And then uh, in this uh, data set we are working on, you, you have uh, also uh, a, a number of options which are uh, the, 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 the possible diagnosis. Uh, th these are alternative options. Well, what's, what's our goal? Our goal is uh, to, to make a system which is able to train residents, which means uh, uh, medicine uh, students, to improve argument-based diagnosis. Because when we discussed with, with, uh, with uh, doctors in, in the hospitals, they said, well, it's very good for us uh, explanations, but actually we, we also, a, a problem for us is really already to have that our students should be able to explain how they have uh, taken a certain decision, okay? And why they've discarded the others, because it really shows what are the inferential steps, what are the reasoning that has been taken by the doctor to take the decision, and so it means also that we can, we can um, explain if it is not the right choice, why? Uh, and uh, we can understand if he, he, the, the student has taken this decision for the right, op the, the, the right reason, because it's not the same, maybe just taking it for the wrong reason. So we need them to, to explain. So this is our goal, to have this AI that is able to generate explanation and make the user improve the, the, the students improve their explanations on the name. So this is the, the real case we want to, to, to tackle. So here we have uh, seven different options that are uh, possible diagnosis, okay? And there is just one uh, correct answer, which is in this case, A, acute pericarditis, okay? So basically what we have is that we have the case, that's what I showed you uh, before. Then we have the, the, the diagnosis, the right diagnosis, acute pericarditis. And what is nice in this, in, this, uh, in this data set is that we also have the reason. So we have the explanation. The explanation in this case is a friction rub and diffuse low grade ST segment elevation equals pericarditis, okay? So this is the explanation very short, okay, very, uh, very, let's say, synthetic, okay, but still, this is the kind of explanations we have in our data set, and that's, that, that's already quite difficult to, to get such a kind of information. So, as what we do is not magic, uh, and we want to do that uh, in, a, in a, let's say, uh, in, a, in, a, in a real way, how can we tackle these? How can we move from the case we have, Okay, that's this one, to the, the correct uh, diagnosis. Okay, but in particular, how we can get what is the, the explanation. So we have the clinical case and the diagnosis, how we want, let's say, to, to have this, how we want to have, a, let's say, our output for the system is a diagnosis like this one. The patient is showing a pericarditis, which was the, the right answer. 
because she has a friction rub and diffuse low grade ST segment elevation. Okay, so this is our, let's say, target result. How can we get it? So the first step is that we can go for extractive explanatory argument generation. So we detect that, for instance, we have uh, a rub is heard during systole, okay? So this is uh, something that we can extract from, uh, from the, the text, from the case. Then there is that an HEG uh, shows normal sinus rhythm and diffuse upwardly concave ST segment elevation. So the HEG shows that. And so what we can have is that we can extract the evidence that are used to come to the right, let's say, uh, diagnosis, pericarditis, to then use them to generate the explanation. So in this case, the patient is showing pericarditis because Arab is heard during systole and the HG shows concave ST segment elevation. Okay, so this is not precisely the same. Uh, uh, the same um, explanation we have in, in our in our data set, but still is something we can build, we can construct, extracting the different premise in the um, in the case we have, because we should do with what we have with the data we have. So, um, what are the the, the 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 issues in a way? So you 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 just having. Let's say the, uh, the, 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 the argument mining part, mining the arguments and so on is not enough alone, okay? Because we need also knowledge. We need knowledge to, show, to, to, say, to see how among all these premises we have, because I put them, you see, in uh, square brackets, we, among all them, why are, what are the right one I should pick to then go to the right, uh, to, to, to motivate, to, 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 to support uh, the, the, the right, uh, the right um, diagnosis. So that, that's, that's the, the, the goal. Diagnosis uh, with explanation by expert. Well, the patient is showing a pericarditis because she has a friction rub and diffuse low-grade ST segment elevation. This is what we have in the data set, our ground truth. What we can do? is that we can generate a diagnosis with the extracted explanatory arguments. Our goal in particular is just to concentrate on the generation of the explanatory argument, not really the prediction of the right uh, uh, diagnosis. We, this is, uh, the, the, let's say, the focus of uh, other, uh, other teams in the project. The patient is showing a pericarditis because Arab is heard during systole and HG shows concave ST segment elevation. What do we have? We have the premises that are extracted from uh, the, the description of the case and the correct diagnosis. We also have the, the, the explanation, but well, it's not always easy to, to, to use that uh, in order to, in a way, uh, um, generate uh, from scratch a new explanation, so in an extractive way. So what do we need further? Well, we need criteria, as I said, to choose among the premises to pick the right ones, okay? So we need to, to be able to say, okay, we have, uh, I don't know, 15 premises. What are the right ones supporting, justifying the diagnosis? And sometimes the, the, the reasons behind the diagnosis are not just explicitly stated in the evidence. So what if the explanation is not contained in the evidence? What if you, it's, it's kind of an, an inferential an inference based on the knowledge you have. This is this is very very. Uh, this happens very often. So you need to have a, a clinical knowledge base. That's what we we have. Okay, like a UMLS, for instance, uh, having the knowledge graphs for the clinical knowledge and use them use it to select what are the the, the, the used the useful premise premise in the case and use that in addition to make uh, the inference and build the, the, the explanation. So in, genera in, in general is uh, moving to dialogues. Uh, as, as I hope I have showed that already for, from that, it's quite, quite difficult already to, to generate single explanatory arguments. Moving to uh, explanatory dialogue is, uh, is, uh, is complex. Um, 
just generating uh, effective uh, and interactive explanatory arguments is not enough. Uh, we, 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 we focus first on extractive argument generation. Uh, you can have also abstractive argument generation, but there you really need to have a lot of, uh, of data, a lot of ground truth to make the system learn how these explanations in these precise uh, topic look like. And then this means also using large scale and supervised language models to generate these arguments. And then to, 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 to close, and then I will, I, I mean, close to the conclusion, what, what, how we can evaluate how good these explanatory arguments are. Because at a certain point, well, we need to have also good explanatory argument, not just some kind of explanatory argument. So there is the quality, okay? We should have variability in the explanation of the argument, not always the same argument which is proposed, no repeatedness, uh, quantity, because we need uh, the system to be able to generate uh, arguments as, as, as we need. And then we can use, for instance, standard evaluation metrics like blue or the, the birth score, for instance. So what are, to conclude, the, the main challenges we, we faced? So first of all, a lack of data or better annotated data. You want to generate explanations. There are very natural language explanations. We, there are very few data sets containing natural language explanations. Very, and in addition, we would like to have argument-based explanations, which, are, which means that there should be some kind of a structure, not just one word, two words, okay? And then, uh, well, the problem, but this is not only for explanations, in general, in argument mining and argument generation, how to inject knowledge, uh, common sense knowledge, war knowledge, uh, specific domain knowledge, you know, for the clinic, for the medical uh, domain, for the legal domain, and so on, to allow for generalizations of, of, of arguments, uh, for uh, instantiations of argument, inference, further inferences from what you extract. And then the problem is that you want to evaluate explanatory uh, dialogues. Well, you have to first evaluate uh, uh, the quality of the generated arguments that are proposed in these dialogues, but you want also to have some kind of uh, structural simplicity in the dialogue, coherence in the dialogue, minimality, you don't want to bother the, 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 the user with huge uh, discussions and so on, just uh, annoying him. And what else? What else? There are many elements uh, and so on. And then finally, there is, I, I'm back to one of the arguments I proposed uh, first at the beginning of this talk, well, are these explanations actually for humans? How do these explanations work for humans? So we need to address also some kind of human uh, evaluation. We need the human feedback to know if what for us is satisfying uh, as an explanation is actually satisfying for our uh, target, uh, target users. And I conclude here, and I thank you a lot for, for your attention and ready to, uh, to answer your questions or to discuss with you if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Serena, for this uh, very, very interesting, exciting talk. Um, so are there any questions? We have uh, about 20 minutes for discussion and questions. So the floor is to the participants. OK. Yes, um, Stefan. I see one and yeah, yeah, Stefan, please go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, thanks a lot for the very interesting presentations. Uh, um, <clears throat> you had the point about crown truth data on your slides as well. And I was wondering, I mean, given the fact that in some of your works, the uh, uh, data sources you've been using are quite specific and given like the medical data you've been working with, and given the fact that, yeah, I mean, judging from our own exper experience with um, um, uh, crown truth data, training data, and testing data for uh, um, argument mining approaches and the like, um, that it's in fact very hard to get very proper high, high quality labels for all of that. I was wondering if you could explain in a few words um, your experiences with crown truth data sets for the different kind of uh, works you've been talking about today. Yeah, so, well, 
building these 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 data set, these annotated data is, is a huge work. So uh, at the end, it's it's uh, in a way it's amazing because you, you, when uh, when you present these these kind of results, you just spend a few words on the data set, and then you you describe that you use these uh, huge uh, deep learning architectures, and these are the results and so on. And this is at the end the the part which is a uh, uh, which is uh, provided with, with more, more, more attention, but building the data sets is, is a huge work, super time consuming. Uh, well, the, um, there are different issues. So uh, what we do is that, uh, well, first we have, of course, the data collection, then uh, you, you write the guidelines to, to do the annotation. Uh, I think this guidance should be very precise such that then when we recruit the annotators, uh, then them can, uh, let's say, uh, go to the, to the annotation step in a kind of, a, let's say, a quite a automatic way. They don't need to think too much, let's say, when they annotate. There should be a kind of automatic process. So for the clinical uh, case, it was, uh, let's say, easier in a way because we defined the guidelines with, uh, with doctors. So we established them with the experts and then we, uh, we recruited annotators um, to, to, to annotate, and then we compute the inter annotator agreement just to check the reliability of the, the resulting resource. That was easy. When we, want, when we went to the, to the political debates, that was quite uh, more complex because, of course, uh, on the one side, you need to provide, uh, in a way, um, let's say, guidelines for these political debates were uh, harder. To, to, to be described because uh, there are different kinds of, uh, let's say, premises and claims that, that are put forward depending on the candidates. And also depending on the, 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 the let's say, the, the year when uh, the, these, uh, this discussion has been made, meaning that uh, it's, uh, uh, in a way, there has been an evolution in the way of argumenting from uh, 1960 to, uh, I don't know, the last debate we analyzed, uh, which was uh, Trump-Clinton, it was not the same. So we, we needed to, uh, to really take care of that. Uh, we needed to provide also uh, the, our annotators with some uh, let's say reliable sources uh, that they can check when they have questions. Because sometimes the, 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 the topic which was discussed in these political debates were very precise, very uh, detailed in US politics. So they, they have no knowledge on, uh, on, on that. The point of choosing the annotators is another key point because you could say, okay, so how do you know that these annotations are not biased, for instance? So when we, uh, when you select uh, some kind of, uh, uh, some annotators uh, to annotate, I don't know, fallacious arguments, for instance, and you make them annotate uh, the, the, the political debates, there could be the question, okay, they find, uh, I don't know, more fallacious arguments for, uh, in uh, Trump's debates, so is this a bias because they look at these debates with a, a different high or uh, this is really what, uh, what, what is in the data? So for that, you need to, to, to in a way, anonymize the data and uh, make uh, have the annotators not to be too much involved in US politics. So without to, uh, so having the knowledge this is the difficult part. So finding a balance between having the, enough knowledge to understand the debates, but not being too much involved such that the, your personal opinion is affecting too much. Okay, thank you. That was a very elaborate answer. Maybe I can follow up with a very short, short question as well. Um, so you've been also talking about explanations for predictions. And when it comes to evaluating those, I think it's also a very big challenge given the fact that you can have very good explanations for very poor predictions. And it's very hard to separate the two within a user-based evaluation. And um, did you make experiences with that regard? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Well, yes, the, the, this, is a, this is actually an issue. That's uh, what we do in, the, in, this, uh, in this antidote project is that uh, we have the, the predictions on the, on the diagnosis. For that, we have a quite, a, let's say, a lot of, of, of data. So the, the, the results, the, 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 the team in, um, in, uh, in Belgium is, is obtaining is quite, uh, quite good. So the explanations, uh, okay, are in a way, rely, uh, say they are relying on these good results. But of course, this is not the case for all the, the, the application uh, scenarios. For our, let's say, in a way, 
constrained use case, it, it works, but definitely this is an issue. You can generate very convincing, uh, let's say, explanations on a prediction which is not uh, that reliable. Okay. Thank you, Serena. Uh, so we have uh, two questions, two more questions as far as I can see, uh, but I would just like to encourage participants to turn on their cameras. Yes, thank you, Harith. The floor is yours. Uh, hi, Serena. Thank you for the talk. Um, uh, just coincidentally, I was listening to a talk by a, uh, one of the PhD students in our lab at the Knowledge Media Institute just yesterday. And, and she's looking into a similar field, you know, about explaining AI to, uh, to uh, medical doctors. And what she has found uh, through talking to some of the, uh, some of the doctors was that when, when it comes to the AI models, they didn't seem to want to know about the uh, uh, kind of the, uh, the workings of the model itself. So, you know, in most AI explainability works, you know, the, computer scientists like ourselves, they try to explain how the algorithm reached its conclusion, if you like. And, and the people that this student was talking to, they didn't care about that. What they cared about is what data went into the model and how, uh, how accurate the model is. Um, I don't know whether you, you know, did you, did you get kind of a similar experience uh, and, and just wanted to know what your thoughts about that? Yeah, thanks for the question. It's it, it, actually, I, uh, I, I agree, I mean, 100% on that. that. That's the point. That was the point. When we were, uh, in a way, uh, thinking to this, uh, to this project, we started discussing with doctors and we went to them saying something like, okay, we want to make a wonderful project. We will be able to explain you the decision of the, 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 the machine so that you know that when a diagnosis is proposed, very good, you will know the reasons so you, you can rely the machine and so on. And they were, uh, let's say, mildly interested. They were saying, okay, but, but uh, what are the, 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 how good are your diagnoses? That was the only thing that was interesting for them. That's why we changed, in a way, our focus. And we said, um, well, having explanations, and, having, uh, and that's also the purpose of argumentation in general, which is uh, raising the critical thinking of uh, users, of people, and so on. So is, is to, uh, to, to, to show how a certain decision is supported. So what we are proposing is something to train medicine uh, students to explain their decisions. So the, the goal of our system is not to, to explain at the end the decision to, uh, to, to, to a doctor, because at the end they are not interested in that, but it's more to uh, train the, the residents, the, the, the medicine students, in providing uh, well-structured uh, explanations, natural language explanations to their uh, decision when they have to, to pass the exams, because this is at the end, the kind of, uh, of exams that they have to, to pass through, and they have be, been able to explain in a in a proper way their their decision. So that's that's more because otherwise the, the doctors are not that interested as we were thinking. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in general, um, I guess we still need to be able to explain the decision of the algorithm, even if the okay. end user, like the doctors or financial sector, whoever it is receiving it, are not interested. But I think it, you know, there's still a need for us to be able to explain it in case something goes wrong. And I think this is probably more so in the medical domain. Um, just I will follow with one question and I'll uh, hand it over to Jose. Um, uh, you might have you kind of touched on that. When it comes to personalization, do, do you feel we need to or how close we are to provide kind of personalized explanations? Uh, you know, I, I've seen some chatbots, for example, used by some, some of the medical I don't know if you've, do you know Babylon? It's one of those uh, uh, companies. Yeah. Uh, so uh, do you feel this is something that we, we are getting a bit closer to? Well, uh, to be very honest, I, this is not my field. So I, I, uh, we, we are not working on this kind of personalization. Definitely, this is something which, uh, which should be taken into account because as I said at the beginning, you need at the end, uh, if these, uh, these explanations are, are, uh, are produced for 
target users, then we should be uh, let's say effective for these users. And the same explanation, which is effective for one user, is may, might not be effective for 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 the other. Um, well, what what we do is that we are working with sociologists for that because actually this is, that's not only uh, let's say for computer scientists at least that's not uh, only for us to understand uh, given the different kinds of users we can uh, we can uh, deal with uh, how we can provide personalized uh, arguments. It's not really for explanations because uh, there it's just for student medicine, but it's more for uh, another project we work on which is about uh, generating counter arguments to fight uh, hate, um, hate speech and to fight disinformation online. So in these counter arguments we want to generate, the, the same counter arguments might not work for different persons. So that's, that's where we work on that. All right, thanks, Serena. Jose? Yeah, uh, thank you, Serena, for the talk. It was very interesting, very, uh, very, very, very interesting to, to listen to. Um, I have kind of two questions when the, uh, that I would like to, to discuss with you. The first one is related to, to the actual nature of, of claims. I mean, you have shown work that expands across different domains. And uh, my own experience is that it's very difficult to, <laughs> to even define what a claim is depending on the, on the domain, right? And uh, the techniques that you use are, are very different uh, depending on what is understood as a claim uh, um, uh, uh, in a particular domain. So I would like to, to check with you what your experience is about that, how you go about it. I do agree. I mean, I come from at the very beginning from a, from our computational models of arguments. So we were working on theoretical argumentation. So a claim is a, is a claim is a in a kind of a let's say logical formula that that was very clear. And then as soon as you move to natural language uh, claims, well, the, the 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 form of the claims changed a lot from the from the domains. That's why at the, at the end you need to. Uh, uh, in a way, I rewrite the guidelines, the annotation guidelines each time you you move to to, to another domain. So for us, these are mainly, let's say, uh, for for the medic for the medicine for the clinical cases uh, that they are the statements in a way stating what the the conclusion of the of the study uh, in the political debates. That's 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 more more complex because uh, there are different kinds of claims. So you just, uh, uh, in a way, in argumentation, you would have uh, some kind of a uh, let's say well structured claims. Sometimes in political debates, they're just slogans, so very short uh, short claims. Uh, I I I think there is no just one unique definition of claim it, it applies really to different uh, uh, to different uh, to different domains so that's what we experience yeah and also i, I would like to add that uh, this is what um, 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 makes difficult many of these problems in a, in a way because you don't you don't even know what you are trying to extract from the text so you have to reformulate the whole the whole issue and um, you need a whole new data set for everything, right? So it's it's very difficult to reuse stuff in that sense. Yeah. Okay. That's, a, that's, that's one of the main issues in argument mining. Exactly. That's kind of flexibility and uh, general, generalization capability. Yeah. And the, the the following question that I have for you is: I see, for example, in your in your work in uh, in in the medical domain that you have. Um, um, I mean, uh, when you when you extract the arguments and uh, then uh, sometimes the arguments themselves or, or the explanation to this to this uh, um, diagnosis doesn't appear uh, explicitly in the text. Uh, so you have to do some kind of reasoning in order to do that. So if, uh, in that case, you decide to, to, to use uh, explicitly defined, explicitly structured uh, knowledge base or knowledge graph in order to reason with this. But uh, you can also model it uh, as a, I don't know, like an internal pro uh, um, problem. Internal uh, uh, problems in deep learning architecture and so on. I'm very interested in this kind of tension or, or how to decide or, or, or knowledge based methods against uh, or instead of or at the same additionally uh, to deep learning based methods. Uh, what is the right balance in this sense? And um, so, in this particular case, I wanted to check with you um, your rationale about that. How did you go about it in this case? Yeah. 
That's a very good question. I don't have an answer. I think that it's very hard to find this balance between the two because in a way we always, I mean, at the beginning, uh, when we started with argument mining, we started saying, okay, that uh, we just have these uh, deep learning models. Uh, wonderful, we have everything. And then we have language models, uh, BERT, and all the BERTology that has been uh, uh, done after that. Great, we have the solution because uh, everything is done. The results are just great. And then as soon as you move to something a bit more, more difficult, a bit more challenging, then, well, you need knowledge. And you need knowledge then to, to make also further reasoning because at the, at the end, otherwise you just extract, but then what do you do with what you extract? That's, that's just the, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of data, you cannot really make, uh, make uh, anything on, uh, on top of that. The, 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 main, the main difficulty is that uh, when you talk about what is the, the let's say, general, uh, precise, uh, sorry, precise uh, topics, that, that you, then you can easily, in a way, find the knowledge to, to be used. You can easily understand how to do that. When it, you move to common sense uh, knowledge, so I don't know, if you take the argumentation on social networks and so on, well, that, uh, that's another story. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that, that, there I don't have uh, a solution. That's uh, open research, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Jose. Uh, Daniel, hi, you have a question? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so in the beginning, you mentioned that uh, one of the uses for argumentation, and it's also uh, related to uh, political discourse and so on, is uh, of course to fight disinformation and so on and uh, and then i think there is this uh, premise that uh, you fight some kind of counteraction is through arguments right that you try to convince people yes. of something so i was wondering uh, what your thoughts are about how to evaluate those situations right because ultimately <clears throat> a successful argument, I would claim, is uh, one that changes person's behaviors. Because ultimately what you want to do is change someone's behavior, for example, voting or retweeting or something like that. So have you thought about how to do that to measure the effectiveness of, of arguments in that sense? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Thanks. Uh, the short answer is, uh, well, kind of yes. Let's say we don't do that on uh, because there is the, the point is that you need to have the the, the what what's the viewpoint of uh, of the user, the starting viewpoints on the user, and you need to see whether there is a, there has been a change in that given thanks to your to your arguments that's 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 very very difficult that's what we are trying to do with these uh, counter arguments to fight online disinformation because just saying this is this information uh, piece of information is is, uh, is useless because users just say okay it's just uh, i mean it's kind of theory that's uh, they just don't want us to to focus on these arguments and so on so you need to provide counter arguments but then you don't know if then these users who are relying this uh, this information actually change their mind, so just to to, to uh, just a, a compliment on that. Well, we did user experiments on that using uh, really uh, I mean uh, making them participate to some debates with a persuasive purpose. Okay, and we were asking at the beginning of the debate what which was their opinion on certain topics, and then we were debating with them. There was uh, someone who was playing a preci precise argumentation strategy to make them change their their viewpoint, uh, and we registered also their uh, emotion. Uh, we have the EEG uh, headset to to measure also these uh, the mental charge and the engagement and so on. And well, I was, uh, you see, for, from argumentation, I was saying, okay, logos arguments, so the purely logical ones should be the most effective ones. Well, no, they were really the lowest uh, ones at, uh, in absolute. Uh, the best were, were the, the pathos arguments. So as soon as people were using these very uh, empathic arguments, raising emotions and so on, people were 
they were maybe not completely changing their mind, but they were changing their mind on a, on a part of the, of the topic, just the sub part, or using sometimes ethos arguments, so more based on the reliability of the source. So saying something like, I'm an expert on that, then uh, trust me. But these were also not really working. So basically, the, the really persuasive arguments were those uh, emotional. I, I would, I would uh, be really curious. I have a theory my, of my own a hypothesis that what really counts is moral values. So fundamental values that people hold. And those arguments that somehow can relate to or against those values are the ones that, uh, that so you're not gonna change, it's very hard to change those values, but sometimes you can show that uh, a certain uh, claim is at some level contrary to yeah. what you presume are the moral values of that, that person. And uh, I would think that those would be more effective, but it'd be really interesting to measure that somehow to see whether that's actually the case, not easy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very nice talk. Thank you. Thanks. Well, we are uh, right on time to close the, the first uh, the first session of the workshop. Thank you very much, Serena, for this uh, excellent talk. And Thanks thank for you to all of you for uh, joining this morning. We'll continue in 15 minutes exactly, uh, 10.45 French time. So see you in a bit. Enjoy your coffee. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Maulana. And today, let's talk about our work incorporating external knowledge for evidence-based fact verification system. I am a PhD student at National University of Singapore, and this is joint work by myself and my supervisors, Prof. Winnie and Prof. Mongli. All right, let's see a little bit of background about the evidence-based fact verification task. The evidence-based fact verification task aims to predict the veracity of the claim given a set of evidence sentences, whether the evidence sentences supports the claim, refutes the claim, or the evidence sentences are not enough to verify the claim. Therefore, the task provides a claim sentence and a set of evidence sentences as the input, and the system needs to classify the input into three labels, supports, refutes, or not enough information. There are a couple of works trying to solve this task. However, we observe that at least there is a common challenge in those works where the previous system does not incorporate no common sense knowledge. We observe that in the previous works, some samples with sentences that can actually support or refute the claims are concluded as not enough information. So let's take a look at the first example. In this example, the token between the claim sentence and the evidence sentence only differs in horror and comedy. Human can easily guess that the answer of this claim is refutes because we understand that horror and comedy are antonyms. However, the existing model predicts the claim as not enough information because they do not know that horror and comedy are antonyms. Similarly, in the Zagan example, the existing model does not know that human settlement is related to city. Hence, the previous model predicts the claim as not enough information. So in this work, we propose a model called CGAT, Common Sense Graph Attention Network, that incorporates external knowledge into the claim verification process. Here is the big overview of CGAT. CGAT comprises of three steps, which are knowledge encoder module, evidence reasoning module, and label classification. Uh, the knowledge encoder module aims to transform the input sentences into knowledge-aware representation. Specifically, in this phase, we inject an external common sense knowledge to generate knowledge-aware representations. Then, the output of this module will be knowledge-aware representation for each claim sentence pair. And after generating the knowledge-aware representations, then they will pass through the evidence reasoning module. This reasoning module is motivated by the fact that sometimes the information to predict the claims are scattered into several evidence sentences. Therefore, this reasoning module provides a way for the evidence sentences to communicate with each other by propagating information among the evidence sentences. And the output of this module is the final representation for the claim sentence pair, which have the information from all the other evidence sentences. And lastly, the final representation will be passed through the label classification to predict the claims label. Now, we will talk a little bit more on how to obtain the knowledge-aware representations in the encoder module. So firstly, the knowledge encoder module uses BERT or any 
return language model to obtain the token level contextual representations denoted as B. Then, here is the part where we inject the common sense knowledge into the representations. In this work, we use ConceptNet as the external common sense knowledge. So, from the claim sentence pair, we first construct a phrase level graph G phrase, where its node in the graph is a phrase from the claim and sen evidence sentence and may correspond to a concept in ConceptNet. Uh, in this case, we use exact matching to match between a phrase in a sentence and a concept in the concept net. Then, its edge in the graph depicts the K-Hop semantic relations between the corresponding concepts in the concept net. And finally, we use GAT to learn a knowledge of representations where the one with CLS is for the sentence level representations and the others are for the phrase level representations. And this is the big picture of the evidence reasoning module. In this module, to be able to propagate information among evidence sentences, we again construct a fully connected graph and we name it as G evidence. We initialize its node in the graph with the representation of HS, which we have learned from the knowledge encoder module. And then, in order to ensure that its node in the graph have the information about all the other nodes, once again, we perform GAT to propagate the information. And finally, the output of this module is the result of GAT, denoted as H hat. Okay, so just now, we are talking about the big picture on the evidence reasoning module. Now, I would like to talk a little bit deeper on how the propagation works. And if you look at the visualization on the right, let's assume that we want to update the representations of node J, where node J have two incoming nodes from node I, and node j itself. So there are two steps to update this node j. The first one will be uh, we compute the information that needs to be propagated from all the next boring nodes. The propagated information are denoted as zj to j and zi to j. And after that, we combine all the incoming propagated information to be the final representation for node j. And so the idea of the propagated information z here is that we want to propagate only the information that is relevant to the target node. Therefore, we will compute the first level attention weight to examine which phrases from the source node that are relevant to the target node. And finally, the Z here is defined as the sentence level representation of the target nodes and the weighted sum of the phrase level representations from the source nodes. Now we come to the second step where we already have all the incoming propagated information and we would like to compute the final representation for node J by combining all the incoming representations. Uh, and before that, I would like to recall that this is an evidence graph where it's not represent a pair of claim and evidence sentence. Each of the evidence sentences may not be equally relevant to the other evidence sentences. Therefore, we employ a sentence level attention mechanism to obtain the final representation for node J. Specifically, we first compute the sentence level attention weight for all the incoming nodes denoted as B beta here, and then the final representation is the weighted sum of all the incoming representations. Finally, we come to the end of the CGAT, where from the final representation of each pair of claim and evidence sentence, we predict the claims level. And in order to do that, first, we use element-wise max operation to aggregate all the final representations denoted as O. Then we pass the results to a classification layer, which consists of a linear layer and a softmax function. The output of this classification layer has dimension of 3. It represents the probabilities of a label. And finally, the final label will be the one with the highest probability. We evaluate our proposed CGAT with three state-of-the-art models at the time, JIR, KJT, and RIM. So JIR employs BERT to obtain the claim sentence pair representation and utilize GAT to aggregate the evidence sentences before the claim prediction. Uh, and meanwhile, KJT differs into things. First, KJT tries a better language model, which is Robert Tallard's. And secondly, KJT performs a fine grained kernel GAT instead of standard GAT to aggregate the evidence sentences for the claim prediction. And for DREAM, the key contribution of DREAM is that DREAM converts 
the input into a semantic graph using semantic row labeling. Then, similar with the previous works, Grimm employs pre-trained language model, in this case XLNet, to obtain the contextual representations and utilize graph network to propagate the information for claim prediction. And in terms of data sets, we use two different kinds of data sets in our works. They are FIFR and UKP Snobs Corpus. Uh, the main difference between these two data sets is the number of claims. FIFR has way more claims than UKP Snobs Corpus. And another distinction between those two data sets is that the claims in FIFA datasets are rather synthetical. Uh, it is extracted from Wikipedia with some ways of mutation by annotators. Uh, and meanwhile, claims in UKP snobs are more natural, obtained from various web sources. And it, in terms of the evaluation metrics, we use the standard evaluation metrics introduced by each datasets. First, we have label accuracy here, which is the number of correct classified claims. Then, we have FFR score, the number of correct classified claims using the set of relevant evidence. And lastly, we have recall and F1 score. This table shows the performance of CGAT on FIFA dataset. CGAT performs all models by at least two points in the development sets and at least three points in the test sets. This shows the superiority of CGAT compared to, the all, to all the baseline models. And as we can see here, Although CGT has comparable label accuracy as DREAM, it has still achieved higher scores on the FIFA score, demonstrating that augmenting the evidence sentences with common sense knowledge from the concept net increases the inferenceability of CGT. And this table shows the performance of CGT on UKP Snobs Corpus. Similarly, in the UKP Snobs Corpus, where the claim sentences is more natural, CGT still outperforms the, the other models by larger margins. This behavior indicates that adding external knowledge enhances the robustness of CGT in the UKP Snobs Corpus. We present the ablation studies to show the importance of each module in CGT. The first experiment is CGT without evidence reasoning module. This Experiment skips the reasoning modules, and to obtain the prediction, we perform element-wise max pooling on all CLS representation from the knowledge encoder module. Then, uh, the result will be passed through the label classification to obtain the claims label. Uh, and the second experiment, CGAT but without concept net, it skips the construction of G phrase and initializes the node in G evidence using the output of BERT model. And as we can see from the table, for the FIFR development set, we observe that the drop in level accuracy and FIFA score is the greatest when CGAT does not incorporate the evidence reasoning module. And this indicates that the importance of the module in the verification process. And also, the performance of CGAT birds is also smaller if we don't incorporate common sense knowledge, which demonstrates the importance of the knowledge encoder module to predict the claims. Now. I'm going to present a case study showing the strengths of CGAT. In the first example, the claim is predicted as having not enough information by KGAT, while the proposed CGAT is able to provide the correct prediction. This is because the model is able to extract the concept net path Earthling has antonym relations to alien. This path has enriched the corresponding bird representations as the G phrase provides the information that Earthling and alien is an antonym. And moreover, CGAT without concept net also predict the claims as not enough information. This behavior demonstrates that the knowledge encoder module successfully enriched their corresponding representations with the corresponding common sense knowledge found in the concept net. Similarly, the second example is predicted correctly by CGAT and not by KGAT or CGAT without concept net because we can find the following paths in the concept net that connects phrases like polygamy with two and wives and also immigrants with citizens or permanent residents. Those paths can actually enhance the contextual representation from BERT model to be able to predict the correct predictions. And next, the following two examples illustrate the weaknesses of CGAT. In the first example, although Syria is different from Iran, both KGAT and CGAT still infers that the claim is supported. Uh, it is due to the large number of overlapping tokens between the claim and evidence sentences. Further, the existence of the path Syria and Iran in the concept net indicates that 
uh, both countries are in the same continent is not helpful to the model and can lead to the wrong prediction. Meanwhile, in the second example, CGOT pre predicts as not enough information because there is no overlapping words between the claim and the evidence sentence. Further, uh, conceptnet does not contain the phrase impaled with a fork and the phrase a uh, fog was through his nose because these phrases are uncommon. And since we do not have any phrases that can connect the claim and the evidence sentence, it makes the model has no clue at all to verify the claim. Alright, to sum up this presentation, uh, we have proposed CGIT to incorporate external knowledge to the evidence-based fact verification task. Uh, the CGIT utilizes the information from ConceptNet to enrich the phrase level representations obtained from any pre-trained language model like BERT or Roberta. Then, uh, CGIT constructs the evidence graph so the model allows the evidence sentences to communicate with each other. Uh, and we have done some experiments for CG CGIT on two datasets, FIFR and UKP SNOP corpus. The experiments demonstrate the effectiveness of CGIT to the evidence-based fact verification task. Uh, all right, that's all, and thank you for your attention. Then, hello everyone. My name is Andrea Yana. I am a PhD student at the University of Mannheim, and today I will be presenting the uh, work on analyzing the bias of news recommender systems using sentiment uh, and stance detection. Uh, this is a joint work with Mevi Shalam and Alexander Grote from uh, KIT and Katarina Ludwig, Philipp Müller and Heiko Paulheim from the University of Mannheim. So nowadays we have very large volumes of uh, news data that are published online every day. And news providers increasingly use recommender systems to alleviate the information overload of internet users uh, by providing customized content based on their best preferences. However, such algorithmic news curation influences the diversity of content that the user are exposed to because uh, recommenders selectively filter out articles that seem irrelevant uh, in order to maximize user engagement or that are inconsistent with the pre-existing attitudes and beliefs of users. Um, as previous research has shown uh, that humors are more likely to accept information that reinforces their own uh, opinions. So from this point of view, recommender systems shape the user's perception of the world. Uh, and over time, this has led to concerns that individuals uh, are being isolated from diverse um, perspectives and are trapped into so-called filter bubbles or echo chambers in which they can only interact with, uh, with similar ideological viewpoints. And in the context of news, uh, this is belief um, uh, that in the long run, um, overexposure to less diverse viewpoints will lead to polarization. So diversity is paramount for news uh, quality and as, um, as well as to ensure that the public is well informed by receiving a balanced and broad variety of information. However, diversity itself is also a multifaceted concept. It can refer, for example, to pluralism of sources of the topics discussed in the articles or uh, to viewpoint diversity, so to the stances um, that the articles take on a given topic. And in this work, we focus on viewpoint diversity, and more specifically, we analyze viewpoint diversity and recommendations in terms of the uh, diversity in sentiments and stances in the suggested news. So on the one hand, we have sentiment analysis, uh, where we try to determine if the text is written in a positive, uh, neutral, or negative manner. And on the other hand, in stance detection, we try to determine the author's viewpoint towards um, a given target issue in the article, which might not be explicitly mentioned. So what we're looking at is whether different kinds of recommender systems uh, have a tendency to recommend um, articles with certain sentiment or stances, which we refer to as bias here, and how this correlates with the pre-existing user bias and how does this affect the diversity of recommendations. So the rest of the presentation is, followed, uh, is structured as follows. I will firstly introduce the corpus that we worked on and the graph, uh, the knowledge graph that we generated from this corpus. I will then uh, explain how we annotated the corpus with uh, sentiment scores and stance labels. And then I will discuss um, the different recommender systems that we looked at, uh, how they perform, um, and the bias analysis that we conducted. Uh, in terms of the corpus, uh, we chose 45 German media outlets that uh, span the entire political spectrum. So they range from the very far left to the far right uh, of the political scene. And we focused on the topic of refugees and migration as we 
uh, chose a topic that is um, considered already quite uh, polarizing in the German media. Now uh, we represented, we captured this topic using different keywords. Um, and we came up with a list of inclusion and exclusion criteria in order to um, determine the relevancy of the articles for our corpus. So, for example, the articles should contain at least um, two keywords that should be separated by minimum 50 words in order to exclude articles that only mention these keywords in one paragraph. Um, the article length should be at least 150 words to exclude um, very short um, advertisements or um, descriptions. And um, we focused on articles published between um, the beginning of 2019 and October 2020. So this was before the um, you, uh, war in Ukraine and the new um, um, migration wave from Ukraine. Um, so after the curation of the corpus, we um, ended up with 4,557 news articles. Um, what we did next is uh, construct a knowledge graph of news articles using the textual information and metadata that um, we crawled from this um, uh, news outlet. So uh, to walk you through the process, what we did for each of the articles, we would uh, add a node in the knowledge graph, and then we would add textual information as literals, for example, uh, the title or the body of the text. Um, as well as metadata information. So keywords, uh, authors, publishers, uh, the date when the article was published, and this information we added using uh, relations from, from schema.org. In the next step, uh, we wanted to model events because news usually describe um, events. Um, and to do this, we firstly uh, extracted named entities from the titles and the abstracts. So, for example, we extracted locations such as Moria here uh, that we represented as places in the graph and um, persons such as Angela Merkel that we represented as actors. Um, and for this, we used um, relations from the simple event model. And in addition to this, we also extracted uh, named entities from the keywords as well as uh, authors or publishers of the article. And in a second step, we disambiguated these entities using the Wikidata knowledge graph. So we linked the entities that we extracted from the text and metadata to their counterparts in Wikidata. And in the third step, what we did was enrich the base graph with additional relations and entities from Wikidata in order to um, derive a deeper knowledge level connections between articles based on the entities that they contain. And um, the relations between these entities in Wikidata. As you can see here, for example, we connected Horst Seerhofer and Der Spiegel based um, on the country Germany. So in the end, we uh, created three types of, of the graph. The first type is the base graph, which contains the textual information, the metadata and the entities, um, and has around uh, 54,000 nodes and eight, uh, 1,800 uh, edges. Um, the entities graph uh, was constructing re by removing the literal nodes from the base graph and by adding up to free hop um, entity neighbors from Wikidata of the entities that we extracted from the text and metadata. Um, and lastly, we combined the two versions to create one complete graph that has both literal nodes and entity nodes. Um, and we ended up with a graph of um, over 800,000 uh, nodes and over 6,600,000 edges. So having this corpus, the next step um, was then to uh, annotate it with sentiment scores and stance labels. For the sentiment scores, uh, we used a pre-trained bird-based sentiment uh, classification model for German language text. Um, this model calculates a probability estimate, which classifies each document that is either being positive, uh, neutral, or negative. Uh, so we computed a sentiment score um, uh, in the interval of minus one to one uh, by, uh, by subtracting the negative sentiment probability from the positive sentiment probability. And we added these um, relations to the graph using our own, um, our own relation. And secondly, uh, for stance detection, uh, we also adopted a pre-trained model, more specifically a German BERT model. Um, and this model we fine tune on the German subset of the X-Stance dataset. So the X-Stance dataset is a dataset for multilingual and multi-target stance detection for different languages. So here we used um, only the part that concerns the German language. 
Um, and what we did was um, take a pair of an article and one of the five questions that you can see in this table that um, are representative of the topic that we are dealing with. And then we labeled each article as either being in favor or against one of these questions. And in the table, you can see how many uh, articles we have in favor or against each of the questions as well as the average score. So um, a label in favor of the question would uh, receive a score of one while a label against the question would receive a score of minus one. Um, so having this, in place, we uh, moved on to um, analyzing different types of recommender systems. Um, and here I would firstly like to introduce the user data that we worked on. So this user data was actually collected in a different uh, user study that was aimed at uh, measuring the political polarization effect of recommender systems on users. Um, so in this user study, we um, um, contacted different uh, participants in an online study. Um, they were representative of the German internet users aged between 18 and 74. Um, and each of these uh, participants was randomly assigned to uh, different recommender systems. So three text-based recommenders and one random uh, recommender. And each of the participants was shown um, a preview of six articles. Then they were asked to choose the article that they would find most interesting to read. Um, and they would click on it, read it, and this choice was then logged into the user history. And the process was repeated four times. So for each of the users, we would have four interactions. Um, as you can see in the first row in the table, we um, actually removed around 700 uh, articles because we wanted to reduce the, re um, these articles were over 1,500 words and the aim was to reduce the reading time and to ensure a strong response from the participants. So in the end, we ended up with 1,417 participants and we split uh, this data into a training and a test set. Um, however, due to the provenance of the ratings, so the majority of the ratings um, were based on articles that were recommended with these text-based recommenders. We uh, believe that these text-based recommenders would be um, prone to overfitting. So we also created a subset of this data set based uh, only on the um, ratings from the randomly um, recommended articles. Okay, um, then uh, we chose um, four different types of models. So the first three types of models are text-based models in which we um, represent each news article using um, uh, one of these um, different uh, models. So for example, a TFIDF4 to record a transformer model. Uh, then the user profile would be based um, on the representations of the news um, read by the user. And we would compute the similarity between the user profile and each candidate news article as the cosine similarity between their representations. Um, and in this case, we um, use the mean max scaling to um, uh, approximate probability scores based on this uh, similarity scores. Uh, for all of the models, we um, um, evaluated them on uh, click-through rate prediction. So basically, we take uh, each user in the data set and for each uh, candidate article, we compute the probability that the user will click on this candidate article. Uh, the fourth model that we chose was a bit more complex. So it's a knowledge-aware recommender, uh, which, uh, uh, which um, propagates a user's potential preferences along the edges of a knowledge graph. So the model generates ripple sets, which are actually sets of multi-hop entity neighbors that encode uh, the user's interest based on the entities that are extracted from his read articles. Uh, so these ripple sets are then used to explain higher order preferences where um, the strength of the user preferences diminishes um, the more we go away from the original um, seed uh, of entities in the knowledge graph. And the final click probability is predicting, uh, predicted using the preference distribution of the user for a candidate news, which we um, obtain by superposing this multiple ripple sets. Um, and for this model, we use the entities knowledge graph that I introduced a few slides earlier. So as we can notice in this data set, um, all the text-based recommenders achieve the best, um, so the text-based recommenders achieve the best performance in terms of AUC and F1 score on the complete test score, uh, test data set, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, RippleNet um, actually 
uh, outperforms the transformer and the work vec based models in terms of accuracy. However, um, as we said, we thought this uh, text-based models uh, would overfit on this data set. So we also analyzed their performance on the random test set. Um, and here we can see that um, the RippleNet model uh, shows better performance in terms of AUC and accuracy. And surprisingly, we also noticed that the TFIDF model is not able to make um, correct predictions. Um, so what we conclude so far is that uh, using just entities to compute recommendations uh, still gives us a decent performance um, and seems to be more robust to changes in the data compared to the other uh, types of recommender systems. But we are, what we are more interested is, um, in is whether these recommenders um, are somehow biased for, uh, towards certain sentiment and stances. Um, so we started by computing a bias score. Um, this bias score is in the interval of minus one to one, um, where minus one represents either a user or a recommender's tendency for articles uh, with negative sentiments or with stances against a given topic, and plus one denotes uh, opposite. So a score of zero would indicate um, a user that has a balanced news con consumption or a recommender that um, either um, recommends um, um, mostly news with um, neutral sentiments or, for example, um, relatively equal amount of news with both positive and negative sentiments. Um, and to compute these biases, we looked at two things. On the one hand, the recommender bias, and on the other hand, the correlation between the recommender bias and the pre-existing user bias in terms of sentiment and stances. So in the first case, um, we asked if the recommenders have a tendency to recommend articles with a certain sentiment. And what we need to keep in mind is um, that overall, the average sentiment score of, our, of uh, all our articles is slightly negative with a score of uh, minus 0 0.154. However, uh, even taking this into account, we, can, we found out that users are significantly more prone uh, to reading um, articles that have negative sentiments. Uh, we also observed that recommenders are more likely to suggest um, news with negative sentiments, as indicated by the average recommender sentiment bias, which is uh, generally larger than the average sentiment score of the articles in the data set. Um, only the knowledge um, aware model recommends in both cases articles with um, slightly less negative sentiment than the one that we have um, in the corpus, um, but these differences were um, it's only statistically significant for uh, the word to vec based recommender and only on the complete test set. Um, then we looked at whether this um, tendency of the recommender to, uh, to recommend articles with a negative sentiment is somehow correlated with the preferences of the users. Um, and on the one hand, does, there doesn't seem to be a large difference between the recommender and the user bias scores. Uh, so the um, text-based recommenders follow the same tendencies uh, for negative sentiments as the users, um, which could indicate that these uh, recommenders actually do learn from the user history and uh, generate suggestions and amplify their existing preferences. However, we did observe a statistically significant difference between the user and the uh, recommender average sentiment scores in the case of the knowledge-based model. Um, on the complete test set, which shows that maybe this model might be less prone to amplifying these existing sentiment preferences. Uh, we also found a significant positive correlation between the text-based recommenders and the user bias. Um, and this means that, uh, for example, if a user prefers to read only negative, um, only articles with a negative sentiment towards the um, topic of refugees living in Germany, these recommenders will continue to recommend the same kind of articles with negative sentiments. So in this case, the user will be less and less exposed uh, to articles with positive sentiments. Uh, so we'll, we'll, he will have less access to news that might not agree with his existing views or preferences. Um, in the case of RippleNet, we only found a, a slight positive correlation with the user bias. Uh, we repeated the same analysis also in terms of stances. Um, and here we observe that all recommenders uh, show um, a tendency to recommend uh, articles that take a stance against the topic of refugees and migration uh, for all questions 
that we use to represent this topic. Um, but we need to keep in mind that uh, overall we have more articles in the data set that have a uh, sense against the topic than uh, in favor of it. Um, and again here the knowledge based recommender has the weakest negative bias and only shows little deviation from the overall um, average score in the data set. Um, here again, we only found uh, statistically significant differences only for the third question um, that we used to represent the topic, and this was whether uh, refugees should be working in Germany. Um, and lastly, uh, we also looked at the correlation between the stance bias of the recommenders and the users, um, and here uh, we did find that the word to vec and TFIDF-based recommenders do exacerbate the user's preferences uh, towards news against the topic of refugees and migrations, and we also uh, found that um, all the um, text-based recommenders are statistically significant, positively correlated with the existing uh, user stance bias. Uh, in contrast, we didn't find any significant correlation between the uh, ripple net based recommendations and the user stance bias, which again demonstrates that this knowledge-based approach might be less prone to amplifying user biases. So um, to conclude, um, what we did was uh, use sentiment and stance annotations to quantify um, the sentiment and stance bias of um, different recommender systems. Um, and our experiments show that purely uh, text-based recommender systems uh, expose amplification of user attitudes with respect to sentiment and stance. And uh, these both constitute cues for the creation of filter bubbles in the process of algorithmic news curation. And also um, the decrease of news diversity in terms of sentiment um, and viewpoints. Uh, we also found that the knowledge-based uh, algorithm is less prone to both types of biases, but it also is less powerful in terms of prediction accuracy when recommendations are computed only based on the entities that we extracted from the user's uh, reading history. So what we conclude is that on the one hand, the text-based recommenders are predisposed to identifying um, sentiment and sense cues in the text because their recommendations are based only on textual information. And on the other hand, uh, if we use knowledge bases as sources of side information and take into account only the entities um, identifying the text, regardless of the textual context in which they are mentioned, um, we can diminish such underlying biases and still capture deeper uh, knowledge level connections between the news. So um, in this context, we think that future research should look into how we can balance these two obviously conflicting goals. So on the one hand, we have a performance um, in terms of prediction accuracy. And on the other hand, we have um, diversity in terms of the sentiments and stances that are expressed in the recommended articles. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Andre, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, so any questions? Uh, yes, please, Harith. Hi. Uh, hi, Andrea. Thank you for the talk. Uh, very interesting topic. Um, my question is about the use of sentiment for such a corpus. Uh, and what does it actually signify? So obviously, uh, more sentiment analysis me measures uh, are not very sensitive to the, to the context or the topic of, uh, of the article. And so when it comes to a topic like migration, I would imagine um, that some of the articles would be, for example, talking about, I don't know, maybe the war in the country where the migrants have just left and the torture and the explosions and the deaths and so on. So it will uh, clearly become quite negative, uh, according to most uh, uh, sentiment analysis methods. So, so my question to you is, what, what do you think sentiment would, for such a corpus actually can tell us? Is it telling us about uh, that the article is negative towards the topic, or is it simply giving more detail about the background, perhaps, of, of, of these incidents? Yeah, thank you for your question. Yes, you, you are right. So overall, it, it can um, 
it can encode both things, but in our data set, we, um, so when we manually check some of the articles, we saw more articles that actually just talk about how um, refugees are seen in Germany and whether they should be accepted in Germany um, and so on, and less about, um, um, yeah, the, the conditions that they encounter back home when, when they leave the countries. But um, in general, such sentiments, yes, cannot be said to, to just um, encode the article's viewpoint on the matter, but can also um, capture more the background information. Uh, and if I have time, just wanted to clarify the stance detection. How, how did that work? How, could you just expand a little bit on that? Uh, Mavish, do you want to answer this? Or? Since you work, uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, so just to uh, clarify the question, actually, uh, do you want to know the technical side, or uh, do you want to know the similar kind of the thing as you ask for sentiment? So if you are uh, in line with what you asked before, so this is the reason why we actually tried to give some question and then. Uh, we try to uh, measure this uh, stances based on these questions so that we are a little bit more relevant to uh, what we want to uh, see there. Uh, as far as the technical side is concerned, so we actually use German word and fine tuned on the uh, training corpus. Uh, and then we uh, uh, did these uh, stance annotations on our uh, data. Yeah. I hope this answers your question. Thank you, uh, mm. Stefan. Yeah, maybe I can. Yeah, first of all, thanks for the presentation. Interesting uh, topic, uh, definitely. Um, maybe I can follow up with a slightly related question. Did you check uh, to what extent? Because my feeling is you somehow assumed there's a correlation between the sentiments and the stances. Um, did you check whether that's the case? Uh so do you mean if the sentiments and the stances are related? Exactly. If they're actually correlated, uh, because it, it sounded a bit like your assumption is that sentiments express somehow a viewpoint on the topic with which I would probably disagree to some extent. So, so we didn't check because we uh, started with the assumption that actually there is no correlation between sentiment and stances because you can have a stance, for example, uh, in favor of a topic, but expressed with negative sentiment. So this is exactly. why we didn't really combine the two in our analysis, and we just looked at them separately. Okay, yeah, because I think these are very, very two, two very different notions, right? So one is the emotional tone of an article, which can be um, entirely unrelated to the stance an article takes towards a, a specific topic. So maybe that's something you you may want to investigate separately again because it's a very different kind of bias as well. Again, um, maybe one more question. Um, so basically, this RippleNet baseline you used there was a sort of entity-based recommendation approach, right? So the way the way I interpreted your results is basically if you focus your recommendation on the entities, you basically get topic relevance without any emotionality or stance um, um, captured. And that sort of explains also why it's less, less prone to bias because you only focus or to um, stance related biases, right? Yes, exactly. But the problem is that by not including any textual information at all, we also saw that this affects the overall prediction accuracy. So. Um, a next future step for our work would be to also look at models that combine both text and entities. Exactly. Did you look already a bit? Because I mean, that's also a very big field of research already uh, combining traditional IR models with notions of serendipity and diversity and all of these, these kind of things. So I guess there's probably lots of stuff you could, could tap into. Yeah, so we already started looking into just uh, one model that combines uh, entities and and textual information, and now we're doing more work into um, seeing how this um, affects the sentiment and stance diversity. Okay, okay thank you. Welcome. So now a question from Alex Christiansen in the chat. Uh, how much did you dive into the data itself using, for example, corpus linguistic techniques or close reading? 
Um, so um, I'm not sure exactly what do you mean with the uh, corpus linguistic technique. So uh, for example, uh, so we perform this named entity recognition, we perform named entity uh, linking, so disambiguation of these entities. And we also try to manually check uh, subsets of the data that we, um, for which we extracted okay. entities and for which we disambiguated is. Um, yes, I guess Alex means uh, characteristics of the text uh, led to linguistics like the tone or I don't know, uh, the use of irony or such things or maybe. Uh, we we didn't go into that uh, direction so much, so this would be uh, a future uh, a step for future work. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Uh, the pipeline that you presented consists of many information extraction steps, like entity leaking, event extraction, stance detection. So I'm wondering if have you have you studied. Uh, how the performance of these automated steps uh, affect uh, uh, the recommendations or the bias and all this, the, the final output actually, uh, because these are uh, 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 steps that are prone to errors. And uh, so we did some analysis when we built the knowledge graph, so not on the final recommendation results themselves, since we only use this knowledge graph for one of the models, uh, but uh, we did look, for example, at the amount of errors we would have in the entity linking step, um, because that was one of the steps that would lead to the, the highest number of errors. Uh, since mm -hmm. not all entities could be disambiguated. We also have a lot of, for example, author names uh, that just don't have entries in, in Wikidata. Um, mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. Uh, and so another, and I also got confused a bit uh, about how in your experiment, how do you expect that the user will interact with the news articles, how they select the article, uh, did you have any guideline on this? Because I mean, I can select an article, an article because it's an uh, you know, interest for me, or because I was surprised by the title, or. Yes. Um, yeah. So this was an online user study. So firstly, the the users would receive a questionnaire about their political views and so on, um, and then they would be offered this preview of six articles, and then they would just be asked to click. Or whatever. So based on this title and abstract, what they would like to read, what they would find interesting or uh -huh. um, yeah. no. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think we have five more minutes for any other question. Or otherwise we can move to the next presentation. So any other question? So thank you again, Andre, for the presentation. And now we can move to the next uh, presentation. Uh, the title is Geotagging Twitch COVID-19, Enriching a COVID-19 Twitter Discourse Knowledge Base with Geographic Information. I think it, this is a resource paper. And uh, I think I saw Dimitar. Yeah, hi, Dimitar. So the floor is yes, yours. I'm here. Hi, everybody. Okay, Great, yeah. we now see the slides. You can see the slides, yeah? Can you see the slides? Yes. Great. Yes, hello everybody. My name is Dimitri Dimitrov and today I'm going to talk about geotagging tweets COF-19 or how we enriched uh, tweet COF-19 uh, COF uh, discourse base, knowledge base with geographic information. Uh, this is a joint work with Dennis, Dennis Seget and uh, Stefan Dietze. I would like to start with introducing the data set. Um, TweetCov19 is a public RDF corpus, corpus of anonymized uh, COVID-19 related tweets. It basically captures the uh, discourse uh, in the early period of the pandemic. Uh, it contains more than 8 million original tweets in, uh, in English. Uh, which are posted by more than 6 million users. Um, the data has been collected from the 1% streaming API from Twitter using keywords, uh, COVID-related keywords, uh, and 
the knowledge base, uh, what, what I really like about this knowledge base are those pre-computed features. We basically uh, extracted and linked entities and uh, performed sentiment analysis for all the tweets that we collected. The data set is available. Um, and we also have a really nice uh, web page where you can find uh, everything about this data set. Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, I um, we found these pre-computed features are really useful and facilitate a lot of research, but um, we kind of also experience that, experience that these are not enough. And most of the research questions that we encountered uh, during our interdisciplinary research are involved uh, with gel tagging. So we, we have different projects uh, uh, where we look where we looked at um, uh, at discourse data for policy uh, or uh, where we look at uh, solidarity attitudes during the pandemic. And uh, a lot of those uh, questions are uh, are asked by, by political and social sciences involved uh, gel tagging. And geotagging actually has uh, a tradition when we study the spread of disease and uh, also uh, for earthquake detection. Um, another application of geotagging is when we want to derive demographic characteristic of, of users. So by now, I hope I convinced you that uh, enriching a knowledge base with the geographic information is, a, is an important task. and. Um, it's a nice goals to have for, for, for this talk. Um, yeah, what's the, actually the status quo if you want if you want if we want to enrich a knowledge base with geographic information? Um, yeah, we know that uh, only one percent of tweets are geotagged. Uh, at the same time, there is a variety of pre-trained uh, geotagging models, which is actually a good thing. Um, but we also know that a lot of those models are actually using text and there are vocabulary shifts and training data issues uh, that may arise. And this led us actually to our research question, how do established pre-trained geotagging models perform when we compare them to, mo to models trained on fresh data in particular on COVID-19 discourse data? Um, yeah. The approach that we took in the experiments, yeah, first, in order to make this comparison, we want to, we need to extract actually geolocation data so that we can train uh, geotagging models. Uh, the models that we used, uh, we want to compare in this study are geo, deep geo and geolocation. I will tell you more about that later. Uh, and uh, the evaluation metric, uh, I will show you also a definition of the evaluation metric that we that we used and applied to compare the models. Uh, we performed two sets of experiments. The first one is focused on the vocabulary shifts and the training data freshness, where we basically measured uh, the model accuracy per error distance for the uh, pre-trained and for the freshly for the for the models trained on fresh data. And then we also uh, did another sub-experiment uh, where we look at uh, the tweet length and how this influences actually the predictions. The second set of experiments uh, goes into a bit different direction. We looked at uh, how, how these models actually, what is the gel coverage of these models? And we look at the unique cities and countries that they identify and the number of tweets, how basically the tweets are then distributed among countries. Um, yeah, how do we extract the data set? Uh, yeah, first we, we, could, we were able to identify more than 220, a bit more than 220 tweets from uh, uh, almost 150 unique users in the tweets COVID-19. And um, yeah, as I mentioned, we collected this, this tweets from the streaming API. Uh, um, so we have basically the, the JSON files, which contain different metadata fields and two, data two metadata fields are here important. The first one is this geo data field in the JSON uh, that uh, basically contains a, contains a but point. Um, the second uh, field that we uh, extracted data from is the place field. We were able to extract a bit more than 200 
uh, thousand tweets from from that field. Uh, the data set is also available at, at Zenodo. You can download it and uh, use it in your own research if you want. Um, and what is exactly in this data set? Yeah, we had we have for each tweet ID we have longitude, latitude, coordinates. We have uh, country, state, city, uh, county, and city information. Uh, now to the algorithms that we uh, would like to compare. Uh, we 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 focused on deep geo and geo location. Um, deep geo predicts the tweet location where this tweet was actually posted from and uses text for that. Um, it also accepts some of the metadata in the, in the JSON that you uh, get from the Twitter API. Uh, it, it comes with uh, 12 pre trained models, and uh, we also decided to use a version of deep geo that adds Gaussian noise to sharpen activation values of the, of the neural network. On the other side, geolocation uh, predicts the user home location. So not where the treat come from, but where the user is actually, uh, where's, what's the home location of the user. Um, there are three versions of this algorithm. The first one is uh, based purely on the tweet text. Then we have uh, geolocation LP, which uses a social network approach. Uh, and the network is built using user mention and it's undirected mention network. Uh, and the final third approach is um, basically a combination of the previous two uh, and um, has a small, a small addition that uh, celebrity modes are removed. This is uh, just to relax the assumption that uh, social proximity translates to geographic proximity. Um, the evaluation metric that we used to, uh, to compare those models, uh, we, we used uh, accuracy at D, which is basically the percentage uh, of prediction with an error distance smaller D. And the error distance is uh, the distance in kilometers between predicted and true coordinates. And uh, usually in literature, you will find uh, accuracy at 161, which is about 100 miles. That's commonly used in our experiments. However, we focused on, also on, on smaller distances. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, deep geo and geolocation actually do different types of location predictions. And to in order to make those, those two models comparable, uh, we, um, we um, assign the predicted user home location to all user tweets in the case of uh, geolocation. Um, now to the results. What we see here is a table, an overview of all models um, of the pre-trained and the models that we trained uh, using uh, fresh data extracted from TweetCov19. Um, and we see the, how they performed for different accuracy uh, distances. Mm. What we see here is that uh, DeepGL pre-trained uh, performs best. However, we were able to achieve uh, uh, a pretty good accuracy on, on DeepGL plus noise on the fresh, uh, with, with uh, freshly extracted data from TweetScope 19. So the finding here is that these pre-trained models actually achieve solid results uh, for accuracy at uh, 161 while the fresh ground truth can improve uh, accuracy at let's say city level. Um, on this slide, uh, we have uh, uh, the results for the influence of the tweet land. Uh, again, for all versions of the models, pre-trained and uh, trained on uh, freshly extracted data, uh, we, we measure the accuracy at uh, 161 for different tweet lands. And uh, here we see actually no surprises. Uh, the longer the longer the tweets they are, the, there's they're, the easier to kill tag they are basically. Um, now to the second set of experiments that we we performed. Uh, yeah, we we were interested in to see how uh, these um, these models. Um, what is the geo, geo coverage of those models? And we look into the unique cities and countries. 
um, and we see that uh, geolocation hybrid actually um, exhibits the highest number of unique cities and countries among the, the different models. On the other side, how are the tweets actually distributed among the countries? Uh, we see that geolocation LP uh, predominantly uh, assigns geolocation in the US and kind of misses cities in Germany and Italy, for example, compared to the other models. Um, yeah, to the summary, and this is actually the last slide. Um, yeah, we, we saw that these pre-trained models perform actually quite good. Um, so I think this is because even though language might change, uh, location names don't change that fast. So that's uh, one, one finding that I think it's interesting here. Uh, on the other hand, we saw that um, fresh ground truth can still be very helpful, especially on the city level. Uh, and we saw also that a deep geo outperforms geolocation in terms of accuracy uh, and that geolocation, especially hybrid, shows the, high, uh, the highest geo coverage. Um, yeah, I think the takeaway here is that when we try to enrich uh, knowledge bases with geo, ta geo tagging information, methods and training data biases must be stated and um, yeah, and one, one, probably one final note here um, about ethics. Uh, geotagging can, uh, can violate user privacy and uh, that's why this information should be treated very carefully. Yes, that's from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dimitar. Uh, so any questions? A quick one from me. I found interesting that uh, for Germany, for example, in Italy, if I'm not mistaken, the number of total uh, tweets was much smaller, uh, right? Uh, can, can you explain this? Uh, yeah. So I, yeah, I, I, I looked at the training data for the pre. The, these results are basically for the allocation. Uh, for the pre-trained version of geolocation. And the data used there is uh, predominantly uh, from, comes from the US. So this was, I think the explanation why this model focused that much on, on the US cities. Um, and almost all of the tweets were basically assigned to, to a city in, in US. So maybe this has to do also with that, the, for example, in Germany, they might care more about privacy, like compared to the United States or not. I don't know. Maybe there is a correlation with this. Yeah. Okay, interesting. At any case, <laughs> so, any question or comment? So, Alex, I think, uh, has a question on the chat. Alex, Alex Christiansen. So I read the comment. If I saw correctly, the models rely at least partially on self-documented locations. Uh, the location metadata in Twitter user profiles. Uh, we know for a fact that a lot of state-backed uh, disinformation existed in the COVID-19 Twitter discourses and that the, this pretend to be US-based. How do the models attempt to deal with this issue? So I guess the question is, uh, when basically bots create uh, content, is this? Yeah, you can also read it in the chat. Uh, so the comment is more about also this information that uh, uh, a lot of tweets uh, contain. Uh, uh, yeah, so yeah, there is actually this location metadata field that you see on the user profile, but this is something that you self-report, right? So this, you can you can write everything you want there. This is not the 
the metadata, this is not the geolocation data that those models use. Uh, this is actually a different field that in the, in the JSON file that you get when you uh, collect the data from, uh, from the API. So uh, yeah, that's, that's a different field basically. If, if I okay. understand the question correctly, yeah. And then a question by Deborah Day, uh, a general question of what do you think is more important, assigning location based on tweet location or by user location? I think this depends on the use case, definitely. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, for for a knowledge base is the same. We can uh, we can basically enrich and both and uh, add both types of predictions in the knowledge base um, in order to support and facilitate different research questions. Yeah, answering different research questions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? So, uh, uh, Alex, uh, Christian, yeah. I want to clarify. Yes, please. Feel free also to bring your mic if you want to tell the question. So in the meanwhile, any other question? So I want to ask, I'm not sure, I don't know how Peter handled this, but uh, when there are coordinates, uh, we also expect to have the location name or uh there is the location name and if there is no location name then we have the coordinates do you know how exactly this works later uh sorry i i missed the question so if you don't if you don't have so uh, I don't know, I'm not sure how Twitter handled this, I mean, the geolocation information. So we have uh, sometimes location name, right? And also coordinates. So mm -hmm. we have uh, coordinates when there is no location name or how is how does this work, do you know? Yeah, and I mean, very little, very small number of tweets have actually geolocation, geolocation. Uh, assigned by Twitter, right? Uh, so that's a, that's a very very small number. Um, users okay. can, can can add the location uh, they want to be. Uh, uh, they can specify whether their tweets can be should be geolocated, but they can also assign a location in that uh, is a bit different and actually used only to be to, to and is displayed only in the user profile but those are different uh, different metadata fields basically so alex wrote that a lot of this state backed system use things like vpns in addition to just easy metadata manipulation Mm -hmm. and uh, that he expects that data to mess with this kind of models. Mm -hmm. Have you considered yeah. this in any way? Yeah, no, we, we haven't considered that. Um, yeah, that's, that's again, I, I think an important question, but, uh, or, or in a nice, a really, a really nice comment uh, on, on limitations that we see here. Um, but yeah, we, we just get the data from, from Twitter and if the user is using a VPN, this is, I think, not reflected there. Yeah, but very interesting that's, question. That's an yeah. Yes. And I think it's also very difficult to address this here. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dimitar, for this very interesting presentation. So uh, now we close this session and uh, I think it's time for lunch now. And the next session starts at 2 p.m., right? If I'm not mistaken. Uh, and then we'll have the, our second keynote uh, by Hari Thalani and then uh, uh, two more papers. So thanks a lot and see you later. It's my pleasure to um, open the um, afternoon session of the Beyond Facts workshop. We are going to start with uh, the keynote by Harif Alani, and then we have uh, two paper presentations uh, um, scheduled for 15 minutes each, if I'm not, not mistaken. But as I said, the um, opening um, of the session will be done by Harif's keynote. So for those who don't know Harif, um, just to briefly say, Harif is the deputy director of uh, KMI in a uh, wonderful Milton Keynes at the Open University. He is um, also leading the um, social data science group, I think is the name. Harris' work is, um, I think, exactly in the sweet spot of the workshop as well, um, given that he's working at the intersection of social web related research and semantic technologies, which is really spot on for um, what the workshop is all about and for these reasons, um, I'm very much looking forward to Harris' talk. Um, the title you can see already on this slide. So Harris, floor is yours. Done. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Do, do you see the slides? Uh, okay. Perfect. Um, so, uh, so the social data science lab that I run, uh, we, we're, we're very interdisciplinary. So some of the work I will show uh, is very much on the social side of the problem, whereas some of the other work is more on the technical side and some of them is in between. Um, so this is kind of the, the nature of, of the work that we do. Um, and, and I will kind of bring in some of the work that we're doing across uh, three different projects, going from that's finished, Heroes and, and Simple, that's currently running. And uh, what I wanted to take away from, from this talk are these three messages. One is that you and me and everyone else you know shared some false claims at some point in time, probably still doing so, that most of us are not really aware of our vulnerability to this. Everyone I talk to think they're quite good in telling apart the false information from the good information. And I want to challenge that because I think unless people are uh, more aware of this vulnerability, no one's going to take any actions to to, to be a bit more careful, either to, uh, uh, to pay more attention to what we share or to use some tools to verify information. So I, we really need to go beyond the facts, which is the title of this workshop. Uh, most of the work that we do so far is, is mainly focused for, for example, computer scientists, mainly focused on trying to detect what's true and what isn't. Um, but more and more, we see that actually this is not enough to, to, to fix any of this problem. So I wanted to kind of touch on the issues beyond knowing what is true and what is it and what we really need to do next. So let me start by taking you a, a few hundred years back. I don't know how many of you have come across the, the vegetable lamb story. If you've read some of the books about misinformation, you, will, you would have come across this as one of, the, uh, one of the bizarre examples of stories that for whatever reason, everyone starts to believe in. And basically the point was that the claim was that there is this vegetable lamb, it's a plant. And when it grows, there's a little lamb that comes out of it and it has flesh and bone and blood. And according to some books, for example, for this one by Sir John Madville claims to have, uh, eaten it and it was wonderful. And you see all sorts of illustrations coming from all sorts of books from all sorts of countries, British, French, Italian, Slovenian, and others, they're all repeating the exact same story. Um, and, and when you read a few here, for example, the one uh, and, uh, uh, by the uh, Friar uh, Odorich, he's talking about, well, you know, I've heard it so many times, it has to be true. 
you know, uh, uh, this one by uh, uh, Baron saying, well, actually it was confirmed by so many people I know, they're all worthy of credence, so there must be a lot of truth in it. Um, and then this one was saying, well, actually it, it's not very unusual because we know there are some trees in Ireland that produces birds, so why not have a plant that produces lamb? And when you look into those books, they go back hundreds of years and, and, and they are full of such examples of plants that produce fish. And then when the, when the fruit is ripe, it falls into the water and turns into a fish. And, uh, and then it kind of, it makes you think, well, how could anyone believe in such bizarre stories? But of course, you know, we have to remember this, these were the years of complete new discoveries of, of, uh, of continents, of uh, new plants and new species all over the world. And many of those stories are actually quite similar. They, they all have very similar uh, basis to it, plants and animals, and I have no idea why it started. There are some uh, explanations that it was all about cotton because, you know, there is wool. They, they regarded cotton as wool and it's on a plant. And then this is how all of this world of, of myths have, have came about. But the question is, were people more gullible to, the, to misinformation at the time than we are now? Uh, and of course, that's not the case. These are the new misinformation of, of now, and they are no less bizarre um, as, as those if you take you know, the kind of the, the current context. So chemtrails, if you've not seen this before, just search it. Basically, all these trails of the jets are are there to control the, 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 the weather with chemicals. Um, well, the earth is flat, who would have known? It's a pandemic. Cancer is good for you, apparently. Uh, uh, and bananas can cure cancer and, you know, and so on and so forth. And the whole Ukraine war is a fake. All of these are equally bizarre, um, but, but, but they are there and, and we, it, it's really unclear why um why these are still there so so with the, with a sim similar one with the uh, uh, with the vegetable lamp they get repeated over and over and then they become uh, they start to take a life of their own if you like but not all of them are very bizarre uh, i'm guessing many of you have came across this one you know ostriches bury their heads in the sound to uh, to hide away from problems uh, and it, you know this is a metaphor that's used uh, all the time. Uh, of course, also just don't do that. Uh, I don't know. You know, I, I asked a few people recently and said, what? They actually don't do that? Well, no, they don't. They don't. No, no birds I know bury their heads in the sand. Um, and yet this was debunked, uh, you know, a long, long time ago. This book, I have it here, actually, this is from the 70s, you know, listed this as one of the common myths, even by then. That didn't make any sense, but it was so common that you know the, the, this was uh, unchallenged anymore. It was kind of left as it's one of those things that people believe in, and it was not uh, challenged anymore. And you can go back a little bit further, and you come across this book, um, which again it says, well, actually there, there was no evidence for it whatsoever. You know, and, and the bird is not like this vegetable lamp, which was meant to be in some very far away countries that no one can go and check very easily at the time. Um, but this one, it was a bird that was domesticated. And, you know, there were some uh, hunters and owners of the domesticated birds and the zoologists, they all said, this is rubbish. They don't do this. And yet everyone believed that they do. So it kind of got me to think, well, why, you know, how much do we know about which claims persist and, and which ones die out? Uh, and what are the other things that I was made to believe in or you were made to believe in that actually we never challenged, but it was kind of common knowledge, but it was not true. And, and where was the fact check for these things? Why didn't I come across those uh, before? And I think because, because of that, we have to think about exposure. So most of the work that we do and the fact checkers and, and, and all the detection methods that you see out there, they kind of focus on one claim and then try to detect that claim and then you know, determining whether this is true or not. And this is obviously really useful. 
but I think there is more to be said about how much we are exposed to, to misinformation in general, because I feel this has a much bigger impact that is really difficult to measure than our exposure to a single claim. Um, there were quite a few people I talked to who seem to have know of relative or themselves who haven't had the vaccine, for example. And when I ask them why, you don't really get a feeling that they had a really clear idea why they decided against it. They just say, well, you know, it's because of this and that. And, you know, they have been exposed to too much misinformation about it that they've decided that this is a bad thing. So we, we're not going to uh, we're not going to take it. So exposure to misinformation is really, uh, really important. Um, and recently, there is the inoculation theory, which goes back to the, to the 60s. It's kind of a medical concept, but it's been adopted now to look into how do you inoculate against misinformation? How do you boost your immunity system against misinformation? And one of the uh, trials, for example, has been to try and expose people to small claims that you can easily refute and that way you kind of build your immunity system, if you like. Um, and I think there are many of those claims that I've, I've showed you earlier that we haven't, you know, these are simple things to, to debunk, but we kind of left them uh, linger for a very long time that people believe in them. And perhaps that's a good place to, to look into it. But definitely exposure is something that we we just started to look into, and I hope that uh, that this is something we need to look at, kind of in a more holistic way. So, just to see how much you've been exposed to to this, and how much you know about what's true and what isn't. So let's let's put you to the test. So I'm going to show you four claims. You can see the numbers here. TV damage your eyes. You have to drink eight glasses of water a day. Carrots are good for your eyes, and that we only use 10% of our brain. So I'm going to give you 10 seconds, if you can go to the chat and just type in the number of the ones you think are incorrect. OK, so, so just have a go at that. Let me see if I can actually see the chat. OK, I can see the chat. So remember, type, type the number of the one you think is incorrect. Two answers, three answers. Come on, I'll give you a, a present to the one that gets it absolutely right. Five seconds more. Okay. Uh, very different answers. Most of you said four is incorrect, which is correct. Um, the correct answer is that there is only one of them that is correct, and that's carrots are good for your eyes. Although there was a myth associated with that, which is that they make you see in the dark. Well, they don't, but they have carotene, which is really good for vision. There's only one of them, right? So I hope you kind of see how difficult it is and how much misinformation we've been sharing. In fact, if you drink a lot of water, it could literally kill you. So just, just so you know. So don't do that. I drink a lot of coffee, that's okay. So I hope now you agree with me that we all fall for misinformation. Um, Daniel mentioned actually in the, in the previous talk something about values and, and we've done a little bit of work around that. Uh, where we looked at Schwartz human values and how this influence, how you share uh, information in general or misinformation. And what we have found, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but I have some references at the end. What we have found is that this is actually very influential. It inf influences how people share information, regardless of whether it's true or not. They decide based on the values they believe in. So, for example, if the story is racist, uh, if you are against that, you're not going to share it, regardless of whether it's true, which is kind of a logical thing. But the other way around is also true. If you, if you support a political party, you, you are very eager to share it regardless of whether it's true, you're not going to care much. So human values influence our decision. How often we do this uh, is important, and that varies from one person to another. 
Um, uh, why do we do this? Because we're biased, we're ignorant, we're scared of something, or we're just uh, curious about something, or we want to verify it. Um, how we share information is also different. So misinformation sometimes come to us and sometimes we actually go to it. So uh, we follow the wrong sources or we follow the wrong people. Um, our intention could be different. We want to mislead others perhaps, or because we just want to share, we want to be present. How we react to corrections is very important. And this is something we don't know enough about, but that also varies very much from one person to another. The type of information we share is different and also the topic. You find some people who share a lot of misinformation re related to, I don't know, religion or politics or environment and not so much for other things. So repeat a lie often enough and it becomes the truth from the Nazi propaganda minister. Unfortunately, this is very true. And you know we know it, uh, politicians do this all the time. But this leads us to uh, put an emphasis on why it is important to track misinformation. You see a lot of work on tracking misinformation and, 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 and it's only to try and understand the dynamics of it. But I feel there is another phase to it that we haven't really got to yet, which is trying to understand from the spread when things are going really bad, right? So misinformation will spread, it will always spread. But when does it reach the tipping point that beyond that it becomes the truth? And we haven't figured out that threshold yet. But what's more important in my opinion of uh, uh, studying how misinformation is spread is studying how corrective information is spread. Because for me, these are the two things that kind of try to balance each other somehow, or one of them needs to win over the other. Obviously we want the correct information to win, but without studying how both of them are, are evolving and spread, we don't, I feel we don't have the full picture. So that's why most of our work is trying to look into both of those together. And I'm not talking about misinformation as one and then true information as another. You know, there was work that looked into that. For example, they would take uh, information coming from Infowars, which they regard as all to be untrue, and then information coming from the BBC and regard all of that to be true. No, I, I, want, I want the claim and its counterclaim, you know, the, the two that goes together, because these are the two that are kind of battling each other, if you like. So when you look at this claim, for example, about Bill Gates and how uh, his doctor refused to vaccinate his children, which is not true, um, and you look at the graph of how many times that claim was shared on Twitter and how many times the fact check of that claim was shared, um, misinformation won hands on, okay? The, the, the fact check didn't even make it uh, beyond zero very much. Uh, of course, there are all sorts of caveats in this that I'm not going to get into, but these are the things, these are the signals that I feel we need to capture more often so that we know when things are really going badly and we need to do something about boosting the corrective uh, information or to have another campaign. Now, so what we had to do, we, we started collecting this information. So we needed the claims as well as the, 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 the fact checks, if you like. Um, and thanks to the, to the claim review project, which is just a standard of how you can, um, uh, you can annotate your, your, your fact check, basically that's what it is. So most of the fact checkers now using the standard embedded into, the, into their web pages of the fact check. And if you, go to the, if you go to the source of their HTMLs and look for claim review, you're likely to see it. And basically the claim review would say, well, what the claim is, uh, when, is when the fact check was published, uh, where the claim was found and, and where the fact check is and, and what, the, what the rating is. Basically that's more or less, this is what it is. So this is, for example, the annotation, you know, shortened for this claim on AFP. Now, if you are going to collect all of that information, be careful. You know, it's an absolute mess sometimes. These annotations are not always used in the right way. So you might end up with very uh, odd connections between the, the stories, which makes no sense. So we spend a lot of time actually finding ways to make this perfect, um, but it is quite, quite a useful resource. 
so so for example here what we do we go to to all the uh, the registered fact checkers the ones that are registered by the international fact checking network this is really important you have to have a source that verifies the fact checkers because they are fake fact checkers they are untrustworthy fact checkers and and you're going to see later that there is a lot of um, distrust in some of the fact checking industry because of those bad examples so so to to kind of um, uh, be on the safe side we only use the ones that are signatories at the international fact checking network and then we go through directly from the fact checkers what what are the claims that they have looked at so for example here there is a claim basically says that uh, uh, the reason we catch COVID is because of snake venom in the water. And there was this uh, video that was released and the guy who is making uh, a big buzz around this claim is also selling you the antidote. So it's very convenient. Um, so from this story and many others like it, we collect the, the fact check URL and the misinforming URL. So these, these are the pairs and, and then the verdict and the information around. So we ended up uh, with information collected from about 135 international fact checkers. Um, it's now well over 100, I'm not sure what's the latest number, probably around 120, 130,000 uh, pairs of fact checks. And basically what we want is to study these patterns a little bit more closely. So what we wanted to know is, and this is mainly for COVID, but we're actually now doing it for Ukraine. And, and just as a spoiler, we're finding very different patterns for the Ukraine-Russia uh, uh, war. But for COVID, what, what we wanted to know is, do COVID misinformation and fact checks spread very similarly? Do they show similar patterns? Of course, you would think not, but we wanted to study that. Um, do these patterns differ when the topic of the claim differs? or when the gender of the person sharing it is different is different and how about over time you know is that do we see uh, do we see a different behavior in the kind of the first phase as well as later on and um, and how does the diffusion of this misinformation gets a bit different when that topic is different so these are kind of some of the things that we wanted to talk about and i'm going to go through it very briefly because it's a very dense paper um, and so we collected that data for from December 2019 to January 2021. We had about 7,000 misinformed URLs. This is only COVID. And, um, and that gave us around 360,000 tweets that mentions one of, those, uh, one of those URLs. So either the misinforming URL or the fact check. So we start at the, at the top layer, like I mentioned, is the International Fact Checking Network. They, they started to release uh, annotated COVID-related claims, and they annotate them with the topics. So these are the one, two, I think there are seven topics. And then, of course, you also have the verdict for them. Once we have these pairs, we go and search for them. So we search for all the tweets that either mention the, um, the, the URL that's of the, of the false story, or of the fact check. There are very, very few that mentioned both of them. So they didn't really have much of an impact. And then we used, uh, uh, we used the, the work of Van Ketal that was actually published at this conference a couple of years ago, uh, where they had a model that identifies whether the account uh, uh, on Twitter is an organization, an individual, or male and female. We also tried age, but that didn't work. It wasn't accurate enough, so we dropped it. But these are kind of the elements that we took into account. And then we did this study where we, we compare the spread of misinformation and fact-checked across three different time periods. The first one is like just the th first three days and then the middle uh, week and then, and then 10 days on. So we did a bit of kind of initial analysis to find these, uh, these three different uh, time periods, if you like. And then we do some relation analysis to, to, to see what, whether there is any kind of influence on each other which is the kind of the, the holy grail is, am I doing well when I release these fact checks? How am I impacting the spread of misinformation? Am I, am I successful in curbing it or not? So what we have found is, as you can imagine, there was, there was about three to one amount of misinformation to fact checks. Uh, in fact, this is more than I thought. I thought there would be a fewer shares of fact checks, but it's about three to one. 
we saw that there was significant difference in, in how the two uh, spread at kind of the, the general level across the whole uh, time periods. But we, we saw more of a difference uh, in the initial and, and the late period. So the, in, the mid, in, in between, they seem to kind of stabilize, but then you see a bigger difference. And basically later on, fact checks tends to, to kind of go down in terms of uh, shareability, whereas claims seem to, the misinformation seem to continue to grow. But then when we, when you, when you take the type of the misinformation into account, you start to see a, a few more similarities and differences. Um, so we did see some differences in terms of how uh, claims that relate to these different topics tends to spread. Um, um, so when the when the time period increase, so when you go you know beyond, for example, a week or so, then that spreading behavior start to converge again. So you start to see a bit of a difference in the beginning, but then later on it sort of stabilizes, which is kind of logical again. However, there were the uh, misinformation that relates to the cause of the virus and the conspiracy theories around it, which, as you can imagine, they overlap because one of the biggest conspiracy theories is about that it being engineered. Those two seem to be a little bit different. Those two seem to be a bit more resistant to, to any kind of fact-checking, even though those were the ones that received a lot of fact-checking. But they behave slightly differently from all the other ones. Uh, and when we looked at gender, we didn't really see much of, a, much of a difference between how males and females. Of course, this is only male and female. Um, so it's just a model that we've used. It's a bit limited. But we didn't see any variation. And if you take into account the uh, percentage of these genders on as Twitter in the Twitter population, you know, when you take that into account, you don't see much of a difference uh, in there. But then when we look a little bit more, we see that uh, misinformation spread, you can't predict it. If you look at how, uh, certainly for the initial phase, when you look at how, for example, fact check is spreading, you can predict how misinformation is spreading and vice versa, which indicates that there is some sort of a connection there. There is some sort of a cause uh, and, and effect there. So misinformation impulse generates an initial fact-checking uptake, which means when you see a rise in the misinformation uh, use, and that's mainly for the first period, you see there's a rise in the fact-checks, which is sort of what you want to see. Um, but that the release, the release of fact-checks, at least for the very short time, it has an impact on misinformation reduction, but that impact seems to die out. And I think partly because whereas misinformation continues to be shared, the uh, uh, fact checks tend to kind of come out a little bit more, uh, uh, less frequently, that there is no mechanism that we're using to boost the fact checking or the spread of the fact check. So it's when it's a little bit old, it seems to have forgotten, whereas misinformation continues to have a, a new life for some reason. So, so the conclusion of this is that we, we really need to understand a little bit better how these things uh, uh, evolve and spread, because that's the only way for us to know how we need to intervene, which type of claim perhaps I need to worry a little bit more about. Um, can I see from these patterns that now is a good time to boost fact-checking about this or to, or to reshare that a little bit more often? Uh, and I don't feel there is enough of that being done by the platforms. The platforms are all about how do we remove all the, uh, all the misinformation, for example, from the platform. And I'm not seeing enough to boost the spread of these fact checks, which I think is really also important. So reasoning will never make a man correct an ill opinion, which by reasoning he never acquired. Uh, a very wise uh, uh, quote here, because we, we kind of think that if we release a fact check, it gives all the evidence for why this claim is false. And so, you know, no one should, you know, everyone who is reasonable should just go and read the fact check and then, and then things uh, will work out. But of course, we can see that this is not the case. Now let's give you another test. One, two, three, four, another four claims. Okay, I'm gonna give you a few more seconds to think about it. Marie Antoinette said, let them eat cake. Isaac Newton discovered gravity when an apple fell on his head. Horse legs tell you how the rider died. So you probably know this. So if the legs of the horse are in the air, then the, 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 uh, the rider died in battle. If it's on the ground, 
then not. Uh, and if it's one leg up, then got injured and then died. And the Greeks used the wooden horse to enter Troy. So who's brave enough to have a go at this one? I'm not recording your chat. So uh, just have a go at it. Which one is incorrect? Okay, this is what I'm looking for. Just type in the number of the one that you think is incorrect. Two answers so far. Four answers. Keep going. How many people do we have? We have 21. So let's get at least 10. Good. Coming up. Which one is incorrect? So Rafael, if you say none, that means what? They're all correct or they're incorrect? That, that means none of them are incorrect, which means they are all correct. Okay. All right. So they are all false, actually. So have a go, go, uh, go and search it after this talk. You will probably spend a few hours looking for the evidence and where those stories actually came from and how did people uh, came to the conclusion that someone said something. It's really fascinating how different connections were put together and then a conclusion was reached and actually historians uh, have evidence that actually these were all not exactly correct. Now for Isaac Newton, there was an apple, but it was used more as an, exa an example that didn't actually fall on his head, as far as I know. I've shared this one about the horse legs for my son. Uh, we, we were on a trip uh, very recently and I wanted to kind of show off how a fantastic story this was. And when I told him it wasn't true, he was really disappointed. So I've been sharing this information. The Apple thing was so appealing. Yeah, exactly. So this is the problem with, with correcting misinformation. People hate you for it because these are nice stories and you come and ruin it for them. So we can be blind to the obvious and we are also blind to our blindness. We don't know. If we don't know what misinformation we've been sharing or believing in it, how can we do anything about it? You know, you can't, you're not going to seek uh, uh, help for a problem if you don't think you have it, right? So this is exactly the same thing. Most people don't think they have a problem with information. So why should they seek any help? But I think this is, this is where we need to come in. So one of the things I've, I've been trying to, to work on is how can we measure the credibility of a person? So most of the work you see is about measuring credibility of a, con of a piece of content, an image uh, or, a, or a, you know, a piece of text uh, or a source like you know, the BBC, Infowars, uh, or you know, whether this is a bot or not, but not so much about whether this source, a person is a credible source of information. Um, there has been some work about this, whether you should trust the source in general, but not much about, well, let me look at everything this person has said, and then I will make a judgment based on that. So we built a tool. Uh, I don't know how much time I have. Much time. Okay, uh, I'm not going to demo this, but you can feel free to go and, and, and play with it yourself. Um, this is the, the link, it's misinfo.me. Basically here you can put in the, uh, uh, the, the account of any Twitter account. I normally ask people to start with themselves. Uh, you put it there and then it will go and collect the, the, the timeline of that account. And then it will do some assessment to see how often uh, this account has shared either from untrustworthy sources. So, you know, for example, like I mentioned Infowars uh, and others, that sort of source credibility, but also how many times they might have mentioned uh, uh, a URL that we know to be misinforming, that a fact check, a registered fact check has looked at and said this is false. So this kind of gives you an overview. And this is using the same data set I mentioned earlier of those pairs of, of, of URLs of the misinform misinformation and fact checks, but also it's using uh, um, a collection of source credibility scores that were kind of third party assessments of a source as in kind of a domain name. And what you get, for example, from there is a breakdown. So you could, you could see, for example, if you can uh, click on one of, the, uh, one of the tweets that the account uh, have shared. So that gives you some information about where this assessment has came from. So what I'm trying to, to do with these tools is to, is to stay a little bit away from making our own judgment about, you know, we're not using any AI here. This is a very stupid way of doing this. 
It's only using information that we know and, and, point, and connecting that with the information that we see on Twitter. We're not applying any kind of AI to make any, um, any clever uh, detection of it. Uh, so when someone is sharing that URL, you have shared that URL and that, uh, that other agency or fact checker or whatever, this is what they have said about this. And then you can make your own judgment. So this, the aim of this tool is to provide the credibility uh, uh, for each tweet that contain one of those links, and then to come up with an overall assessment for, for that account. Um, if you see any problems with it, obviously this is still work in progress, uh, then let me know. But I feel that tools like that are a good starting point for anyone to want to kind of just assess themselves. And I'm not talking about the conspiracy theories who, who don't care. It's about you and me and everyone else who don't want to share anything by mistake but we just don't have the right tools to help us to see whether, you know, am I, have I been sharing from a source that I shouldn't be uh, uh, affiliated with? All right, I hope you have appetite for another test. This is just to keep everyone awake, okay? So don't feel bad if you don't get it right. Um, one, two, three, four, okay? Melting Arctic ice raises sea level. Arctic ice, okay? There is a sea level. The moon has a permanent dark side. I've heard this one so many times. Lightning never strikes the same place twice. And the toilet flushes uh, in with a different spin between the North and South hemisphere. All right, um, have a go. I'm gonna read the chat while you have a go at this one. Be brave, don't be shy. Everyone gets it wrong. All right. Through, oh, uh, false ones. So, okay, so write the, the number of the ones that you think are incorrect. Uh, <laughs> L things, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, depending on your definition. Well, the definition is that the moon always has a side that's always dark and another side that is always shining. Okay. All right, so the answer is, they are all false. Okay, sorry to, uh, um, to ruin this for you. Arctic ice doesn't raise sea level. Surface ice does, not Arctic ice. The moon doesn't have a permanent side. It has a permanent dark side to us, but that side is not always permanent. Never go to the same place where, uh, where lightning strike. It will strike again, I can, I can assure you almost, okay? <laughs> So, uh, so again, you know, the, the, the whole point about these exercises is that you can go now and do some searches, is that fine? But these are the things that you could use to help inoculate. These are the simple things that we can, uh, we can counter that we could probably start with if we want to highlight to people where, uh, where, where misinformation is. But at the same time, I want, to, I want us all to, to understand that if, if we all share some faults that are not true, uh, uh, claims that are not true, um, then you know, we also need the, the same tools that we think everyone else needs. Uh, and everyone I talk about, they say, well, actually we don't install any kind of tools because we can tell. Um, but I hope we, this will show that we can't. So talking about tools, um, most projects have been developing all sorts of plugins, okay? Plugins that we think people like this guy should install, not us. It's, all, it's always the other person that needs it. But the problem is that how can we share, how can we reach out to the people who are not on the choir? Because we, know, we tend to preach to the choir. Everyone here, uh, everyone here now listening to me don't probably need a lot of preaching about this. Uh, you are very well aware of the problem. But what about everyone else who, who don't? Um, they don't think they need it. They don't know about these tools or they can't even install them or use them. So is there a way that we could push some of the fact checking, some of the corrective information out? And at the same time, we can learn a little bit more about how people react to this. So there has been a lot of work that's been done, mainly in psychology, where you know you kind of run some surveys, you do some focus groups, and some scenarios where you can say, and we've done similar thing where we say, okay, imagine you come across this claim, would you share it or not? And then we study that. This is how we studied the impact of human values. 
The problem with that is that it's one thing coming to you and say, would you share this claim? It's another thing where you've actually done so, shared it in, in the wild, right? So if I go to someone who has actually shared it on Twitter, it's not the same that if I say, well, imagine this. So that's the sort of thing. It, this is still important, but I think we really need now to go a little bit more beyond that and, and, and go to the wild and see what works and what doesn't. And so to, to experiment with this, we built a bot, uh, which we think it's a good bot, but it's, this is subjective. Uh, the point of it is that no one needs to install it. It will come to you. You don't need to come to it. Um, it targets everyone, so it's not just the ones that decided to, to interact with, uh, with the tool, um, and that the corrections are seen by anyone and everyone. Um, this was also mentioned a bit earlier today, but, but in, in many cases, in many papers in psychology, the entire focus on trying to correct someone is that person. So if I can change your opinion, then I've won. If I couldn't change your opinion, then I've lost. I would argue that for social media platforms, even if you don't change your opinion, if you, you have a large audience listening, that's, that's, a, uh, uh, that's a cohort that we also need to pay attention to. So if you share a claim on, let's say, Twitter, and I try to correct it, then you told, tell me to, to bugger off. Well, that's still fine because if your audience have looked at it and liked what I'm saying, there is, there is value there. So even if I don't change your opinion, I might have changed somebody else's opinion. And that's also important. So this is what the bot does. Uh, we created this bot, uses the exact same data set that I've talked about before, with all of those hundreds and thousands of pairs of URLs. And then, um, uh, so this is, takes it from the from the same database, and uh, and then it it searches for these these URLs as I mentioned earlier on Twitter, and then when it finds one for like, for example this one here, it found a tweet with that link to the misinformation that in our database. So what we do now is we send a message to this account as a reply to that uh, misinforming tweet and say. By the way, you may need to have a look at this, uh, this fact check or this, this, uh, this URL. And then we try to look into the, the reactions, how these people react or how the people around them react. Now, the question is, how do I post this? What, you know, what template should I use to push my message out? And, and of course, you know, the jury is still out on how to do this. Um, there isn't. There is a little bit of work around those, but I don't think there is a. There are any concrete conclusions. So we did a little, um, a little user-based experiment to see what people thought about different templates, and then we ended up with those seven. And those seven are meant to to have slightly different styles. So so this one is more. It's just about the fact. This one is a little bit more alerting. Um, you know, something went wrong. It's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit more uh, kind of emphasizing the issue there. Um, this one is about an identity that, hey, I'm a bot. This is what I think. This one is a little bit more suggestive, have a suggestive style. That one is a bit more empathetic that, you know, it's a really difficult problem. However, you may want to have a look at this. Um, alarming, it's harmful don't do it, and, and one that is friendly. And the point was that we wanted to kind of study how people react to those and whether they react differently to different styles. So, so, so far, the bot has only sent 745 messages. So, you know, there's still a lot of uh, work to be done and we want to scale it up, but it was not easy. Um, but this is a work in progress, let's say. But when you look at how people react to it, you find that the, the most common thing between uh, most of the recipients of such messages is that they attack the fact checker. The fact that we have said this is coming from a fact checker uh, is, uh, for them, is, is that, like, that's it, we've lost them. And so now we're thinking, well, actually, maybe we shouldn't use the word fact check because that seemed to automatically generate distrust. They all seem to think that fact checkers are all paid by the pharma industry. In fact, some of them, they went and started to collect evidence and, and posted to the bot to, to explain how 
This one said this, which indicates that they were, uh, they were working for Pfizer and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of distrust that, that, that's a big problem, I think, uh, that someone needs to, to look into it. Um, and they, some of them, they follow anti-fact checking sites and there are quite a few of them, apparently. They, they attack the fact checkers. They, they also obviously increase distrust in those. And then when, when the bot challenges them, they start referring to those sites with counter arguments about how those uh, particular sources that we are referring to are, are not to be believed. They distrust the government. And of course, if they distrust the government, then anything they do and say about the vaccine becomes untrue in their eyes. They seek other supporting articles. So even if they can't challenge you back about how you've corrected them, they will go and find something else that you can't, uh, uh, you can't fact check. And they say, oh, you know, but how about this? And if you have nothing to say about that, then they feel then uh, they won. Um, they refer to non-related claims. So, you know, uh, actually this one, this one is what I've just mentioned. Um, but the other ones they see, uh, they, they kind of find similar, similar ones that no one has fact-checked before. They work in a network. So you see a lot of support, uh, you know, even if you reply to one, even if that one completely ignores, ignores you, other people from their network, they will come and attack you back or they like the original message so that you kind of, uh, they sort of counter the correction that we are, uh, we are sending. They discredit the source. For example, if you, you know, they will point to some politician and say, oh, but look at what this person said, you know, in 2019 and, and it, it was fact-checked to be untrue. And so everything else this person says or their government has to not be true. Censorship, very common, freedom of speech. You can't do this, you shouldn't, you shouldn't correct me. Uh, I'm, I'm free to say whatever I want. And some of them are like, what, you're a bot? Get out of here, we don't trust you. And the most alarming one that I continue to see, and this is the one I posted there, which has nothing to do with the bot, is that when people see these sort of interventions, they feel, some of them, they feel that actually the fact that they have been approached either by Twitter directly because they block them or by a bot like ours, they feel that they must be onto something, that, that they are being chased because they found the truth somehow. And, and this is really alarming. So then when we looked at the, the, the templates that we have used and how they have, uh, what sort of reaction they might have caused, again, this is still early work, but, but what this one is showing is these are the use of this template and what it has led to, okay? So for example, if you look at the alarming one, it has only led to, uh, to the target that we have posted to the account replying to us. And by the way, we didn't receive any good replies, I think. Uh, almost all the replies were negative, okay? Like, you know, like the stuff that I've showed before. Um, the friendly one, it led to some replies, but also to the accounts blocking the, the bot, uh, but also to some people deleting their original tweet, the misinforming tweet, some of them liked it, and so on. And you, it was really interesting to see that some people, they, um, they deleted the, the tweet, the offending tweet, but at the same time, they blocked the bot, which I don't understand fully. Either they were embarrassed by it and they do want to be embarrassed in the future, or something else happened, I don't know. Uh, but it's this kind of very complex psychological dynamics that we, if we don't understand how this works, there's no point in trying to detect more tools. You know, We need to figure out how do I push this out in a way that people accept it. So this is work in progress. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this, but that just gives you an idea of really, you know, we need to figure out what, what are the templates. And we could see already some signals about some of them seem to be to produce more positive impact than others that we could probably investigate a bit more. And then when, when I looked at the, the misinformy tool that I've shared you, the link that gives you that overall credibility score of an account. So I wanted to know for all the ones that liked our posts, the bots posts, how does their overall credibility compare to the ones that replied, i.e. told this off, to the ones that actually retweeted our posts, so that's a good thing, or blocked the bot completely or deleted their original tweet. 
And what this uh, basic graph shows you is the average credibility score of all the ones that reacted in that way. Now, again, the numbers are not huge, so this is not significant uh, statistically, but so far we're kind of updating this on a regular basis. What we see is that the ones that have retweeted, they seem to have the lowest uh, score and lower score is good, okay? The closest you are to the positive, the better. So, so one is like you're absolutely all perfect. Uh, minus one is that you publish nothing but misinformation. And so the ones that reply that are really bad, uh, they told us off, they are the ones that are doing the worst. The ones that retweeted, they are the ones that are doing the, the best. And the ones that liked is kind of somewhere in between. So this is only our first attempt to try and understand how much can I tell from the timeline what this person is like and how they might react to my intervention and how I could perhaps tune my intervention to that sort of profile, which we haven't figured out yet. But for example, if someone is in this category, I might need to use a different approach or a different template or nothing at all. Maybe I should only focus on this category here. And that, that's the way we could maybe uh, reach more people more uh, positively. There are many challenges. I'm almost done. There are many challenges there with designing such a thing. Uh, for example, um, uh, when you send a reply, uh, there are, in most cases, that reply gets buried in, in, a, in a heap of some other messages that it's unlikely that the person who sent the original tweet would pay any attention to it. This is especially the case for influencers with hundreds of thousands of followers. They're not going to read anything that you send to them, but their audience might, and that's important. Uh, the, bots, the bot is currently replying all in English, but of course, because our database is of many different languages from the fact checkers, someone might be posting in Finnish and then I'm, I'm replying in English is not very useful. So again, these are simple research challenges for, for anyone who's interested in taking this forward. And there are many other restrictions that you have to have so that the bot continues to work. For example, that you need to be uh, careful not to spam Twitter with too many replies or not to spam the same user with too many times. Uh, how often should you reply per day or per for user and so on and so forth? And the time of the day, you know, we it was acting hours was was functioning 24 seven. But of course, it might reach someone in the middle of the night and by the next morning, no one will pay attention to it. So there's a lot of kind of more tuning. And like I mentioned earlier, because of the database, we're collecting these pairs. Every now and then we find something that's not making much sense. And then we go back to the fact checkers website and then we find that their annotations were wrong. And then we tell them, could you fix this? Because you're, you know, uh, so it's kind of a lot of going back and forth and not very easy thing. Right. So I hope you're still awake. And if not, I'm, I, I have one last test for you and then I will, I will let you leave you in peace. So the last four claims. OK, just just play this one and then you'll be free. Both charge are red colors. Dog mouths are cleaner than ours. I could use this. Goldfish have five second memory and then camel saw water in their up. This is the easiest one, I would hope. Okay, so just have a go on that one. And then and then I will I will end there. If you get it right, write down the number of the incorrect ones. If you do well, I will give you a prize. Uh, empirical evidence four is true. Um, okay. Percentage of posts did not reply to the question. Okay, four incorrect ones is the right answer. So well done. I can see that more of you got this one, right? So I've achieved my mission. You are all more informed than when we started this talk. So I will leave you with uh, with just a couple of things. I think you know for me these are these have to be the next uh, phase of, uh, of research. How do we do personalized interventions? Let's stop talking about, you know, this intervention worked and this one didn't. Did it work for you? Did, did it work for this sort of claim, this type of misinformation for this sort of profile? And that's really what we need to focus on uh, next. And I've shown some of the initial capabilities for how we could do this. Uh, misinformation explainability. How do we explain this? So I have this project with Rafael now where we're trying to look at how do we, how do we engage the user in the explanation? Um, and hopefully this is going to be for another talk and for another day. 
But how do we explain it uh, in a way, not necessarily to explain the model that I'm using, but it's just to, to make you pay attention to that explanation rather than what you've done so far, which is says, here's a fact check, which clearly does not work. Um, so how do I create factual information that is viral? Uh, we're looking into that right now. Don't forget the misinformation audience. It's not just the target. There is also an audience that we need to, to pay attention to. Um, exposure I've talked about, and we need to have better ways of measuring that and reducing this. Um, and boosting the facts, you know, uh, and, and this is a call for all the social media platforms to not only curb the share ability of misinformation, but also to boost the sharing of facts. We know that they have, they now um, not promote accounts that share a lot of kind of uh, misinformation about Ukraine, for example, but do they promote the account that share good information? And if you don't do this, then I don't think we will win. Um, and the last thing is that we currently regard misinformation as equal, but I, I hope we've shown that actually they aren't, they behave very differently. And we need to have some methods that can tell them apart, tell about uh, what are the, which one is more harmful than another, and then perhaps those could be looked at a bit more closely. So this is it. I'll leave you with my wonderful team who are behind uh, all of this work uh, and some of the papers that we've published that touches on uh, various points. Some of them I covered, some of them I didn't, but, uh, um, um, but uh, uh, this covers the work I wanted to, to cover today. So thank you for that and well done. Thank you for participating in those tests. I hope you've enjoyed them. Mm, thanks a lot, Harry, for that very engaging uh, talk, and, and uh, in particular for the quizzes. Uh, I guess everyone learned learned quite a bit uh, throughout the talk. Um, we are a bit short in time already, but it would be a pity not to have a discussion about the, the uh, talk, I guess. And I'm also dying to ask a few points, but um, I leave uh, the the chance um, for the audience first, and we already have the first hand up. It's from Alex. So you wanna wanna ask a question? Brief, if possible. I'll, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yep, perfect. Yep. I will I will make it brief. Um, so this this all focused on on textual elements and obviously you're you're focusing on urls do you think there's anything to be done because a lot of this is spread via much smaller pieces of information such as images or um my dog uh, uh and and other smaller smaller ways that sort of avoid these url um pickups uh no absolutely so uh Images and audio and video, they are obviously more challenging, okay? They're more challenging, not just for the work that we've done, but also for any, uh, any AI-based detection of claims, for example. Uh, there are now social media platforms that are totally audio-based. Now, find me a model that detects correct information from audio. Uh, that's a good topic for a, for a future PhD. So these are the, the, the problems. I mean, there is some work where we, you know, you, you can you can um, uh, you can do some character recognition to try and see what the image is, has mentioned. But I've seen it during the Brexit, for example, where some of the the, the kind of the you know the the Brexit parties using images. They don't use text because they know they can get away with it. They can say whatever they want. Uh, and our tools are way behind when it comes to detecting things like that. Now, of course, if you have text on the image, okay, we can have a go at it. But you have no text and only images. We're in trouble, okay? And and unfortunately, they know that, um, and the, and 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 more so. And, and so that if you go to Instagram, you will see lots of images. You don't see a lot of text. That's also part of what the platform is about. But this is at the moment. This is the limit of our good capabilities, but there is some work around that. Uh, but absolutely right. This is the future of, of this research. You have to move on beyond text. But we're not there yet. Thank you, Harif. Uh, so then we have Daniel and Fabia, and then I guess we already have to move on to the next presentation. So Daniel, Fabia, go ahead. Right. So two points. First, that claim about the toilet flushing, I have empirical evidence that it does go different directions, but that's for another time. 
the question is really have to come with uh, you to the toilets that you're using and then well we well we'll talk about it later <laughs> uh the question really is what percentage of posters that you that you corrected uh actually uh, bothered to reply at all I can tell you that out of 745 posts, uh, some of them were to the same user, but mostly were unique users. I think in total, don't quote me on this, I have to go back and check, but the number of replies were about 30 perhaps. So very small number so far. And, and these are the reasons, you know, some of the reasons I mentioned are challenging, uh, challenges are also are, are attributed to that. But it's not only the replies that we look at, like I mentioned, uh, if people block us, we also look at that because that's for us is also an action that they have taken or they right. so There are kind of a suite the, of things that we look at. The, the question was was reacted to, not, not just replied, so. Oh, reacted in general. Yeah, that's right. We look at the numbers, but it's not a, it's not a big number, I can tell you. Okay. So. Yeah, so out of all of those, there are, there are other reactions. For example, we had some people liked it and retweeting it that we did not target at all, but they were just in the audience. So we haven't count counted those yet, but uh, this is something we're doing. But in general, it's not a big percentage. And I think without uh, fine tuning the bot and when it does it and what language and so on, we're not gonna get uh, that percentage going any higher. Okay. Hi, Aris. Great talk. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, so you, you mentioned in your conclusion that um, th there was a need to go uh, beyond by uh, adapting to the profile of the user to may maybe even to the culture, because from one culture to another, it may not be the thing. I wonder if um, you also considered the argumentation strategy that is being used. So for instance, one, one way of separating them is people who use ethos versus logos versus, versus pathos, are they playing on the emotion? Are they playing, uh, playing on the status of the person or are they actually arguing on the fact? Uh, a lot of what you said seems to be uh, um, addressing the fact aspect, but, but unfortunately we know that one of the most if efficient strategy is the pathos one. Uh, so is there anything to do in terms of adapting the strategy? Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot to do. We haven't done that, right, is, is, is the short answer. Uh, um, but like I mentioned, so we have, I have a, I have a, a, a researcher, for example, as, as part of the simple project I mentioned, that's looking into the original messages and how, uh, what sort of emotions they carry or what sort of bias they carry or how readable it is, for example, how easy it is to read this and how easy it is to read that. Uh, um, not directly related to your question, but it was funny to see so far, we see that actually the, the true claims were easier to read than the false claims, at least from the data space, which is not what the general consensus is. So I'm not sure whether this is something new that's happening now, uh, but definitely emotions is a big thing. And I, I don't know how to push back on that. Um, I, I have a, a student who is looking into the use of propaganda, for example. Um, and uh, and again, you see uh, you see some kind of connections there where some propaganda and emotions kind of go together because they use some propagandist words to push to push the content. Um, so these are things we've just started to look into. Uh, we don't have we don't have it all embedded into this yet. Uh, but certainly, uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know the, the the impact of human values is really more about these elements. And how do we bring this to the, to the intervention and to the connection is really challenging. But I think at least if we have a cleverer way of selecting which one I need to target and which one I should probably let go is, is our best option. Because, you know, you know, talk religion and then you're, you're not going to go anywhere, right? So there are, there are things that we should probably try to target a little bit more efficiently or cleverly so that we achieve better results rather than we try to correct everything and then all we get is a pushback. Okay. Um, yeah. So thanks a lot, Harris, again. Um, for those who may still want to ask questions or discuss with Harris, um, if Harris is still around, uh, I guess we can also still use a bit of the time um, after 
in the um, 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 industry keynote uh, during the closing, I guess there should still be a bit of time to discuss. So um, thanks a lot, Arif. And I think with that, we have to move on to the next speaker. Now, I hope very much I managed to pronounce the name correctly. So I try to I try my best. Uh, Debraj D, right? Yeah, Is that correct? It's perfect. Debraj D? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so welcome. Um, so Debraj is uh, going to introduce a paper which uh, looks into Twitter reaction trends and uh, um, between different disinformation communities. It's a short paper and um, I'm looking forward to the talk. Okay. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, let me share the screen. Uh, can you all see my uh, slide and? Yep, it looks good. Uh, let me, and the laser pointer also, right? Yep, perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll try to keep that talk in like uh, presentation in like 10 minutes and try to keep like five minutes for discussion. And so, hi, uh, I'm Debraj De, and uh, we are from Geospatial Science and Human Security Division at Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, US. And this paper is about a novel methodology to compare Twitter reaction trends uh, when they are reacting to campaign events. I'll explain what are campaign events. And we have looked at campaign events at three geospatial granularities. And I'll also explain that one. So this is like the quick outline of the uh, presentation. We'll start with the background and problem description, followed by our proposed algorithm and through a working example, and then a small validation case study, and then conclusion. And let me minimize the following. Okay, uh, you can see my full screen, like right? not the the video is not uh, overlapping, right? Yeah, it's the full screen. It's all good. Full screen. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, let, okay, one second. Okay. Um, uh, this background, uh, we are looking at the COVID-related pandemic disinformation, and we really want to know how the Twitter chatters in disinform com disinformation communities get triggered. And we have uh, proposed an algorithm which will compare any two Twitter disinformation communities and uh, their reaction, compare their reaction trends, and if they their reaction trends align with some of the campaign events. And these campaign events can be like at different geospatial granularity uh, that I'll explain. But uh, on the right hand side from the figure, uh, if you see like on the bottom, there is uh, through the time there are like campaign events happening. So campaign events is uh, both, we have included data from both like uh, corrective information, like non-pharmaceutical intervention by health departments and public health messaging, and also like disinformation events in, in online, as well as maybe some like physical rallies that may be happening. So the timeline of that. And when this happens, the disinformation communities get triggered by it. And they have this Twitter chatter timeline. And so our focus is to actually design an algorithm to see if any two Twitter disinformation communities are reactive to certain campaign events or maybe not. So for this, uh, we have done data collection. On one side, uh, the type of disinformation community is TA, which are, we have looked at like larger organization level Twitter accounts and which are more disinformation influencing accounts. On the other side of the comparison, we have looked into TB. Uh, there are like multiple, uh, so, these are more individual or smaller organization Twitter accounts. And they are, instead of influencing, they are more active at spreading uh, further those disinformation. And so we want to see how they react to uh, the campaigns. And the campaigns we have uh, taken an example of at county level, state level, and national level. And what we mean is that uh, 
in the campaign events, we have, uh, for example, we have collected example data set with uh, local like, health uh, authority uh, that they have helped collecting the data is uh, example of Knox County in Tennessee. And for the state, it's the state of Tennessee and the country is at the level of US. And so um, uh, we have collected both the NPI public health messaging timeline and also uh, the disinformation events, uh, may, like uh, significant events, their timeline. And that happening at the Knox County level, then at the state level, and then at the national level. And here, left hand side bottom, there are uh, some of the like timelines of each type of the campaigns that happened. So we have collected data from uh, January 2020 to April, end of April 2021. And later we collected actually more data, but this is this analysis is based on this almost one and a half year of data. And on the right hand side, uh, this uh, shows uh, example of the, some of the events and yellow colored are the ones uh, some like who provided us the data, they thought these are more significant. And now, so now we have the Twitter data from the identified uh, Twitter disinformation communities and we have the campaign timelines. Next three slides uh, I'll present on the left-hand side, the algorithm step, which you can ignore and which is like uh, detailed more in the paper, but on the right-hand side is some brief explanation of a working example. So our goal is to compute the relationship score between two two disinformation accounts in Twitter, TA and TB, and with respect to a campaign. So for example, a state level campaign. So for example, we collected a uh, total 10,000 tweets from in this uh, one almost one and a half year time span from TA and 1,400 tweets from TB. This is like one example of a TB. And there were like three such accounts actually we took as an example. And for state level timeline, there were like 21 dates where significant events happened. And on the bottom, this just shows some of the example tweets uh, that were uh, uh, collected. So what we do next is uh, on the right hand side timeline, uh, just making sure you can see the full slide, right? Uh, the video is not hiding it. Yeah, it's good. It's all good. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Uh, so what we do is like from this collected data, we apply a function F we call like feature mapping based on the campaign of interest. So it's, uh, we have tried more uh, complex ones, but like we saw like this simpler one still like works. But we, what the function if does is that if we have a data DTA, so this data contains all the posts by that account and also all the posts by the users who replied or reacted to them. So all the discussion, all the replies in the discussions. So it captures like all the users that got into the conversation. And so what we do is like uh, in the right-hand side bottom figure, we create the, uh, the function if creates a matrix, which captures like all the users who were involved in the discussion. And for each of those dates in the campaign timeline, if within the Delta days, how many tweets did they, tweets or replies did they post? And so this is an example data. And Delta we have used, we wanted to use like a less than half a week to catch like the instant reaction. So we used Delta equals to three days in this calculation of if. However, this can be further optimized. So um, after applying the function if we get, uh, for example, from TA, we get like about 4,000 users and 21 dates timeline, this matrix. And for MTB, we get 806 users and 21 dates in the matrix. And now what we do is simply, simply apply principal component analysis to capture 95% of the variability in the data. And um, on the right-hand side bottom, this shows example of the principal components. And we take only the PC one, which is the first principal component. 
So for both of these, uh, because there are like 21 dates in the timeline, uh, the PC1 for both of the uh, cases here for MTA and MTB are linked are of length 21. And now uh, they are of same length and by like how many dates are in the campaign timeline, uh, the campaign we are interested in. So, and then in the final step in the bottom of this slide, we simply calculate the Pearson's correlation coefficient. So like zero will mean like their reaction trends are not matching, not correlated with that campaign of interest. Plus one means if they are really uh, strongly correlated, minus one means their reactions are uh, negatively correlated uh, with the campaign of interest. So with this algorithm, uh, this is like a validation uh, result. Uh, we chose uh, TA, uh, which is the handle. We did some analysis. We have detailed in the paper, like we did not randomly choose that account, but with some disinformation classification, we and data collection, we got that. So example of TA is uh, at the Tennessee stands. These are more organization level disinformation account. And for- May I, may I very, very quickly interrupt just to highlight that you're already yeah. roughly 10 minutes into the, the talk. So if we want 10 to- minutes. Okay, yeah. perfect. So, yeah. I'll then quickly move through the, yeah, next to these slides. Perfect. Okay. Uh, yeah, so TA is, um, looks at, it reacts to at the level of the state, what's happening at the state of Tennessee, that one. And TB1, TB2, TB3 are actually three accounts who which uh, belong to like Eastern Tennessee region. And so an expectation will be that they both react uh, in a correlated way to a state level messaging. And that's what state level campaigns, that's what we found actually. So in this plot, if we see the relationship score from our algorithm, uh, the black uh, bar, the column is for the state level uh, campaigns and blue and the cyan color, these are for the county and country level. So in all the three cases for the state level, there was like highest comparatively like highest score, relationship score. So that uh, does an initial validation is like our algorithm is able to indicate uh, that which um, campaign they are reacting to in a correlated way. And so, yeah, next two slides, maybe these are detailed more into the paper. I can skip. May I just Please. chip in? May I just chip, chip in briefly? So if you want to leave time, time for questions, we really need to come to it and otherwise we really have to skip the questions. Oh, okay, yeah. I think this uh, quickly ends my presentation. This was just showing the uh, PC1 loading for the comparison in here. And so, yeah, um, this is the conclusion. Mm, and yeah, I'm open to actually, if there is some time, I'm open to question and answer. Otherwise I can take questions afterwards. Okay, thank you very much, Debrush, uh, for the interesting talk. Um, let's maybe um, give time for, for one, one brief, brief question. Um, do we have questions in the audience? Sorry, I cannot see the chat. Oh, let me. Can you let me know if there is a question in the chat? Mm, I think Alex is just clapping, right? There was a clap. Or... I, I did, yeah. I, I'll, I'll okay. just ask a quick question if that's okay, Seven. Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I was wondering, because you seem to be focused on the way that this chatter starts and at, at the points of, of beginning. And I'm wondering if you've considered the way that these networks of disinformation tend to exist within a very large space of, of web. Um, so have you considered whether there's communities that are coming from the outside of Twitter and then influencing the beginning of the chatter on Twitter? Okay, yeah, that uh, we have not done that, but that will be actually really interesting and like useful is like in the bigger network in the Twitter and also if we can collect the data from like other actors, which kind of influence, especially as you said, like initial triggers of that. So that will be like valuable research. Okay, um, thanks a lot. So as I mentioned before, um, there may be a bit of time for more, more questions at the end of the uh, workshop. 
So uh, thanks again, Debrush. And um, I okay, think we, we can move on to the last presentation of the session, which comes from uh, front of a focus. So Ann, I guess you're, you're presenting? Yeah, I'm presenting. Okay, okay perfect. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yep, looks good. Okay, hi everyone. So my name is Agneton. So I'm from Tilbury. So today I present the paper. Uh, the, it is the uh, initial light of a project uh, between Tilbury and from Hobo Focus. So we have uh, yeah, we start by uh, Dr. Bang from Tilbury, and we have Dr. Uh, Sonia and Professor Manfred and Carlo uh, from uh, from Hobo Focus. So the motivation of our work is uh, uh, it is very essential for researchers to keep track of the of their current resource, uh, uh, their current uh, research in the field. For example, publications, data like set, or code. And many system uh, allows the uh, researcher to retrieve some information, but uh, they are they but the researcher team have to manually browse from various uh, resources. So because the information is partially provided by different systems and they are not only linked. Uh, for example, you find the, in archive, you can find the uh, no uh, bricks uh, paper, but uh, they are often within the conference. Uh, you can find the paper and conference with uh, BPRP, but uh, you can find the source code. So we had a paper with code when uh, they uh, link between the paper and uh, uh, the source code in, in, in GitHub. But however, they didn't link to the uh, And also many research also are discussed online on social uh, network, uh, mostly on, on Twitter. And the information is on also the information in also available and but they update very fast. So there are also some uh, solution for that, for example, for analysts or uh, artifacts, but uh, the information is open to general and user cannot add new resource and uh, the information they are updated very slowly and, and they, they often are not free available, not open. And uh, also they are more powerful or structured for interface exit for querying the data. So that why we come up with uh, the live open knowledge graph that allows users to interlink and enrich new data source on the plan. And we can update the data uh, uh, continuously and user can supply and query on the data they are interacted in. And the system can notify when the new data uh, or new data come available. So our uh, our our live um, as a live-site knowledge graph, so the concept is we uh, uh, integrate the live live stream and uh, now and, and static knowledge graph. For example, here in example, we can integrate the uh, data from Twitter uh, post and uh, some knowledge graphs uh, from archive or uh, or EPLP. And here we can link the book, uh, maybe the author and publication that we found, we, we, what we filter from the, 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 the social network. And uh, we do link data for, uh, for uh, we do link data for uh, principle for, uh, uh, for the integration. And uh, for example, we do the, um, we can use the new right for for naming thing, and then we use the established uh, vocabulary for for linking to the URIs. Uh, the, uh, here is our example of uh, our data schema, and um, you can see here that I, when uh, we can use the schema of that all to say when when Twitter started mention a paper or mention author, and you see the the, the rest uh, line here is how we link from the tweet. Uh, to the static knowledge graph we have for primary archive or uh, BPRP. 
And uh, the, the generation of the market map is star when the user supply a query to system. So the query will uh, uh, filter the, the keyword and uh, the, for, the, for the data they interact in and they send to the hard data. The hard data will crawl the data from internet source. Uh, the data, the retrieved data will be annotated uh, by uh, doing RDF data model, and we can use some uh, new template, for example, r 2 ml to transfer the data into RDF, and we put it into uh, our storage. And to process uh, the uh, static data and machine data uh, together, so we use the SQL with a quite a famous uh, engine for processing um, uh, link data stream. And SQL is, is uh, similar to, to Sparkle, and we can do a, a, a property pattern to uh, query the other data. And in, in SQL, we have a graph keyword to pull the graph query button to the number graph we want. Or we can use the stream keyword to address the continuous graph query button. And SQL also provides uh, other keyword uh, for define the temp uh, temporal relation, for example, window on or after. And um, here an example uh, of, a, of a SQL query, so uh, how we can query the top uh, top five uh, paper is got uh, in Twitter, uh, published in, in the Nordic Club uh, event, and, and uh, it is got in, in Twitter. So you can see here the first four lines to with stream keyboard to pull this um, uh, query uh, with a property button to, to listen to the Twitter. And this, uh, uh, and this uh, graph, um, uh, graph keyword will happen to integrate the data from, to, to select the data from the BAP or the conference, the metadata of the, the, of the, of from the conference case sheet. And also we have the window here now for, to, to tell us that we, um, uh, we, we only uh, find the, the tweet that, uh, in, in 48 hours after, after the event, the event time. And so uh, in this project, we, we uh, aim to provide a, a comprehensive and global integration uh, for the research output information and we will support the inter uh, integrated field over the distributed research output and also the communication of, uh, of the research output. And uh, we allow users to state their interest and also they can get the notification as soon as their interest information uh, available in the, in the network. So thank you, and I'm um, taking questions. Okay, thank you very much, An, um, for the interesting talk. Um, maybe I start with a very quick question. Um, much of what you're, what you've been presenting is very related to many of the things which are happening already at some some other labs, like the um, Open Research Knowledge Graph Initiative from the TIB. Um, led by Cern, our the um, NFDI for data science, where uh, Sonia and myself are involved, the work in thesis, which is all dealing with different parts and components of exactly the kind of um, yeah, vision you have, have been presenting. Did you look a bit more into those, those kind of efforts? Mm. Or how would you position what you've been presenting in that, in that context? So uh, in the context that we uh, we see that uh, we want to bring up uh, uh, I mean the new problem about the scalability and when the data come a lot um, I mean a lot of data and even now um, people cannot uh, process it quick so even we have uh, many people uh, other people store but uh, it uh, the scalability of these people store it. Uh, Still not, uh, we, we think that it's not enough to to build such uh, or to build to have the data for such system. So our system we want to bring up uh, um, integrate also with the um, stream processing that we can have the hardware that we can have a SQL for stream for filter the, the data and we only get the data uh, um, uh, the data that we are interested in. 
and it can project uh, project quicker. And we want to bring up the the problem of uh, so um, so scal scalability uh, scale uh, in the other stories, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have more more questions? If, yeah, so if not, we are actually right on time. We're, we're right on time for the uh, coffee break. Um, so um, let's let's thank the speakers of the session again. And um, we are reconvening at uh, 3.45 um, French slash German time. And um, then we are going to have Jose's keynote, to which I also look very much forward to. And uh, yeah, I wish everyone a good, good coffee break. I hope you get some coffee wherever you are. Welcome back, everyone, to the to the final session of uh, today's workshop. Uh, before giving the floor to Jose, our last keynote speaker. Um, I would just like to announce the nominees for uh, our best paper award. Um, so those two papers have attracted our attention as nominees for the best paper awards, sorry, awards. And um, they have been nominated based on uh, um, votes from the program committee members, as well as based on the scores that they have received uh, in the evaluation and reviewing process. So we will know who the winner is after who says talk and the discussion that we'll have right afterwards. Uh, so yeah, it's my pleasure to uh, to welcome uh, Jose uh, uh, today. Um, he also needs very little introduction in our community. Uh, so Jose is currently uh, the director of uh, language technology research at Expert AI, uh, Spanish-based, I think, if I'm not wrong. Uh, um, company, right? Oh, I'm so, Italian, but yeah. <laughs> oh, Italian, right, okay. <laughs> so uh, Jose is working uh, uh, in the area of artificial intelligence and particularly on the intersection of uh, structured knowledge and neural models. And he will talk about accurate and explainable misinformation detection. Uh, too good to be true, a teasing question. So Jose, what is yours? Thank you very much, Constantin. A pleasure to be here. Um, let me share my screen. I'm going to share the whole screen because I will be moving from presentation to uh, to demos. <clears throat> okay. Um, here, here we are. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, good. Okay, let's start a little bit with um, with the background for this. Um, I don't think we, I need to talk a lot about what misinformation is and what uh, yeah, it, is, um, it is about, but I would like to emphasize a few things related to misinformation. Like, uh, for example, that misinformation is a, is a cognitive problem. Uh, it has always been a cognitive problem. You can only see part of the world and therefore you need the, the help of others. It can be friends, it can be the newspapers, it can be your neighbors. To, to inform you. The thing is that with, uh, uh, <clears throat> with social media, with the web in general, uh, we are now in the era of misinformation 2.0. It uh, has been amplified to a huge scale uh, that make it, makes it even harder to create. Um, uh, of course, like, like we say here, it is some kind of gaslight, uh, gaslight in that scale. It's also asymmetric because it's easy to produce and hard to debunk as uh, we saw in the previous talks. And uh, it can have a very big impact in society, in economy, in democracy. Um, being misinformed can lead to, to taking different kind of actions or not taking action at all. So who is who in uh, misinformation? Who is dealing with it and how? We have fact checkers, we have web giants, we have researchers. I would also add here that we have policymakers and public administrations trying to fight against the uh, I guess misinformation in order to preserve uh, the democratic values. Uh, but for example, in the case of fact checkers, we have uh, these other people that uh, are mainly involved in collecting, investigating claims and publishing their reviews. Um, there are problems related with this. For example, 
how does this scale or what funding do they have? It's, a, it's a, in the end, it's a small community that have to do a lot of work. Until now, much of this work has been uh, uh, manual. And um, yeah, I mean, it's to, it's to scale and it's to cover a, a huge ground. And also we have the question about uh, who checks the, the, the checkers, no? And, uh, which is something used uh, by, by, by the spreaders of misinformation as a way to raise doubts about, uh, about fact checking uh, in general. In terms of web giants, uh, we have uh, this kind of <clears throat> debate, um, dilemma uh, between uh, um, our conflict of interest, between how to engage with the users of the platforms and then uh, how to ensure integrity. No, this is a strong, hard dilemma that most of the platforms are, are caught on. Um, and then we have researchers working on improving the state of the art in order to, to solve this, this problem. Also with, uh, with our own type of uh, um, issues here, like the lack of annotated data sets or how to make all these science reproducible. Uh, it seems like uh, there is kind of an ecosystem, that there's some collaboration going on, and there is. I mean, there are initiatives like Plan Review that have to do with uh, this kind of collaboration between fact checkers, for example, and, uh, and uh, internet giants. But in reality, this collaboration is a little bit limited. Uh, I don't know if you have seen this, um, this letter from uh, the world's main fact checking agencies uh, to, to YouTube, which is one of these uh, uh, giant uh, uh, internet uh, players uh, with four demands. And these four demands were related to the need for meaningful transparency because what usually happens here is that, uh, as Harriet mentioned, there is um, a 10 of the platforms to remove, to delete content instead of providing context and uh, offering debunks, which uh, makes uh, uh, the, the analysis of all this information a little bit more difficult and uh, also from an educational and training purpose for the whole population. And then they also propose to act against uh, repeated offenders uh, to support other languages different from English and, uh, and so on and so forth. So yeah, uh, there's collaboration, but uh, uh, not, so, not ideal. Um, I think of a special interest for this uh, community is uh, why is structural knowledge important here? Um, automated misinformation detection is, is an extremely hard problem. Uh, we've seen that it involves many different types of partner of uh, sorry stakeholders, and uh, it covers a huge information space, which is also multimodal, and uh, it requires many many different types of uh, uh, techniques or disciplines uh, coming from uh, from computer science and from social sciences as well, including information retrieval, large scale data processing. Um, it's so complex that uh, one may say or may argue at some point that you need actual general intelligence or general artificial intelligence to, to solve this problem if you want to do it automatically. Um, also, another thing that we need to consider here and um, is that um, um, determining whether something or not is misinforming is not just a problem of, uh, related to accuracy. Um, it's not just uh, saying so if something is true or false. Uh, it's also about uh, providing this context that we were talking about earlier, providing this evidence that is required in order to um, justify uh, the, the verification of the, of the claims themselves. So, like I said, evidence is, is required, and much of this evidence is provided by, by fact checker. This is an act that needs to be multilateral, interoperable, interoperable and explainable, and therefore, it's convenient to use some kind of knowledge representation which is, is explicit and can be shared, is subject to standards and uh, open to uh, everybody who, who wants to use it. And this is a context where we propose this, uh, this framework, uh, which uh, we call link, uh, link credibility reviews uh, a couple of years ago. I'm gonna describe a little bit what we did here and then uh, um, I will show what are the limitations of, of this approach at where, where we are at the moment? From a conceptual point of view, um, a credibility review is something uh, that comprises uh, four main elements. Uh, first of all, the data item and the review, which can be a tweet, can be a website, news, article, whatever. Uh, it's also the, the rating that we provide or 
um, the, the, the rate India uh, of these uh, in terms of the review that this uh, data item has. I mean, which are uh, with, in our framework, we, uh, we scale from between minus one to, to one. It does, it's also the confidence uh, with which we are making this uh, uh, review. And finally, the provenance of the author and the credibility signals that support this credibility review. In our model, uh, provenance is mandatory. So you always have to document uh, where this information is coming from. Uh, the review of the, of the rating and the confidence are subjective in terms of what the author uh, um, wants to rate there. And this can be done in many different ways. It can be done manually or it could also be done automatically like we are doing here. And um, uh, everybody is free to, to rate as they wish. But knowing that these uh, ratings can be verified in order to enable evidence-based reputation. Okay. So how does this work? Typically what happens is that when we receive um, uh, an item D, uh, again, a tweet, a web page, or anything, the first thing that we do with it is to decompose it into sub items uh, to arrive at a level uh, that we can uh, um, uh, comfortably process, like for example, sentences. And for these, we, uh, we make a credibility assessment. Uh, from these uh, uh, sentences, what we do is to extract uh, which of those can be claims. So um, in a task that we call check worthiness, and, uh, and then we continue with the, with the pipeline. So um, in a tweet, this kind of uh, um, elements of some items that we're talking about can be the sentences, but also the, the references to web pages that we also process. And for web pages, it's just sentences public, uh, published on the specific websites. Uh, okay, after decomposing, the next thing that we do is to uh, check that uh, this, is, uh, this is a claim, this sentence is a claim, and then we try to link it against uh, some item in our database, which is our ground truth. Okay, and in order to do that, we use two, two main, two main um, steps in this process. One of them is uh, semantic similarity. So we compare that the claim that we want to, uh, to analyze now to verify is similar or not to some of the claims that uh, appear in our, in our ground truth, in our database. And then the stance between the two, the two sentences or claims, uh, just to see if um, the claim that we are verifying is um, supported, refuted, or nothing <laughs> by, an, by, by this sentence from the, from the ground truth from the database that uh, has been identified to be similar to. After this, uh, we look up uh, the credibility reviews for the items in our, in our database. And this can be human ratings from fact checkers, and uh, it can also be website reputations. And finally, uh, by means of a number of heuristics, all these um, uh, metrics are aggregated in order to produce an aggregated measure of the um, credibility of the, of the data item uh, itself. Okay, this is the data model that we propose for, for this link credibility reviews framework, uh, which is basically an extension of schema.org. Schema.org already uh, proposes some uh, uh, concepts related to, or some entities related to claim review, which is a type of review. And then what we did was to add um, the credibility review as a type of review as well. Uh, also knowing that sentence stance and sentence similarity can be understood as, uh, as uh, types of review. In the rating class, we added a value for an attribute for confidence. And then um, the publisher or author of a creative work uh, which in this case is a, is a, is a sentence or uh, more specifically a claim for us. Uh, well, the AFOR can, uh, is typically in schema.org is a person or organization, but we, in order to um, make that this system can be automatic, uh, we added also the entity uh, bot. Okay, in terms of implementation, we created the system that we call ACRE, and uh, it consists of the following. Of, here we have this block about uh, ground credibility uh, signal lookup. And what we have here is about 45,000 claims with claim reviews. 
coming from uh, Claims KG, PolitiFax, Nobs, you know, fact checking sites and resources. And then we have uh, 40,000, 40, around 40,000 sentences extracted from uh, new sites that have been uh, aggregated by uh, NewsGuard, Wealth Trust, Missing for Me in terms of their reputation. For sentence linking, uh, we have two, uh, two main tasks, as I mentioned before sentence similarity and sense detection. So, sentence similarity, the idea is to predict the, sem the semantic similarity of, uh, between claims. And uh, we model this on top of our Roberta Bayes uh, transformer language model that we fine tune for the uh, semantic uh, test of similarity database, uh, sorry, data set uh, with uh, very good results. And for the stance detection, um, we also use Roberta uh, as an as a underlying uh, transformer language model in this case, fine tune on FNSD1 uh, with 92% accuracy. In order to <clears throat> aggregate the different uh, ratings that we obtain by doing this, what we do is to get the result coming from the most confident sentence in the, in the um, document, in the data item. And then in terms of our document decomposition, uh, you know, we do, we do sentence splitting, sentence structure, uh, check worthiness of these sentences in order to extract the claims. And uh, what we do at the end in order to provide an aggregated value for the whole, the whole document is to keep the, the, the rating for the least credible uh, claim uh, extracted from, uh, from that document. So in the end, we, we, we uh, stick to the value related to the lower bound for the complete document. In the link, you can find uh, uh, in the GitHub uh, repository, a GitHub repository for all of these. So the good thing about this is that uh, this is all evidence-based. We use scrum proof the uh, claims uh, that have been already verified by fact checkers, or we use sentences that come from our, our reputable websites. Uh, it's also explainable, and we produce two different types of uh, uh, explanations. A textual explanation that uses a number of templates in order to generate these, these explanations, and then an evidence graph that connects uh, the credibility review with all the ground credibility signals that can be other uh, credibility reviews, claim reviews, um, the, the, the tweets or other types of data that are supporting these, these analysis. So for example, in this case, you also present a disagree to elicit UN gun control. So this is basically uh, a tweet saying that uh, in this case, the, the US government was complicit of, of everything that had to do with uh, banning, uh, banning guns. Uh, this uh, credibility review, what it says is that uh, uh, this is not credible since it's least credible sentence, which is this one. Many think they are hoping that the United States will help, will help to track and lightly confiscate firearms in the, in the country, agrees with this claim. Uh, Seattle police began confiscations, no laws broken, no war, no charges. That is, uh, not credible according to a fact check by, by PolitiFact in this case. Okay, uh, in terms of evaluation, I'm not gonna go in detail here, but uh, the system um, was at a level or beyond uh, the state of the art in many different uh, data sets like uh, uh, CLEF 18, check that, fact the factuality challenge or fake news net and so on. Of course, after mapping our uh, our, our metrics against the, the, the labels. But then what happened? We, we used these other data sets like uh, coin uh, uh, 250 or coin for um, 4550, which uh, were developed during the, the coin form project. And this, this was harder. The, 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 these were real life data sets. They were hard. There were five classes credible, mostly credible, and certain not credible and not verifiable. And here the, the results uh, uh, drop dramatically. So what happened? Where is the problem? In order to see what was the problem, what we did was to, to run a, a manual error analysis on fake news net, uh, fake news net, sorry. And uh, we found different, different reasons for this. Uh, some of these reasons had to do with um, the low quality of the data sets that we were using. For example, it happened uh, that uh, uh, here, um, um, due to the GDPR or advertising limitations, it seems that the that the um, uh, sorry the, the 
the mechanisms that have been used in order to extract information from the web for this data set um, didn't really contain all the information um, and many others. But uh, what, we, what we found that the most part of the problems were related to uh, were to stance detection and to semantic similarity, particularly semantic similarity, because as we will see later, um, the problems related to semantic similarity also induce other problems in the, the stance detection uh, stage of the, of the pipeline. So there's a problem with, uh, with semantic similarity in this, in this case. I will give you an example of this. For example, we have a disclaim that we needed to verify. This is what happens when a government believes people are illegal, kids in cages. Okay, so according to our algorithm, uh, what happens now is that we take this sentence, this claim, and we go to our, our data set, our database of, uh, of ground truth claims fact checked by, by fact checkers, and uh, look for those which are more uh, semantically similar to this one and that support or refute this, uh, this, uh, this claim. And what do we find? We find this one. The photo claimed that violators of quarantine in the Philippines were trapped in wooden photos. And not only that, not only do we find that these uh, two are very similar, uh, the score is, is, is extremely high. So it's 0 0.84. Of course, these uh, two claims have nothing to do. And uh, by the way, they were, they were rated as, as false uh, by PolitiFact and Pointer, respectively. But you see, the, the problem here is that uh, it doesn't seem to be enough to, to see uh, whether or not two sentences, two claims are semantically similar. There are other pieces of information that need to be taken into, into consideration, like for example, the place or the time, you know, or in general, the event that a particular uh, claim is, is related to. And also as, um, um, I mean, uh, thinking of the previous discussion about uh, the importance of dealing with uh, multimodal types of information, perhaps we could, we could have used the, the, uh, the visual modality here and also to, to improve the result in this, in this case. Okay, if we, we, we did, uh, if we followed on, uh, we continued and did another deeper analysis in terms of uh, the semantic similarity errors that we were obtaining here. Uh, we did a random selection of uh, 200 errors from uh, coin uh, 4550. And uh, yeah, our, our idea was, uh, was confirmed. Uh, the, most of the cases, the problem was related to having similar topics, but then different statement facts, entities, or the same topic, or common entities, but different facts. So there are a number of combinations here that we need to, that we need to explore and refine in the future. Okay, let me uh, show you a, a demo of uh, some of the systems that we developed based on, based on Accurate, uh, particularly in the Coin Forum project. Uh, so I'm gonna show you a dashboard that we built on, uh, on Accurate uh, related to, to COVID-19, and another one uh, which is uh, built on top of the Coin Forum 4550 dataset. Okay, I hope you can still see my screen. Uh, all right, this is the, uh, the dashboard uh, for uh, COVID, COVID-19. And in this case, well, we, we were extracting uh, tweets and other sources of uh, other information uh, from, um, from different sources. Um, but for example, focusing on, the, on tweets, um, we collected about 16 million tweets for a period of a couple of years during the project. Uh, of course, we were not able to uh, have our system analyze all these tweets um, uh, for the type of infrastructure that we could involve into this. That would have been um, uh, too much. But we analyzed about uh, 175,000 from which uh, the system determined that 66,000 uh, were not credible, others uh, 7,000 uh, were credible, and the other ones, the rest were um, deemed as not verifiable, which means that our system didn't produce a rating with enough confidence uh, for us to, to, to approve that, uh, that uh, rating. So here, what you can see here is the, in the, is the timeline of the retrieved tweets. So this is started as you can see. Um, yeah. 
Well, yeah, I cannot really see that, but it's two years in the past for now. So basically from uh, 2019 to now. Uh, this is the timeline of a not credible tweets. And this is the timeline of, a, of the credible tweets. You can also see a tag cloud here with the main keywords represented in, in the not credible tweets, the main keywords represented in credible tweets, medical conditions in not credible tweets, and medical conditions in credible tweets. Here to the, to the left, um, another thing that you can do, for example, is to filter by the different labels, credibility labels, that we define in the coin from project by categories uh, or by organizations. So for example, if you click on AstraZeneca, the results here should, uh, should uh, get updated. Yeah. It's going a little bit slow, but it's uh, 60 million tweets that it's uh, managing at the moment. And uh, you can see here that uh, these are the main, the main uh, types of information out there. Of, of keywords related to 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 AstraZeneca in this case, we can go a little farther even and uh, click on preventative medicine. See what we get here. Yeah, you can see that there was a spike here at some point in uh, April. And uh, well, so AstraZeneca and preventative medicine have to do with uh, vaccine, COVID-19, uh, aid, India in the in not credible tweets, but also the, there are other things related to, to these in, in credible tics, uh, tweets like, uh, again, vaccine and so on. So a lot of vaccine uh, talk. Um, so here in this chart, we also have a relationship between uh, the different organizations and the uh, different credibility labels. In this case, we see that uh, AstraZeneca is uh, very, very related to not credible tweets, while other organizations like the health ministry is, uh, is considered to be very, very credible. And here we have medical conditions by tweet credibility, like uh, infection, asthma, pandemic, and credible. And this is all in terms of uh, uh, the query that we did, uh, AstraZeneca and preventative medicine. So I'm going to go a little bit deeper into what this uh, um, uh, what these credibility ratings, uh, credibility reviews look like in the in the dashboard. And uh, to that purpose, I'm going to use this uh, other dashboard uh, on coin from 4550. This is basically an attempt in order to measure how well the system performs against a, a specific ground truth because coin from 4550 is built on claim reviews that are labeled. So we, we know that they are kind of re reliable in that sense. Uh, it's important here to, to see, I don't, I don't think you can really see it very well. Let me see. No, it can be seen very well. But well, I, I will tell you, there is a, a large proportion of uh, tweets here that are not only, uh, that are not verifiable. Our system is, is uh, very honest in that sense. So uh, instead of uh, saying that something is uh, not credible, we prefer to see that it's uh, not verifiable if it doesn't go through a, a determined a level, uh, a given threshold. So this is why you can see that most of the time here, the credibility level that appear, at least in this case, is, is not verifiable. But let's check on this one, for example, that is mostly credible. Here, what it says is that we have this tweet uh, that says that before Roe versus Wade, thousands of women died every year. And because of extreme attacks on safe legal abortion care, this could happen again right here in America. And uh, our analysis says that this is mostly credible with a quite a high uh, rating. Uh, it says the tweet seems credible based on its uh, least credible um, part, which is this sentence, basically the whole the whole tweet. And it seems credible because it agrees with this claim, the so-called heartbeat law at loss abortion before most women even know that they are pregnant. This is one of the most restrictive anti-abortion laws in the country. And this uh, this uh, this claim was uh, fact checked by by Politifact. Okay. So what we can do here too, 
is to visualize the, uh, the evidence graph. Okay, I can fit the review graph here. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, I can see it here. Uh, not very well. But yeah. But uh, we have the review graph and uh, here connected to the to the main credibility review, we have all the other pieces of evidence that we are trying to that we are using in order to come to that conclusion. So for example, here or here, yeah, you see we have these other these other tweets that are related to this. Sorry, but it's so small. Okay. The thing is that something that we can do with this um, I have some problem with this um, visualization. Let me show you again. Okay, something that I can do with this is to say, okay, this is this is uh, um, mostly credible. I, I'm most of the time mostly uh, mostly agree with this uh, with this result, but let's say that I don't agree with it. So what I can do is to click here. Uh, sorry, there's a problem with this uh, with this demo. I can't show it to you now, but. What I wanted to show you is that uh, by clicking here in this course, what I get is, a, is an interface that allows me to uh, collect feedback from the users of this, of this tool. Uh, and uh, I can use this feedback in order to increase the training set that I'm using in order to do this, this, uh, this analysis um, and refine my algorithms. Sorry about that. Sorry, I cannot show it to you. It says that the feature is not implemented yet, but it is. I don't know what happened here, <laughs> but somebody, something broke. Anyway, let me go back to, to the presentation. Sorry. Okay. Um, so some reflections about this. Um, what we have here is a pipeline uh, for credibility review that is a long pipeline, pipeline in the end that can break at several points. We have identified some of them related to, for example, the, the semantic similarity step of a, of a pipeline, which uh, implements a, a naive approach that can be improved in that sense. Also, uh, it's, it's true that the, uh, the, the system uh, has a limited, uh, uh, the, the ground truth that we're using is, is not very big. So uh, this means that uh, we use a lot of the website reputation in order to determine the credibility of a claim. So how can we amplify the ability of uh, human fact checkers to scale such ground truth? In the demo that I couldn't show you right now, we show the first steps taken uh, by modeling these as a crowdsourcing task to collect more data. But there are other ways to do this. And in relation to this, something that uh, we also wonder is, is a pure evidence-based approach too restrictive? How can we stand it using relevant linguistic signals, uh, even though this may not be as explainable as, uh, as having a, a completely or a pure evidence-based approach? And finally, what we have just seen are kind of isolated claims, not completely isolated because they, they come in this form of uh, evidence graph uh, whenever we do this uh, credibility review, but uh, can we incorporate them into um, um, elements of this course at the higher level of abstraction, like uh, for example, narratives. This is something we will see in the, in the uh, later in the talk. And so all this is work in progress that we are trying to do at, uh, at the moment. So focusing on the, the missing from language, in the beginning of the coming from project, we started doing this analysis about uh, what uh, missing from language looks like. And uh, our analysis, uh, which was summarized in that uh, blog post that is here in this link, uh, we showed is that misinforming language is sensational because it tries to catch people's uh, attention. It's also colloquial because they, they want to make it easy to understand by everyone. Uh, 
And uh, it also is, uh, it uses a lot of uh, discredit in order to discourage people to, from uh, taking evidence. And this is very much related all these uh, to um, uh, research that comes from the 60s, like the Andoch hypothesis, uh, which says the style of writing and misinformation is potentially different from that of, of real, real news. And actually there is a lot of work that compares truthful versus deceptive language. So for example, uh, truthful text is known to be more likely to focus on facts and contain optimistic words like uh, hope, accept, determine, determined, while detective test is more likely to be, uh, to contain certain words. No, there, it's very certain, like always, or absolute terms, no, completely, totally. Other features to look at or to, be, uh, um, to, to pay attention to includes psycholinguistic cues, like the average number of words per sentence, uh, misspellings, references to word, money, religion, these kind of things, subjectivity. And also it's, it's interesting to see how, uh, in terms of hyperpartisan use, for example, both extreme left or right wing, they have more in common with each other than the, they have with uh, truthful, truthful news. In this particular work, uh, what they did was also very interesting, uh, comparing um, the kind of lexicon that is used in uh, uh, trusted news and um, uh, unreliable, unreliable kind of news. No, um, so for example, what the what we see here is that in uh, uh, this table shows the ratio of averages between unreliable news and truthful news. So we have this type of lexical markers here, for example, swear. And what we see here is this, in average, uh, swearing appears seven times more in a deceptive or, um, yeah, or unreliable news than it does in, uh, in truthful news, and so on and so forth. So below one, this is uh, supposed to be uh, truthful. So we, there are a number of lexical markers here. It's uh, swearing, second person, and uh, a Second person, speaking second person, adverbs, um, subjectivity, superlatives, and, and these kind of things. So we can also extract, what this means is that we can extract a lot of information, strong signal from the lexical, uh, from the lexicon in the, in, the, in the text. Let me show you uh, a demo about this. I hope this one doesn't break. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm gonna use this example here that comes from one of these uh, sites which are known to, to be, you know, akin to spread conspiranoia theories and, uh, uh, and these kind of things. So in this case, what they do is, uh, this article says that they're, they're, they have found documents that prove Canada wants to use COVID-19 pandemic to bring the country in line with the World Economic Forum agenda. And this is uh, from last week, basically. So if we come to our, to our demo, which is basically a demo on top of our expert.ai's uh, APIs, we can run an analysis on this. A basic analysis will show us a few things. First, uh, the structure of the language in terms of, you know, this very uh, computational linguistic kind of analysis. We are not gonna look into this right now, but we are gonna look at the key elements that we extract from this, from this uh, article. So for example, the main topics that have to do with this are, it talks about medicine, politics, diplomacy. Uh, these are the main sentences that in the, in the text uh, give you an extractive summary of what this text is about. And uh, the, main, uh, the main concept, like uh, for example, World Economic Forum, which is mentioned here in different ways, uh, like the, the, the whole world, the whole lemma, World Economic Forum, and also the, the acronym, WEF. We can also see entities, uh, typical entities, persons, but also geographical areas, which are also linked to different resources like uh, uh, GNS, Wikipedia, DBpedia, uh, Wikidata, organizations, um, and so on and so forth. If I go back, I can also look for other types of uh, information, like for example, the classification of this text in terms of the uh, standard taxonomies, like uh, IBTC media topics. 
So for example, in this case, I can see that uh, there's a good deal of racism in this, uh, in this text. Canada's deputy prime minister, Christian Freeland's grandfather was Nazi and she Maestro Soros. They also talk about uh, the epidemic and uh, national government okay, of Canada in this case. It also talks about emotional traits, which are one of those linguistic uh, features that we can use in order to do this kind of analysis and behavioral traits. So in terms of behavioral traits, uh, we have a list of things here that appear from the text. We have to do with uh, commitment, solidarity, acceptance, initiative. If we look at commitment, for example, it says uh, in her notes, one of Freeland's objectives this is kind of the kind of commitments that they are talking about. For the meeting was to reiterate Canada's commitment to effective and accountable multilateralism. Or uh, the world leaders in WEF meeting had seven primary goals coming into it. You see, in this particular paragraph, they don't even talk about the war commitment, but it's uh, interpreted as a uh, commitment. It, it also talks about extremism. It's no surprise she's leveling freedom loving Canadian terrorists. Wow. And we can also look at uh, other type of features that have to do with uh, the right print. So the right print analysis, what it does here is to give us information like the uh, credibility index. So how difficult is this text according to different indexes like a common Liu, Gulpies, automatic readability indices and so on. This is quite difficult, not very difficult for uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, for Gulpies, but uh, quite difficult for the others. So it means that they, it tries to be um, a thorough in the, in, the, in the kind of language that is being used. Also, in terms of text of division, we use, you see that uh, uh, for example, and spelling, we see that uh, uh, it uses kind of longest uh, sentences with, um, uh, well, not very long, so, uh, yeah, 22 tokens per sentence, which are quite long. They don't use emoticons at all. They barely use dots. Uh, they don't use uh, question marks or exclamations. So it tries to be quite uh, journalistic in, the, in that sense. And if we look at, uh, for example, the, the language, uh, we see that, uh, there is not a lot of uh, specialization in the language. There is mainly a preference for political language. So it's quite generic in, in, in that sense. And uh, well, yeah, like I said, it, it, it's like it's a, it's a very journalistic kind of uh, language that is being used here. But in, in any case, what is interesting here is to see all the different type of uh, linguistic features that we can extract from just from the style of writing and that we can use for our analysis. Okay, that was that demo. And coming back to our pipeline uh, from uh, the Acre pipeline. Basically, remember what we have here is we have the, 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 the data, the tweet in this case, we do a checkworthiness analysis of that uh, uh, data to see what sentences that are can be considered as claims. Uh, we do similarity similarity check with uh, respect to uh, uh, ground truth of claim reviews, and then we check the stance. And then what happens if we if something is not verifiable because our confidence is not as high as we would want to? Well, uh, currently we can't do anything. But if we combine the ling linguistic information that we are able to extract from the text, okay, yeah, this linguistic information. Uh, uh, may say us that uh, the text is deceptive or, or not, or that there are things that we need to look at in there. Um, but uh, the idea here is not to um, replace this evidence-based pipeline by, by this other type of, of uh, analysis, because like we say, it's, uh, end -to, it's usually made of end-to-end -end analysis, which are not easily explainable. Uh, but we, what we can do here is to use this kind of analysis to pinpoint possibly misinforming information that needs to be fact-checked. So in this sense, we kind of 
uh, speed up a little bit the uh, or provide more agility to, to to fact checkers to look at the specific things that are coming up that may deserve some attention. And this way we can we can combine uh, an evidence based pipeline and extend it with uh, um, an end to end model like for example deceptiveness uh, identification. Uh, even though that uh, model is not uh, easily explainable. But there is a lot of work about interpretability and explainability going on. But let me talk a little bit about uh, narratives. I mean, if you if you see this tweet uh, and the credibility review that we do here, better off without them, the vast amounts of money made and stolen by China from the United States year after years for decades will a must stop uh, and so on. Uh, and then um, the credibility review that we, that we do here, uh, you will see that first of all, you will see two things. The first thing that you will see is that this credibility review is, is wrong. And this gives you an idea of the complexity of, uh, of this tax, task. And uh, the second thing that you will see is that there is a narrative here. It talks, uh, this tweet talks about identity. It talks about co uh, confrontation and discredit. So uh, from a social science per perspective, what a narrative is, is a mental frame designed um, to match information and complexity in a way that it's easier to uh, facilitate communication. So sometimes when you want to, to tell something, to explain something to somebody, you use stories to explain what this is about. You don't just explain the fact, you use a story to, to explain it. Um, and it, due to this simplification, usually narratives become a, a vehicle to spread misinformation. And they usually, or very frequently, they come together hand in hand, misinformation and narratives. Uh, and why? Simply because uh, uh, this makes misinformation coherent with a narrative that you are using. A narrative is not a single story, but it's a system of stories. It's a lot of stories that you can use in order to convey a message. From the different types of uh, narratives that are uh, collected by the literature, we focus on strategic narratives. And these kind of narratives, strategic narratives, are a collection of stories that um, have a number of characteristics. For example, they explain events convincingly uh, in order to allow conclusions to be drawn naturally. Uh, they are uh, deliber deliberately constructed out of current ideas, they express itself sense of identity or belonging to a group and provide a sense of purpose. They're also very emotional. They use metaphors and particular kind of language as well. Here you can see some, uh, some examples of uh, analysis made of these kind of uh, narratives. Um, the thing is that capturing narratives is a, is a um, complex task. Uh, as usual, when it comes to this type of uh, problems, we have two, well to deal, two, two ways to deal with this. We have the, the symbolic or knowledge-based uh, knowledge approach or the uh, approach that is based on machine learning or the neural approach. You know? And uh, sometimes uh, the truth is not uh, in either of them. It's a, it's a matter of combination of combining them wisely. But the thing is that with uh, uh, um, in the specific case of capturing uh, narratives, uh, for this particular work that has to do with uh, strategic capturing and strategic narratives about Islamist radicalization that we did in the past, uh, we decided to use a symbolic approach uh, based on uh, expert knowledge in social science. And this way we could leverage uh, what these experts knew about this domain in order to formalize it and model it in terms of rules that uh, allowed us to capture these this narratives as taxonomy of different categories of, uh, of narratives of stories that uh, could be could appear in the in our data set. Uh, we could have used try to use a machine learning uh, approach but this is this was discouraged because to start with we didn't have annotated data sets that were up to date. The data quality was questionable and uh, of course you have other issues here like uh, explainability and, and ethics, but particularly in the case of explainability, uh, in, this, in this particular domain, so this, is, this is quite important. So in this, this work, uh, where we, we did an experiment, we took um, 
magazines um, of related to, to, I mean, from a, from an Islamist uh, uh, background. For example, we use Risala, Dabik, and Rumilla that were, I think, they are published by, or they were published by, by ISIS. And we also use uh, Jam Muslim uh, Digest, which is uh, an Indian publication which is not radical. And what we did here was to um, run, run them through our system and try to extract the different categories related to uh, the, the strategic narratives that we are modeling here. So what we got here was that, for example, in the in the case of uh, YMD, the pages related to some of these narratives, uh, the percentage of, of pages related to these narratives was much smaller than what it was related to other um, the other publications, uh, particularly Risala, for, for example. Okay. So coming back to the to the extension of Acre that we proposed in the, in the previous slides, so something that can also uh, make sense here is uh, to transit from an evidence-based uh, approach to an evidence and language-based approach that is also narrative-centric because we know that narratives and misinformation um, tend to come along in, in this context. So the idea here would be to provide information about the narrative related to the claims that we are modeling, okay? Another idea that we are working on in the, in the moment is uh, related to the, uh, to the following hypothesis. So we think that the claims in the same evidence graph that is produced by, by Akrat can potentially belong to the same narrative. This is something that we, that we, are, trying to, <laughs> we are trying to study at the moment. And the, the reason for this is that they, they are semantically linked and they share a stand. So there are reasons to believe that all these pieces of evidence uh, can convey a similar types of stories that uh, can belong to the same narrative. The problem here is that we don't know what narrative this is. And uh, yeah, some of these narratives are more generic, they can be reused, but many others are very, very domain specific. So the question, the research question, and this may be a topic for, for uh, for master or PhD thesis is, can evidence graphs be used as a source of uh, supervision to learn narratives? Can, th can this data uh, be leveraged in a way that we can train systems that learn narratives, not just identifying whether this or not, this uh, claim belongs to a specific narrative, but uh, what narratives, uh, can we label the narratives that appear in these in this, uh, evidence graphs? That's a question for somebody if you want to think about it. Okay, and now I'm gonna show you the final demo that I have uh, for today. Yeah, and this is a, a, a demo that we built on, a, on uh, one of our systems that is called the Analyst Workspace. Uh, here, what you can see is the, all the sources that we are managing here. So for example, um, tweets uh, coming from um, uh, related to, to, uh, to anarchism or the far right, left, uh, left, uh, uh, left or, um, um, far left and far right, or others related to Salafi jihadism and so on. Um, so these are the sources that we are managing here in this, in this demo. <clears throat> and if we go to the to the home, what we will find here is uh, uh, well, this is the number of uh, documents, including tweets and other websites and so on, that we have in the system at the moment, which is over eleven million. And here, what you can see is the number of documents that. Uh, have been identified to belong to the different uh, taxonomies that we have here. So for example, in terms of the strategic radicalization narrative, we have 345,000 that uh, are related to group identity. Group identity is also related to promoting group ideology, legitimacy of ideology, you see the taxonomy. Um, there are also other taxonomies like uh, related to terrorism, emotions, uh, cybercrime, intelligence, the geographic taxonomy that here, basically what it says, each of these identifies uh, one of these places in the, in the, in, in a particular piece of uh, data, crime, taxonomy, and so on. 
So if I, um, let me restrict this to Salafi Jihadism collection. You will see that the numbers are not changed, of course, because we're focusing on the subset of the whole uh, data set. But I'm gonna try to look for, for example, um, some tweet or post that has to do with a group identity. And it's great in other groups. These are the categories, the high level categories from my taxonomy that we are gonna play with here. Of course, I could also uh, filter by entities like uh, non governative organizations, sentiments, uh, points of interest, organizations, and so on, emotions, places, and, and so on. But let's, let's focus on this. We explore. And uh, I have a number of uh, posts here from different publications. For example, in this case, this one about uh, uh, towards the reconciliation between the Salafi and the Sufi brothers. We can see the, the search highlights. We can see that uh, in terms of my query, uh, which had to do with uh, this creating other group and group identity, it has found four hits for homophily, which is a type of uh, uh, group identity. And also uh, for promoting group ideology. So homophily is, we have these ones here. Also know my Sufi brothers that the Salafis for the most part do not hate the religion of, of Islam and Muslim. There are truly wonderful brothers among them. So basically here homophily, what it means is, is this, uh, it's the, the achingness of a group with respect to another. But there are those related to uh, group identity, like, uh, so group identity, yeah. No, to discredit other group like this subcategory of the taxonomy of this great enemy. Both of these are incorrect and I hope that as the enemies of Islam continue to plot day and night, that we can finally leave this weekend day and night so that we can be prepared for whatever the next final is. Okay, we can see more information uh, uh, about uh, coming from other taxonomies like uh, emotions, hatred, we can find hatred or hope or desire. What would have promoted him to do this if it was not the law of, of Allah and desiring his pleasure? Or, or geography, Israel. They also mentioned Israel in this, spot, in this uh, uh, post. If we are not careful, we would divulge into the battle of Sadducees versus Pharisees of Ani, Israel. Okay. Entities, a lot of entities as well. Uh, we can see the full document or even open it in a, in a different post. Oh, so this, this book doesn't exist anymore. Okay, uh, but that was for a particular collection. Let's see what happens now if we um, look in the whole data set in any collection. And the idea of this experiment is that we can see how well these uh, taxonomies, which uh, particularly for the strategic radicalization narrative taxonomies, uh, how well they, they the generalized to any kind of text. So for example, this one, uh, but why, uh, uh, from um, um, Gates of Vienna RSS, uh, it has identified this, this text, the people who told President Biden what to say knew exactly what they were doing. This text, by the way, is related to the role of uh, the Western countries and particularly the US in uh, in the in the Russian Ukrainian war, no? um, so here you know the, the highlights in terms of the um, narratives that we were looking for originally related to legitimacy of ideology and this great enemy. There are also some of these here. The people who told President Biden what to say knew exactly what they were doing and what the consequences were would be. Uh, and the same with uh, other taxonomies and, and so on. Anyway, there's some generalization, but it's clear that uh, in order to have some kind of system that uh, uh, captures any kind of narrative in any, in any domain, this is something that uh, needs uh, a lot of further research, further research. Okay, coming back to the conclusions, to the slides, the conclusions of the, of the talk. 
as the fact checkers said in their in their letter to to the YouTube CEO, don't delete, provide evidence. We believe, uh, I'm convinced of this, that evidence based is the, is the way to go in explainable in explainable credibility review, and also quite likely on uh, uh, misinformation detection and uh, fighting against uh, against misinformation in in general. Uh, there are many other things that we can do in order to follow up on the claim uh, and. Uh, ensure that the claim somehow um, permeates the, the, the different platforms, as, as Harith mentioned in the previous talk, in his talk. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the basic kind of framework that I think is, uh, is, is the right one for these kind of things is, is this kind of evidence-based approach. The problem is that fact checkers, uh, they are at the core of this approach, but they are too few and lack resources. And uh, like we saw, collaboration is still limited. Uh, so fortunately uh, with AI, both neural and knowledge base, we can we can help with different things like identifying uh, and explicitly structuring evidence as a graph, uh, not worrying only about the accuracy of uh, of, uh, of the analysis, but also about uh, how explainable it is. And by means of extracting other signals uh, from the language, we can uh, we can suggest uh, fact checkers or point them to other uh, uh, pieces of, of information that. Uh, would need to be to be verified, trying to streamline the, the process. An interesting thing that, uh, that would need to look further in the future is the organization of all this work in broader context of uh, discourse, like uh, like narratives that help understand the intent between uh, behind such claims. If we have this this higher level of abstraction, it should be easier to uh, to analyze this intent if we relate it to to a narrative, for example. That's the, the kind of hypothesis. Um, finally, accuracy is, uh, is still an issue. <laughs> it probably will always be. Uh, there, are some, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. You know, like we saw, there are some there are analysis that uh, has been conveyed. It points most of the critical failure points like the semantic similarity uh, problem that I mentioned in the past. We need to do this um, aware of the different, different uh, events, uh, times, uh, locations, uh, and other pieces of information that are involved in the claim, not only the strictly uh, semantic similarity analysis type of. And uh, some of these are already done for short term, uh, but others we need further research, particularly the relation between claims and this higher level of instructions like uh, narratives. And uh, with this, I finalize my, my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, um, open to questions. Thank you very much, Jose. Um... So are there any questions? We have now time for discussion. Questions for Jose and then also more general discussion uh, that can follow right afterwards. Um, Arit. Uh, hi, Jose. I mean, uh, lots of content there. So uh, I'm just trying to wonder, we probably had a chat about this in the past, about the similarity of the claims and how how to get this right and you showed some of the challenges in in getting this uh, this right i don't know whether you have some thoughts about what whether there is something in particular uh, that's challenging when it comes to claims uh, and whether you have some ideas on how that could be improved yeah uh, i mean uh... From the analysis that we did, which is, which is still a, a limited uh, error analysis because it was manual, it was evident that we uh, we had uh, a huge problem related to to the identification of uh, events, uh, the, the events that are related to the to the claims. Um, this led us to compare claims that, uh, although could be saying very similar things, they was they were saying these things about events that had nothing to do with each other. So they could be talking about uh, things that happen in in uh, Paris and, th and uh, I mean in Baltimore, <laughs> and uh, and we still would compare them because they were they were similar. That's a very obvious kind of failure uh, that uh, needs to be to be addressed. But no matter how obvious it is, it's producing a lot of errors because these errors also uh, because of the structure of the of the pipeline are dragged all over the pipeline. This error in the semantic similarity step will also introduce another error in the stance detection and so on and so forth. 
So that's another type of work that we need to uh, to deal with. How to make this pipeline this pipeline more simple, uh, so that we don't have so many intermediate steps. Yeah, I guess I guess the, I mean what you mentioned events in different places, but I've seen some claims that are extremely similar. It's just that they are referring to different places, you know. Um, uh, but they they kind of come out again after a while in a different place, but it's it's more or less the same fake story. So I guess yeah. this is maybe one of the challenges is that even when kind of those basic concepts change, there is still the claim is sometimes still similar and vice versa. It might still be talking about the same concepts, but actually the claim itself somewhere around them is different. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, yeah. That this time. this reminds me, for example, of. Um, of a, a credibility review about a, a claim that was talking about uh, scams going on related to, to, to COVID-19. And uh, the claim that we were verifying uh, came from, uh, from um, uh, the US and the, the ground truth that we use in order to, that the system used in order to say that this was credible came from um, uh, something going on in, in Paris, and this was fact checked by, by I think it was quality fact. So in that case, uh, yeah, uh, there were different places, different events, but it, still the, it's relevant, <laughs> uh, no matter how, how different the, the location is. So the, this is something that is, Is it just me or all of us? I think Jose's network is uh, breaking up. Okay. Jose, can you hear us? Hello? Um, I, yeah, you yeah, hear you, you're back, you're back. I think your connection was kind of slowed, slowed down for a while. So maybe you can repeat the last part of your answer or maybe the entire answer to the last question of uh, Harith, if that's okay for you. Yeah, yeah what, what I was saying is that the, we can the, stop that case where we had this claim. Um, uh, let, me, let me stop sharing, yeah. Yes, uh, stop it. Stop. Um, yeah, well, what, what I was saying is that uh, it's not always clear uh, what the event uh, that we are dealing with, because, for example, in that claim that I mentioned, that example, uh, it was uh, about the scam related to with, uh, COVID-19 that was going on. That, I mean, this claim was from the U.S., but, they have, but the ground truth that we were comparing it against came from, uh, from France. Uh, so even though the events, the, the locations were different, still, uh, since COVID is a, is a worldwide phenomenon, it makes sense uh, to use this as, as ground truth for this kind of analysis. So in order to see if uh, whether or not to use the event, the particular event location, time, and so on, uh, to filter the, the analysis, uh, it's not, we could come up with uh, ways to let the user um, decide or, or provide some kind of recommendation based on the on the content, but this is still an open an open an open question to deal with. Okay, uh, Alex. Yeah, I, I have a relatively simple and short question, at least. Um, I was just wondering, and first of all, thank you for a really, really interesting talk. I was wondering, uh, the data that you, you have collected, the sort of different corpora uh, that you're working with to test these things, you touched very briefly upon it being um, like visual modality can, can have a, a, a probably a fair impact on, on this kind of analysis you're doing. Do you, do you have the visual modality collected in the data at all? Um, is, is that something you have available to you? It's, uh, I mean, we have the provenance of, uh, of uh, data. So for example, if it's a tweet that involves uh, uh, an image, we can use the, this provenance information to, to recover the image. 
That's true. But at the moment, we're not using the visual information in this particular work. We are working with uh, the, the intersection of uh, uh, language and uh, visual modalities in other areas, but we haven't brought it here yet. So if you, we, we, we can chat about this if you are interested. I would love to, yes, thank you. All right, Stefan. Mm, yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Jose, for the interesting uh, talk. Um, I like specifically that you um, also talked about narratives, specifically for the reason that um, one of the key points I feel about misinformation at the moment is that it's very often not so much about the claim, which is correct or incorrect, but it's really about the context. And basically there's, um, there are lots of very subtle differences, like like Harish said already that sometimes, or I mean, even in Harish's quizzes, when he was talking about the dark side of the moon, right? So he was referring to dark side of the moon to us versus the dark side of the moon dark ever, right? And I mean, mm -hmm. these are very subtle differences. And um, also what, from my point of view right now, the bigger problem is, is not so much really wrong claims, but really, presenting claims out of context, talking about, for instance, um, um, side effects of COVID vaccinations, but um, leaving out all the context, which as a scientist is uh, e easier to judge, but for a lay person, if you don't know the numbers, someone telling you about 10 myocardial infections, of course, people go crazy, but the, the claim is still correct, right? Mm -hmm. And my feeling is that this is also that goes then to my question also that um, basically all the different kinds of uh, benchmark data sets which we have right now for things like claim retrieval or fact checking and so on are not really suited to deal with those kind of subtleties because they really include cases where I mean if you look at the negative cases and positive cases for instance in claim retrieval uh, uh, data sets they are not really um, um, containing these kind of subtle differences to a large extent. And my feeling is really that this makes it very hard to really fairly evaluate the kind of methods we are working on in real world environments and really make realistic um, statements about what we can do and what we can't do, do with technology. And I was yeah, wondering about your, your point of view about these, these, these issues. It's basically also a point I was sort of um, thinking about when I was listening to Arif's presentation um, about uh, presenting claims to the audience because it's also context. So maybe both of you have, have points on that. Yeah, well, I think I think we, we, we are all in agreement in that sense. Uh, uh, so far, the way to analyze claims has been automatically. My understanding is that it has been done in a very isolated way without taking into account all these contexts that you were talking about. Uh, I mean, there are resources uh, that uh, provide some of these contexts by putting, uh, explicitly describing the relationship within, between them. But I think we need to go more and more in that direction. And the idea with, uh, with uh, uh, using the evidence graph generated by Accred uh, to this purpose, even though that would be I mean, uh, a silver, <laughs> so to say, a silver data set very optimistically because that needs to be improved a lot. Uh, but uh, the idea was actually to provide that kind of context in the in the uh, um, in terms of uh, the the old information that is related to to this particular analysis and uh, how we can encapsulate this uh, this analysis in. Uh, in terms of the stories that are being told by each of these different uh, uh, reviews or, or the, the, the resources being analyzed by the different current reviews or credibility reviews in that, in that sense. So that's why I had the idea of using narratives as a way to provide more structure to this, to the notion of narratives and see if these different reviews that are linked, linked to each other that could be a, a, a signal uh, showing that there is some kind of belonging to, to these common narratives. And not only that, if you have uh, 
um, some of these stories that belong to a particular narrative. And uh, the, this is connected to another one, it's linked to another one out of a, that belongs to another narrative. How are these related to each other? Uh, how do they interact? Um, is this providing us some kind of information, some kind of signal that we can use in order to train a system that uh, can help us identify all these more uh, in a more automatic way? <clears throat> Even though in the end, this data set is never going to be perfect, but at least can we use it as a silver standard? that can be uh, refined by means of uh, interaction with, uh, with humans, for example. That's the kind of questions that uh, I think we, we are dealing with here. I see that in the chat, just Alex uh, mentioned the fact that uh, in this case, shall we also talk about, so established sources as potentially sources of misinformation. Of course, uh, I think all we are saying here is that it's not that much about to what extent the source is established. It's really about how, to what extent the information is decontextualized. Where yeah, just, yeah. So it's one of the features which come to probably help uh, establish the veracity, but the veracity as such is also just a feature, not the end goal of the game. I totally agree with that uh, uh, statement. In the end, it's very, I mean, we know that it's, uh, it's not about saying whether something is true or not per se. It's about uh, providing an analysis and then providing the evidence that supports that, that, that analysis. And through that, you can get you can reach two different uh, conclusions. Yeah, and I think um, with regard to the the comment from from Alex, I mean, I also think in many cases the computational challenge of really detecting um, simplified or oversimplified or de decontextualized claims and these kind of things. I think that they are so hard that very often, I guess, methods which focus more on the sources where, where something is coming from may be more, more efficient or more, more practical, right? I mean, it's also with respect to how, how we process information, right? So the first, um, um, let's say, indicator of what we perceive, whether we perceive something as trustworthy usually is uh, looking at the source, right? So if it's coming from a source which we believe is credible, then if I don't have time, then I may just, I mean, I'm always skeptical whenever I read something, but I'm usually much less skeptical if it comes from a source whom I trust normally. And I think also from a computational um, the point of view that probably one of the the important heuristics when it comes to these really complex problems that we may have to fall back also on these kind of proxy indicators because I really think it's incredibly hard um, when you look at some of the COVID related misinformation for instance um, it's easy to spot the really um, stupid ones I mean in Germany we have a few very prominent um, misinformation spreaders but Sometimes you see articles which come across and look like very reasonable points of view, but mostly by really digging deeper into it and being being very, very familiar with the topics, you see that they contain lots of valid claims, but so out of context and framed in such a narrative that they don't add up anymore and that they really follow a specific agenda. And I think detecting those, those things is yeah, really, really hard. Yeah, the, in, the, in the beginning of this kind of line of work, there was all this analysis focus, all this work focus on uh, an analysis the language of, uh, of this information. And that, in my opinion, seems to have been superseded by uh, identifying the evidence of uh, the, the, the fact checking. But then what I think we need to do is to, to put it all back together uh, in a way so that uh, we can fill in the gaps as you, as you say, more or less. That's, uh, that's, I see that. And also what has been said so far, uh, many of the conclusions that we're trying to draw lead me to think that we're also in our community, at least people who are present now today, this, uh, this workshop, we're trying to provide answers to questions to which actually we don't have the tools to provide these answers. So in a certain sense, we need really to expand this community towards uh, uh, other fields, in particular the social sciences, and why not psychology also when looking into uh, how it's talk. Uh, I mean, Harit presented a lot of data with the uh, conclusions of qualitative uh, 
kind, like how the bot was interacting with people or the other way around. And this really calls for an in-depth psychological or uh, social scientific analysis as well. So I think mm -hmm. one thing that we should really try to do for next year's edition of the workshop is to attract more people from, this, uh, from these fields. Obviously, this being not an easy task and also not, not an easy task to, to, to discuss in a, in a forum like this with uh, people who have very different backgrounds and different ways of constructing a hypothesis and so on. But I think it's really worth uh, the try. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any, uh, any other thoughts, comments? Okay. Well, then I think we can, uh, we can wrap up. Um, I'd like to say uh, once again, thank you to, uh, well, first of all, to the uh, program committee members of the workshop for, uh, for the reviews and the support. Uh, thank you to all, the, to all the speakers today and the authors, whether they were present or not. Um, thanks to our excellent uh, keynote uh, speakers, Serena, Jose, and uh, Harith. Uh, big thank you to the conference organizers, and in particular to the workshop chairs, uh, Raphael and, uh, and, and the team, and to all the attendees. So we had around 30 people this morning, 20 in the beginning of the afternoon, and now it's about 15. I think these numbers are not so bad for an online event uh, of this kind. Um, so I think it's time now to announce the, the winner of uh, uh, our best paper award. Uh, so let me share my screen. Uh, and there we go. So the, the award goes to Su and Wong Lili for that paper, which was presented in the morning se session incorporated external knowledge for evidence-based fact verification. So um, this was based on, well, the reviews that this paper received. So it was of the work that was presented. And it also happens to fall exactly within the scope of the workshop. So for these reasons, we decided to, to award these authors for with the best paper uh, award. So I don't know if they're here. Uh, I think they're on, but anyway, we'll send them the, the certificate via, via email. Okay, so thanks a lot, everyone. Any other final comments or thoughts? Thank you very much for organizing it. I look forward to the, to the beer session at some point in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully next year we can, we can do that in person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> All right. Well, have a have a good afternoon or a good day or evening and a nice a nice continuation of the conference.